Uh, good morning, all. I would like to welcome you to the pathology section of the 45th, apparently, annual Alumni Society meeting on behalf of the faculty of the Department of Pathology. Uh, I'm Ahmed Dogan. I'm currently the uh, acting chair for the Department of Pathology. As you know, we were planning uh, the meeting and uh, the traditional dinner as live event in person this year. But unfortunately, due to rising COVID-19 cases in the city and around the country, we were forced to adapt a virtual format. However, we are hoping to see many of you next year in a live meeting with hopefully a celebration of the end of the pandemic life. We will be following the traditional format for these meetings. Our morning session uh, will start with two lectures uh, topical to the uh, to the, the, today's awardee uh, on hematopathology by Drs. Rochal and Duffield, both uh, senior members of our faculty. Uh, this will be followed by a brief coffee break. And after the break, we will have the steward uh, award presentation followed by the lecture by Dr. Campo. After Campo's, uh, Dr. Campo's presentation, there's a lunch break uh, and uh, we will start case presentations. There are eight cases to be presented. 2 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon, and Dr. Hamid, our Chief of Surgical Pathology, will ch chair this session. So I will now start uh, with the first talk. Uh, this will be given by uh, Dr. Mikhail Rochal. Um, Misha is uh, the Acting Chair of Hematopathology Service at MSKCC. He is a world-renowned uh, uh, hematopathologist, uh, has contributed to the field in many ways, including in the field of flow cytometry, but also his most significant uh, academic achievements have been in the genomics of uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Today, he will talk about his work in that area. And the, the, the title of his, uh, uh, his presentation is Molecular Evolution of Classical Hodgkin Lymphoma Revealed Through Whole Genome Sequencing of Hodgkin and Reed Sternberg Cells. So I'll pass the platform, the Zoom to Misha to start his talk. Thank you. Thank you, Amit, for your kind introduction. I'm very much honored to be here and share some of our work with you. I'm actually going to start with acknowledgement slide because this is the work of many, many people. And in fact, probably most of the work was done not by me, but by Francesco Moro, Lisa Glenna Roth, and the earlier work was done by John Reichel. Uh, now they're in Miami, Wild Cornell, and the University of Washington. And with that, I'll actually start the talk. So we'll talk about uh, Hodgkin lymphoma through genomics. And the funny thing is that the first, the, when, Close to the beginning of the time I started working on this, a wise mentor of mine told me, well, you know, this is going to be technically challenging, disease is rare, it's going to do no favors to your career. And he was exactly right on at least two portions that it was extremely technically challenging, disease is rare, required a lot of collaborations, and I certainly had to find other things to do with my career as well. So, yes. Uh, Let's think about the beginning. So uh, Johnson from the University of Washington back in about 2005 has shown that uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma can be diagnosed, diagnosed and seen by flow cytometry. In fact, he showed that you can do this with a high sensitivity and specificity. At some point in 2011, we wrote a lovely review on this and you can see that the phenotype of classical Hodgkin lymphoma by flow cytometry is very much similar to what you would expect by morphology with reduced expression of 45, uh, expression of CD30, 90, uh, 95, and 40. 40 is, is a B cell marker, 95, 95 is, uh, is, is, is FS. Uh, and you can also see that oftentimes the cells are rosetted by T cells with CD5, and it also brings 45 with it. And this is shown in multiple cases, and the degree of rosetting varies quite a bit. So the question was, can we now use this technique to actually do genomics in classical Hodgkin lymphoma? So at the time this review was written, there were 
few studies in classical Hodgkin lymphoma genomics, mostly done by lesion capture microdissection. The study that actually had a lot, a, a lot of acknowledgments was a study of four microdissected cells. So we wanted to get a little bit more cells and do a bit of a deeper study. So we started out uh, trying to develop a low input exomic pipeline and Jonathan Reichel was instrumental in this. So we've done a bunch of experiments looking at what, how low can we go. We actually had to, in, had to modify and invent really a, a new method of low input exome sequencing at that time. It wasn't available, now certainly it is. And we've explored the possibility of using between 10 and 100 nanograms of DNA. We settled on a 10 as being the low, uh, as the being the lowest input. And, and this is what, what we did. First of all, we sorted HRS cells based on the phenotype we've already described. You can actually see these HRS cells now on the slide using cytospin. So we're sure we're not crazy. We're actually picking up the HRS cells by morphology as well. And then we did, and then we did the following. We looked at the uh, read depth, so num, you know, basically whole exome coverage depth uh, between one nanogram, ten nanograms, one hundred nanograms. You can see the difference between ten nanograms and one hundred nanograms wasn't all that much, so that's why we chose ten nanograms, and that was reinforced by looking at copy number variation uh, between, say a 10 and 100 nanogram input, you don't see too much variation across chromosomes. Between one and 100, there was substantial difference. So one is probably not sufficient. And that's where you could do with kind of sane laser capture micro dissection. Uh, but with sorting, you can get 10 to 100. And you can see that you can see significant changes in copy numbers uh, between HRS cells and controls at 100 nanograms and identical changes at 10 nanograms. So that's where we, that's where we went with this. Uh, looking at copy number variation, we showed what we expected to see at some, uh, you know, is including uh, including deletion of IGH locus because the controls were T cells. You know, this is pseudo amplification of the TCR locus, but also also things that were either novel or confirmatory, like amplification of uh, amplification of REL, and also within that region, amplification of Expo and BCL11A, uh, amplification of uh, the locus uh, that's fairly famous now with uh, PD PDL1, uh, JAK2, and also amplifications and, del and deletions of. Uh, of, 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 of uh, genomic integrity R, uh, RB1 and the gain of a cyclin CDK4. Other things like little focal amplification deletions, including PRDM1, MLL, and TNFAIP3, A20, which have been known previously. And then we were a bit lucky. I mean, we had uh, seven cases of nodular sclerosis Hodgkin and three cases of mixed cellularity. When we clustered these cases, we actually, by independent clustering, we actually, we actually saw something very interesting. Two mutations, B2M and TNFAIP3, were seen in all not nodular sclerosis Hodgkin and not seen in mixed cellularity. Certainly not entirely true when you look, when you look at more cases, but that drew our attention to the, the B2M. And we found that B2M was mutated in seven out of 10 cases, and the mutations were uh, clustered around exon one, predominantly at the start site or uh, frame shifting in exon one. There were also uh, multiple splice site mutations between exon one and exon two, resulting in a uh, lack of the protein expression. We confirmed that. Uh, further, but just to give you back, give, give big, uh, just give an introduction to B2M. B2M is required for class one expression on the cell surface. Uh, B2M stabilizes MHC1 expression. Without B2M, MHC1 can be cytoplasmic, but certainly not on the cell surface. We showed that in a cell line, this is the Hodgkin cell line, which was which uh, was mutated for B2M. When you would put B2M back. Uh, MHC class one was also expressed. We only put B2M, not MHC, and you can see you can fully restore MHC class one expression with B2M. So there is the mechanism there, which has certainly been shown before. And uh, you can, you can you see the same thing by immunistic chemistry. The vast majority of cases of classical Hodgkin lymphoma show no B2M expression in the cell surface and no cytoplasmic B2M, although this pattern now is a little bit fuzzier with uh, some cases that do express by cytoplasmic B2M, likely to mutations of HLA class one. 
So again, the, it's held between mixillary and, and nodular sclerosis. And uh, when we did uh, TMAs between uh, mixillary and nodular sclerosis, in fact, that uh, pattern still held with most nodular sclerosis cases lacking B2M, but only a minority of cases of mixed cellularity with a very high p-value. And what's interesting is, you know, as, as may, perhaps expected by the case, by the case distribution, uh, B2M lack actually was associated with superior prognosis and classical Hodgkin lymphoma for both OS and PFS. And that difference was largely confined to stage three, four classical Hodgkin lymphoma, although the p-values aren't significant because the case numbers aren't all that great. There's certainly no difference in stage one through two. Now we went on, uh, you know, at, at that point, and actually now many years later, uh, to do our, to do transcriptome sequencing for the same cases. Uh, now we're comparing transcriptomes between the inter internal B cells in the, in the tumor uh, shown in blue, HRS cells and cell lines shown in green. And you can see that there is pretty close association between HRS cell lines and, uh, and the HRS primary tumor cells by principal component analysis. And we've done now 18 cases and four cell lines total. A uh, few things that we found were certainly, and, and that's been shown previously in, so, in, some, in some ways, but uh, this finding is actually fairly novel. There is a nearly complete lack of SLAM family receptors that are important for NK cell recognition in classical Hodgkin lymphoma. There is a marked down regulation of these SLAM receptors. There is up regulation of CD74 and CD73. There is down regulation of class one, down regulation of class two, down regulation of B2M. So, and uh, as been shown previously, marked up, marked up regulation of CCR7, CCL17, CCL22 as well. So why are the SLAM receptors important? So remember this whole story about B2M lacking class one. Class one is, uh, is, is, is it, lack of class one MHC, usually the signal for NK cells to kill the tumor cells or whatever is lacking class one. So in fact, down regulation of SLAM receptors may be important for NK cell recognition. We, you know, just to give you the numbers, the SLAM family receptors 48, SLAM F6, light, light 9 and CD84 was markedly down regulated. CRACC wasn't expressed in either B cells or HRS cells with confirmed by Bethel cytometry. CD48 is indeed markedly down regulated on the CD30 positive. HRS cells. So this is kind of a kind of the model we came up with. It's certainly a cartoon. It's not a great model, but down regulation of class one leads to, leads to lack of uh, a recognition of tumor apoptosis by CD8 cells, overexpression of PDL1, PDL2, down regulates interaction with CD4s and causes energy. And then now this down regulation of 48, now the SNAP family receptors probably, probably inhibits NK cell recognition of HRS cells. I'm not showing this now, but certainly NK cells are also reduced in HRS tumors compared to norm, no, normal, uh, normal tissues, at least by cytometry. And the other thing we looked at was kind of a signature of cell identity. And there were a few surprises along the way. So compared to, for instance, B cells, the HRS cells express very little of the B cell program. We, we know that. And there was not much similarity except for germinal center B cells, which actually showed a lot of proliferative markers, which HRS cells shared. There was actually uh, a bit more similarity between HRS cells and plasma cells. And that similarity was almost entirely due to expression of unfolded protein response signature, which is shared by HRS cells. It's shared by plasma cells and cells in myeloma, but not so much in other B cell tumors, as I'll show you in a second. And in fact, it probably resulted in a, in a, in a useful stain for HRS cells, PDIA6, in addition to say MOM1, part of the Pro, uh, unfolded protein response, and it stains HRS cells quite nicely and doesn't stain background particularly well. It is, it is to be determined whether this is actually going to be useful in uh, distinguishing HRS cells from uh, tumor mimics uh, that might be pathologically important, but at least we know that PDA1, PDA6 is overexpressed in virtually all cases with did by tumor, micro, uh, by tumor microarrays. 
And what's interesting is that unfolded protein response signature is not seen to the same extent in PMBL, DLBCLABC, or DLBCLGCB. So that actually might be one of the few differences between PMBL and classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Now let's actually move on to the interesting part of the talk. This is actually new data. It will be presented at ASH as well in more details. Uh, and for this, we did uh, 25 whole genome cases. Uh, they were split between pediatric, about 10 pediatric cases, nine young adults. So we're predominantly focusing on pediatric and young adult Hodgkin. We also had six older adults. Most were diagnosis, 12 were relapse, and additional 36 whole axomes were also performed. So we, we greatly enlarged the number of whole axomes that were done. Uh, Margaret Shipp's paper recently has uh, showed a very exciting finding in axomes as well. So we're kind of adding to this. And this required, especially for pediat pediatric Hodgkin and multi-institutional collaboration, that's why there were so many collaborators on that uh, acknowledgement slide because they, you know, they required active participation, but a lot by a lot of investigators. So here, here's the data. So can, you know, there are, there are some limitations to the data. Of course, this is a low input. So there the depth of the sequencing isn't all that great, but even by that depth, classical Hodgkin lymphoma actually is a reasonably highly mutated tumor, certainly more than CLL, uh, more than myeloid malignancies and comparable to multiple myeloma in terms of total number of mutations. And what's interesting is that pediatric Hodgkin lymphoma is actually show, shows a significantly higher mutational burden than older adults uh, class, classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Even though the driver mutations are highly overlapping, there is additional evidence that there actually is probably a significant biological difference between the older adults and PIDS AYA group. We did confirm by whole exome and whole genome sequencing the, same, the similar distribution of drivers seen previously, uh, JAK stat pathway, SOX1, SOX B2M, CSF3RB, but also additional drivers, uh, FAM238, TPCL7, which is seen in other B-cell lymphomas and SISH. Uh, those deserve further exploration of Hodgkin lymphoma as well. Uh, we confirmed findings that were seen previously, obviously amplification of the PDL, PDL1, JAK2 locus, amplification of RELAXPO locus, deletions of I, IGK, uh, and also interestingly, uh, focal deletions of PTPN1 uh, and other chromosomal aberrations, which I'll share with you in a second. To go further, we need to understand a little bit about how to time events using whole genome. One thing I need to introduce is a concept of molecular clock. And I had to learn this recently when in the context of whole genome, so I may, be, I'm, I may be a little off. But overall, the aging signature, uh, so-called SPA signature one and five, is relatively constant throughout the age, uh, you know, ba basically accumulates with age of the patient, actually human being. And, this, and the time and the slope of the line is tissue dependent. So, you know, there, there might be a higher slope for more proliferative tissues, less of a slope for less proliferative tissues, even though the mutations accumulate even in the absence of proliferation. And different clock rates are shown for different tumors. This is from uh, a much larger study showing a lot of genomes across, and across different tumors. Uh, and you can see that all of them have a molecular clock with, you know, variable rates. The second concept would be, how do we time mutations relative to each other? One is the typical one where, you know, obviously mutations are trunk, which are clonal mutations, probably occur before the subclonal mutations. But the second one, we can use the power, and I'm stuck. Hmm. We can use the power of the uh, gene, of genomic events, chromosomal duplications mostly, to time the mutations relative to chromosomal events. Uh, in, this, in this case, you can see that, for instance, if the mutation has occurred prior to duplication, it will then be duplicated if the chromosome duplicates and you, the mutation, and if mutation is duplicated, you can assume that that mutation has occurred prior to the duplication event. Now, a mutation on a duplicated chromosome, but it only exists on one chromosome, would be a mutation that occurs post-duplication. So you can actually time, event, 
uh, mutational events relative to chromosomal events using this kind of approach. And you can certainly see clonal versus subclonal distribution. Now, let's look at what actually happens in that situation. So what we found were kind of two, two interesting patterns. One is that if we look at chromosomal events, they occur in, uh, in waves. In fact, the first wave usually is a no catastrophic wave resulting in whole genome duplication, but there is also a second wave of chromosomal events. So the early events as shown here uh, occur rel relatively, uh, in a relatively tight time frame, And then there is a second wave of events. Again, this probably is a tight time frame as well. So you really see two waves of events. Uh, it's similar for the case here, and 12 out of 20 cases we've seen actually showed that pattern with two waves of chromosomal events. Looking at the chromosomes across the genomes, uh, we can identify chromosomal events that tend to happen late, like chromosome 2 events and chromosome 12 events. To some extent, chromosome 9, which is the uh, PDL1 amplification, is intermediate to late event, as well as early events like, um, like amplification of chromosome 1 and chromosome 13. The other thing is you can look at molecular clock and pediatric versus older adults patients, and, and molecular clock is, in fact, different between the two. There is accelerated mutagenesis in the younger adults versus older adults. And interestingly enough, there is this, this patient here, which is, was in PZAYA group, but it's an adult and may actually uh, show more of an adult-like pattern. Again, showing that there may in fact be significant differences in tumor genesis between the young and an old patients with classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, this is what's actually very interesting to me. So if you look at the age of the first chromosomal event, it occurs approximately, if we time it with this, this kind of a slope, it occurs approximately five to 10 years, three to 10 years really, uh, before the diagnosis of, of classical Hodgkin lymphoma, that's timing of sample collection. But the age of second event is almost always overlapping with the time of collection. So in fact, there is a whole genome duplicated cells with some mutations that are in the patients for uh, you know, up to a decade before diagnosis. In peas and young adults, it appears that the age of the whole genome duplication is approximately age of uh, early middle school, 10 to 12 years old, and the age of diagnosis is substantially older. And you can see this gap is actually fairly consistent. We can also use the same model to time mutational events. So for instance, we're seeing that PTPN1, uh, an inhibitor of JAK-STAT pathway is mutated relatively early. And there are very late events that are seen post duplication that are kind of, that, that, that are seen late. The events that are targets of AID, which occur in germinal center are generally clustered in intermediate place. So it, it appears that at least some mutations occur prior to the cell entering germinal center, although, of course, the proof of that with that, many, that few genomes is relatively weak. In terms of what's in, and you can time, and the timing really comes from whether the mutation is clonal or subclonal, whether the mutation is duplicated or non duplicated. So, PTPN1 is clonal and always duplicated, for instance. Now, we can look at other signatures. We can look at the signature for APOBEC mutations, for instance. APOBEC is seen in lot, lots of tumors, and Hodgkin lymphoma actually is heavily enriched for APOBEC mutations compared, say, to B non-Hodgkin lymphoma, very similar to myeloma. And APOBEC signature appears to be relatively late. It is seen it, most, muta most APOBEC mutations are non-duplicate, meaning they occur late. And there is a significant slope between duplicate and non-duplicated uh, case, cases, suggesting how that is a late event, which is which is not surprising. And in number of cases that showing how that the signatures uh, two and thirteen is shown here, and you can see a lot of cases actually have a very significant amount of Auerbach. This signature is actually quite interesting. That's SPS25. It's a chemotherapy signature, fairly novel. And this patient actually has a recurrent classical Hodgkin lymphoma exposed to multiple lines of therapy. Now, just to reconstruct the pathogenesis a little bit more. Now, we can think about germinal center, which has an AID type signature. So all the cells that go through, B cells that go through germinal center have that, as well as 
a post-germinal center of B-cell lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma, DLB-cell, follicular lymphoma, myeloma, and mutated CLL have the signature for AID. There is also the so-called non-canonical AID signature now thought to be due to polymerase ETA. That's new, that's new studies. And that signature is usually seen in all the germinal center B cells because there is a kind of a global mutagenesis event. It's not seen in unmutated CLL, and it's also not seen in uh, classical Hodg in classical Hodgkin lymphoma, suggesting that event of proliferation and mutagenesis post the germinal center or in, a, in replicating part of the germinal center is missing in CHL. Uh, the, the rearrangements of the PCR are mostly non-productive, though we identified two, three cases where the rearrangement of PCR it was actually predicted to be productive based on productive rearrangement of both heavy and light chain of the B cell receptor. And the AID mutations appear to be occurring before and after duplication, suggesting that uh, at least prolonged residents or re-entry into the germinal center of the HRS cells. So putting this all together in a cartoonish kind of model. So what, what is actually happening? So first we have the non-AID drivers, B2M, GN, GN13, PTPN1, and look, look, look at that, what, what's happening between the, what we think is like in a normal model with naive, terminal, naive, naive cell with expressing IgM, IgD, entering a germinal center versus a mutated the precursor of HRS cells when entering a germinal center. Uh, both undergo a, 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 a idiosomatic hypermutation. Uh, you know, the HRS cells acquires additional mutation, loses B cell receptor, and you know it's supposed to die because uh, cells are negatively selected for if they do not express BCR, but there is escape likely due to additional mutagenesis, and there is uh, and and this escape may be mediated by chromosomal gains, additional AID mutation targets, and the, you know basically you get you're getting lack of apoptosis but also lack of additional proliferation within the germinal center that lacks that uh, SBS signature nine. And then eventually it develops uh, additional chromosomal gains, out mutation like activity, which is late. And then we see the evolution of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So, you know, it's been a kind of a fun journey. I think we're now getting close to reconstructing the timing of HRS events and timing the pathogenesis, which may provide additional opportunities for intervention, for early diagnosis, or for possibility for more targeted therapy. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to this talk. And again, I just want to acknowledge all the collaborators who've done most of the work. Wow. Misha, thank you very much. This is really outstanding uh, work uh, on a very difficult area. Uh, there are a, a couple of questions, but uh, I will start asking, what do you think that the, 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 what, what, is, what is the cause of the early mutation in this kind of like three to five years old, whatever that do you have? Do you have any hypothesis on that? What could be the event that triggers the mutation? Obviously, you know, am I right to think that your data is suggesting that childhood uh, Hodgkin is not a developmental event, but it's acquired event in the uh, in the uh, early childhood? It's so it appears. I mean, it could be kind. Of, you know, it could be a viral infection, for instance. Could it, could this be, say, EBV infection that you know, kind of a standby hit? Uh, that drives proliferation, drives mutagenesis, you know, could, could be something else. I mean, those mutations could be unlucky, random in utero mutations. We don't, we can't really time the events of mu early mutations. All we can do is time mutations of whole genome duplication. Whole genome duplication appears to be occurring after the mutation. So that three to five year window is for whole genome duplication. The events that occur prior to that, we are untimable. So we're talking about the five year window there before the diagnosis of classical Hodgkin lymphoma, but the early mutations occur earlier, and perhaps on in the background of those early mutations, they're being selected by some sort of early childhood infection. And that's a possibility or, 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 or some other environmental stress. I mean, it's very much hand wavy at this point, but you know, it, it, it appears to be somewhat probable that there is, you know, that kind of early middle school event may, be, may in fact be like kind of, you know, people are being introduced to some sort of infection. 
Yeah. Dr. Campo has a question, whether you have looked at any of the Northern Vosaparidum and Hodgkin lymphoma cases, whether, you know, is, do you know whether there's any similarities, differences? We it's have not. The pediatric group, no, you have not, yeah. You, there's we no have way. not. I mean, there is like, uh, and there have actually been, Jonathan Fromm yet again developed another test for NLP Hodgkin. So, you know, I think it's worth looking at, but, you know, given it's a rare disease, we have not done it at all. So when Bin is asking whether, do you have a, you know, normal cell control with regards to molecular clock? You know, that's really surprising that young has, uh, imitation burden is higher in the younger patient than the older. Uh, did you include non-pathogenic variants for molecular clock? I think you did, but uh... yes, there are all there. Are, the variants in the clock are all, you know, basically the vast majority of the variants are non-pathogenic, of course. Uh, you know, and the clock has been shown to be relatively constant across tissues. So, for instance, for B, like a normal B cell clock exists, right? Uh, the slope is in the younger patients actually not surprisingly different. That is actually true for other pediatric tumors where there is probably an accelerated clock. Uh, so, in fact, we were kind of satisfied to see that because, you know, the finding is confirmed across other pediatric tumors where the slope is actually steeper in peds. Okay, so one last question uh, from Dr. Sal. Uh, were there any differences in those uh, pattern of mutations between EBV positive and EBV negative Hodgkin? I think most of them were EBV negative in your cohort. But... Yeah, vast majority. Again, you know, I think it's a limitation of the study. I mean, we only had, I think, four. Uh, or five ABV positive cases, we didn't find many differences and certainly not non, non statistically significant. So it's hard to make that conclusion from that small of a number. I mean, we're looking forward to trying to do more, but at this point, that's hard to say. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Misha, for this outstanding uh, talk. Uh, we will now continue with our second talk. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Amy Duffield, who is an associate uh, uh, attending uh, and member in, the, uh, in our uh, hematopathology service in, in the department. Uh, Amy has a distinguished record as a physician scientist, uh, but also she's an outstanding uh, that, you know, lymph node and I should say bone marrow pathologist with uh, uh, great insights into uh, uh, role of morphology in making the right diagnosis. And she has written uh, books about the topic and she's gonna share uh, with us uh, her experience with uh, uh, you know, the, the challenges in the reactive lymph nodes. Her title is called Lumps and Bumps and Challenges and Pitfalls in Lymph Node Pathology. Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, so, it's difficult to follow Dr. Rochelle's talk that was rigorous and sophisticated and a real tour de force. This is going to be some more fun cases. Um, and the objectives are just to review several interesting and challenging cases in lymph node pathology and also highlight how hematopathologists really need to work together with our clinical, laboratory, and surgical pathology colleagues to get to the best diagnosis for our patients. So as any fellow who's ever worked in heme path, or even anyone's even ever done a heme path rotation knows, hematopathologists want all of the information. They want to know everything. And the reason for that is, is because it can really help. And I'm just going to go over a few cases where the work that we do before we even look at the slides helps us make the diagnosis. So we want to know the patient's age, and that's because kids can have really big lymph nodes and they're just reactive. They have very, um, very active immune systems. Um, but if you have a very large lymph node in an older patient, it's more suspicious. We also want to know where the patient's from and what do they do with their spare time. There's certain, for instance, there's certain infections that are more, um, you know, more frequent in different areas of the United States or even the world. Um, also, patients in prison are more likely to have tuberculosis. People who work with animals or skin animals can get strange zoonotic infections. People with cats um, are just can get all sorts of different infections, but it's worth it. So um, here's a case of a 60-year-old man from Cyprus, and it came with an original diagnosis of atypical follicular hyperplasia. Here you can see the follicles, and they look a little the cells in the middle of the quote unquote germinal centers look a little unusual and that's why we got it. And when we stained it up, these cells were negative for CD20, which 
obviously germinal center cells, so it should be B cells, they should express 20. They also express bright one, mum one. In knowing the patient was from Cyprus, we added an HHV8 and an Eber. So this is characteristic of, or this is actually diagnostic for, an HHV8 and EBV associated germinotropic lymphoproliferative disorder. And this is a situation where knowing where the patient was from really helped us make the diagnosis because this is not something that I would really be concerned about um, as strongly if a patient were from Indiana and had always lived there. So we do see, just for some fun pictures, we see some other HHV8 related lymphadenopathies. Here's a 48 year old man status post cardiac transplant. And neither of these patients are, are from the Mediterranean, I should say. Um, and so here you see a wedge shape proliferation, atypical vascular proliferation. Here's higher power. There's some hemosiderin deposition. And here's the HHV8 that we see in Kaposi sarcoma. We have another patient who's a 58 year old woman who had lymphadenopathy and systemic symptoms. She felt rather lousy. Um, and so the, the germinal centers look, or I'm sorry, the reactive follicles look a little unusual. There's a little bit of um, onion skinning around the mantle zones and the germinal centers have these um, penetrating vessels. But when you look in the interfollicular areas there were tons of plasma cells. So we can do a kappa and a lambda in situ hybridization. And here you see it's a mix of kappa and lambda. So it's, it's, not, it's not, it doesn't look like a myeloma, but look how in the lambda we see more in the, um, in the atypical germinal center. And these are lambda positive plasma blasts, which are characteristic for HHV8 positive Castleman disease. And here you see the pattern of HHV8 where it's in the mantle zone and also sort of some, in some cases you can see this staining that appears to um, involve the follicular dendritic cell meshwork that underlies the follicles. So here's another case where the clinical information is also critically important. We want to know, does the patient have a prior history of lymphoma? Do they have an infection or inflammatory condition? Do they have an immunodeficiency, any sort of autoimmunity, including iatrogenic autoimmunities? Are they on any drugs? Do they have B symptoms? And is the node painful? This is, I, I believe this is actually in Robbins, but they mentioned that if, um, people get pain in lymph nodes after drinking alcohol. You have to be concerned about classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And um, I thought that was, you know, you read it and you kind of learn it in, in medical school, but this actually occurs. We have pediatric, particularly um, teenage, early twenties kids who come in with pain in their neck or their chest pain. Um, after drinking alcohol, they go to big frat parties and it turns out to be classical Hodgkin lymphoma. But here's another case where all of the clinical information is helpful. Very, very complicated past medical history. 35 year old guy with celiac disease, diabetes and a seizure disorder treat, treated with phenytoin for quite a while now. He comes in with acute renal failure, encephalopathy, a leukocytosis with eosinophilia, diffuse lymphadenopathy and a rash. And so when we look at the lymph node, we see that the, the, this is actually part of the paracortex. It's actually hard to even see the follicles. The paracortex is very expanded and there's an enormous number of eosinophils. Here's almost an eosinophilic abscess. When we do the three and the 20, we see that there's a large number of T cells. So most of these lymphocytes in here are T cells. They're very, um, they're very popped up. They're very activated. They're expressing partial CD30, which is what we see in, in immunoblast or activated lymphocytes. And the KS67 proliferation index is very high. So when we took, take all of this together, this is characteristic for a patient with DRESS syndrome or drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Now, we like to think that the clinical team is going to put this all together, but it's an important diagnosis to make because it's associated with a late onset hypersensitivity reaction to a drug. So this was due to the patient taking phenytoin. And he'd been taking it though for months, but this is how dress presents. It just kind of comes out of, of nowhere. And it's not really um, on anyone's radar sometimes because it occurs after the drug is started. There's about, about a 10% mortality rate. So it's important to catch it. You need to stop the drug. So this is where the clinical information of the drugs that the patient are on is very helpful. We see other lymphoid hyperplasias associated with drugs. 
Um, and anticonvulsants like phenytoin have characteristically been associated with it. It was first described in 1959 when hydantoin came into use. Um, and before we had all the immunostains and all the flow cytometry, it was just called drug-induced pseudolymphoma. But here, for instance, is a seven-year-old boy. This lymph node was huge. It was three centimeters, if I remember. Um, and even treated with phenobarbital. And so when you look at the CD3 and the CD20, you see these big expansion of the paracortex here. We were able to say that this was folic, I'm, I'm sorry, that this was, you know, lymphoid hyperplasia with paracortical hyperplasia likely due to the drug because we knew the history. Otherwise, we would have just waved our hands and said, I don't know why, but it looks reactive. Another thing we see a lot at MSK is follicular hyperplasia associated with dasatinib. Dasatinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It's one of the later generation TKIs in use um, for the treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia. So it's like a later um, variant of uh, Gleevec. And so we see pretty good follicular hyperplasia. I know one of my colleagues, Dr. Yabe had given me a case and I had one as well. So those are some other lymphoid hyperplasias we can see in association with drugs. So we also wanna know where is the node as we, as we torture the poor fellow, um, well, where is it, where is it? And this is where the help from our um, uh, colleagues in imaging comes in. But part of the reason we want, we care so much is while any lymph node can be involved by lymphoma or metastatic disease, there are some lymph nodes that are particularly likely to represent a malignant process. Supraclavicular lymphadenopathy is, you know, makes, makes my ears perk up, makes my antenna go up. That's very anxiety provoking. That's more likely to be associated with a um, neoplastic process. So here's a lymph node in a 17-year-old kid, a 17-year-old boy or man. Um, so infraauricular lymph node. And look, it has these eosinophilic abscesses, just like the case I showed you. However, when you look at the node itself, it has more features of chronicity. It has a thickened capsule here. There's bands of sclerosis. There's follicular hyperplasia. It was very easy to find Warthin-Finkel D cells in this case. So this is in a case where the the um, location also really tipped us off to what was likely going on. So this is Kimura lymphadenopathy and they can, they can look for IgE in the serum to confirm. And so this is one of the benign or reactive entities that we see near the ear. It can be confused with, or it can be difficult to differentiate from ALHE um, or angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, but that tends to affect the skin and our derm path colleagues see that. But, Kimura is actually involves lymph nodes. However, there's other locations where we think of other specific processes. Posterior cervical lymph nodes um, is associated with toxoplasma lymphadenopathy. Toxoplasma is thought to be associated with a lot of unexplained reactive lymphadenopathies. Um, one of the residents who I had worked with actually was diagnosed, well, not diagnosed, but this was caught by um, the, her hairdresser when she was young. Her, they noted big and large lymph nodes in the um, posterior cervical area. Took her to the doctor, found out she had toxo. Cervical nodes are associated with Kikuchi, Rosidorfman, um, and also frequently infections in the head and neck. Ax axillary lymph nodes, we see a lot of dermatopathic lymphadenopathy, particularly at MSK, where there's a lot of patients being treated for breast cancer. I'm not sure why, and there've actually been papers written that show that patients with breast cancer tend to have dermatopathic changes in lymph nodes more frequently, perhaps due to procedures or manipulation or radiation, um, which causes skin irritation with draining to the, um, to the nearby lymph nodes. Sometimes we'll see an accessory spleen, which is submitted as a lymph node, and that has a very specific uh, location. In the portal system, we see lipid lymphadenopathy, especially in patients who have gallstones. In the inguinal area, it's just important to note, you have really big inguinal nodes that are just reactive. They can get really big, um, but still be benign. So I already noted, we talked to our clinical, we talked to our radiograph, radiology colleagues trying to figure out where the node is. And we also wanna know how active it is on a PET or CT scan. Um, so you think of low SUVs as being comforting, but it, in reality, we have a reactive node usually as an intermediate SUV. Maybe you'll see four to nine. However, if a patient has extensive lymphadenopathy with a very low SUV, like in the two to three range, that's actually more likely to be a low-grade lymphoma. 
high SUVs are associated with aggressive lymphomas. You don't see reactive nodes with an SUV you know, of 20. So we also work together very, very closely with our colleagues in laboratory medicine because we use these laboratory values. This is another thing we torment the fellow with. What do you know, what, what the patients count? Do they have an elevated LDH? Um, are there any cultures, any microbiology information? Has, is there an SPAP or an IFE? Does the patient have a gammopathy? And here's a case of a 48-year-old woman with a 13-year history of lupus. She presented with diffuse lymphadenopathy and anemia with hypergammaglobulinemia. Her IgG was rather elevated. So it was sent for, I, for um, serum immunofixation electrophoresis. And what we find here is the patient has a clonal band, an IgG, but there's nothing in kappa or lambda. And this is characteristic. When we look at this picture of a lymph node with this sort of plasmacytic, plasmacytoid um, replacement that expresses IgG and entirely lacks um, kappa or lambda, this is characteristic of gamma heavy chain disease. This is frequently seen in patients who have autoimmune disorders. Um, and um, it can actually be rather aggressive. Um, this patient died relatively soon after the diagnosis. So this is a case where we're really looking to the labs and the computer trying to figure out what could, the, what could my patient have? And we look to our lab medicine colleagues for help. So here's a case where the CDC really helped us make the diagnosis. We almost went down the wrong path until we had um, got the CDC and got an assist from molecular pathology. This is a 47 year old man. It was just sent to us as an enlarged lymph node. You can see that there's a little germinal center here, but the paracortical area is largely replaced by these atypical lymphocytes. And if you look at them at higher power, these are normal small lymphocytes up at the top, but these look a little they, have, they look a little bigger, they have finer chromatin, and they express CD3. Although if you're, if you're used to looking at CD3 scans, this actually looks a little funny. It looks a little fuzzy, it looks a little dim. Then to make things, oh, and I should also say, it also expresses very bright CD7. So usually if you have a, um, a mature T cell lymphoma, you get loss of CD7. So I have this kind of fuzzy wuzzy three, right seven, and I have CD79A, that doesn't make any sense, right? CD79A is a B cell marker. And the KI67 proliferation index is very high. However, this pattern with aberrant expression of CD79A can be seen in T lymphoblastic lymphoma. So we look at this and think, okay, looks like the patient has T lymphoblastic lymphoma, getting ready to release the case. And then we get a note from the outside. Oh, the patient has a very high white count and an eosinophilia. You think, what? So they said, we said, please, send us, please do a bone marrow and send us the rest of the case. So here's the peripheral blood. This is a very, this is a, a high white count and there's many abnormal eosinophils. Here's one, here's one, here's one down here. And so when we got the bone marrow, it was almost 100% cellular, essentially replaced by myeloid cells with increased eosinophils, but there was no T lymphoblastic lymphoma at all in the bone marrow. And so we immediately knew what it was, although we need an assist from our colleagues in molecular pathology. This is a myeloid lymphoid neoplasm with eosinophilia. In this case, it had a PDGFRA rearrangement. There's some other kinds of rearrangement, like PDGFRB or FGFR1, but in this case, it had a PDGFRA rearrangement. So we got this, we said, oh my gosh, there's this eosinophilia, we have a myeloid, we have a lymphoid component, send it straight to molecular and they'll do Archer and confirm the diagnosis. So that was an instance where our, um, lab medicine colleagues helped us. So here's another thing. Um, we get all these laboratory studies and they're incredibly helpful to us when we go to make a diagnosis, but sometimes they can trip you up. So here's this 24 year old man. He comes in with a positive RPR. He had, as, as the oncologist said, well, he has some, some worrisome features. You know, he has some risk factors for syphilis. I think he has syphilis, he has secondary, I think he has secondary syphilis. He has, you know, extensive lymphadenopathy. He also has autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And they said, well, let's just make sure it isn't lymphoma. We're gonna do a lymph node and bone marrow biopsy. So when we get the lymph node, you can see here that there is a follicle, but it looks kind of banged up. It looks abnormal. And outside of the follicle, the paracortex looks unusual. There's this vascular proliferation. It isn't as well organized as we would typically see. It's this atypical paracortical hyperplasia. And you can see on a KI-67 that the germinal center has an appropriately high KI-67, but out here it's still a little high. Usually the paracortex isn't that hopped up on KI. 
When we look out here, we also see CD30, um, which is variably expressed in some of the cells, characteristic of immunoblasts or activated, um, activated lymphocytes. So uh, this is my second worth in Finkel D type giant cell for the day. And then we see, well, then we're finding these very easily. So if you look in a book, worth and Finkel D type giant cells are associated with measles vaccine. We asked if the guy have a measles vaccine and the clinical team uh, looked like, look at us like we we're crazy and said no. <laughs> um, so here we have this picture and we said, okay, well, we'll get the bone marrow. While we're getting the bone marrow, they did an FTA ABS to confirm the positive RPR, to confirm that he had syphilis because he didn't have a Palmer rash or any of the other uh, um, symptoms associated with syphilis. However, the marrow was stuffed with LE cells. These are histiocytes, um, these are histiocytes and um, granulocytes that have engulfed denatured nuclear material. And the reason they're called LE cells is for lupus erythematosus. So what this patient actually has is systemic lupus lymphadenitis. That's a cause, he has, he has SLE and they confirmed it doing, and they did the rest of the testing to confirm it. But this is another case where the, the laboratory results can trip you up. Um, but working together with your clinical team and your laboratory team, you can really make, um, you can work your best to make the best diagnosis. There are other enlarged lymph nodes you can get in patients with a positive RPR. Here's syphilitic lymphadenitis, where we have the very, um, prominent follicular hyperplasia, with very thickened capsule, which scallops around the reactive germinal centers, you have a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate around the small vessels in the capsule. Sometimes you'll get abscess formation. And if you're lucky on a worth and starry stain, you'll see these guys. Sometimes you need to do immunohistochemistry to prove it though. And here's a syphilis IHC. Here's another patient who has a positive RPR and another patient with systemic lupus lymphadenitis. So the note I just showed you is actually lupus lymphadenitis, but this is the more characteristic look. This looks a lot like Kikuchi lymphadenitis. And frankly, you can't tell lupus lymphadenitis and Kikuchi lymphadenitis apart um, morphologically. You need to do the rest of the testing. So usually we just sign these out as histiocytic necrotizing lymphadenitis and say, go do the testing. Could be SLE. It could be Kikuchi. But what you see here is an aneutrophilic um, necrosis. And you'll see these histiocytes with the um, with a compression of the nucleus into a C shape. So there's one of them here, one of them here. So this aneutrophilic necrosis is characteristic of both Kikuchi and SLE. So Basically, I've just usually I've tormented the poor fellow <laughs> um, asking more and more and more information from all the information, but eventually we do look at the slides. Um, and so I have a whole checklist that I go down if I'm not sure what the diagnosis is. I try to kind of move down this, down this checklist and see if I see any abnormalities. They're going to push me one way or the other toward a diagnosis. I'm just going to go over a few of them because honestly, I could go for hours, but I have a half an hour. So I'm going to limit it to a few. Um, interesting diagnoses. So the first thing I look for is a capsule. If it isn't sampled, I call it lymphoid tissue. And what does it mean if I don't have a capsule? It could either be just not a node, like it could be extranodal lymphoid tissue or just inflammation, or it can be a vigorous inflammatory response with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And this can actually raise the possibility is this metastatic disease, because if it's a lymph node, it's a met, or is it a primary tumor with a lot of tills with a lot of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes? So here is a case that we got, um, that I got a long time ago, where you'll see here that there, it looks like there's a lot of um, a lymphoid infiltrate. And this here is skeletal muscle. It's a leg mass. And it came from an outside hospital saying rule out Hodgkin. This is a higher power view. And probably everybody who does search path knows exactly what this is. Um, so here's a higher power view. And you can see the atypical cells in here as well. So the diagnosis on this, and I will tell you, I worked it up for Hodgkin, it is not Hodgkin. Um, the diagnosis for this is actually best made away from all of the lymphocytes. If you move into the peritumoral adipose tissue, you see lipoblasts. And so this is a lymphocyte rich, well-differentiated liposarcoma. It is not classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, but this is um, an instant where an absent capsule is sort of helpful um, to making our diagnosis. Here's a case from just the other day. It's a 46-year-old um, man with a gastric mass. And imaging studies said 
possibly due to lymphomatous um, involvement. He has FDG, avid lymphadenopathy above and below the diaphragm, intake in the spleen and liver. So the, the radiologist threw up the warning flag. I think that this is lymphoma. So we get a core biopsy of a retroperitoneal lymph node. And you look at it, you think, well, that could be nodular sclerosing variant of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. It has nodules, it has sclerosis. When I look in the nodules, I have a mixture of large atypical cells and inflammatory cells, though I didn't see any eosinophils. Usually you see a few eosinophils in classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So we worked it up. The large atypical cells are negative for 45 and 30, but they are beautifully positive for CK7. I don't usually get into the CKs, I stick with the CDs. And so we immediately sent this to search path to have them work the rest of it up. But this is metastatic adenocarcinoma. Um, so we can see lymph node abnormalities that sort of morphologically mimic lymphomas, um, even in non-heme malignancies. So we'll go over some abnormalities in the sinuses. So the first thing I ask is, are they patent? And frankly, it can be hard to tell. Sometimes they're smushed up. Sometimes it's difficult to tell whether or not they're patent. But we do see a lot of lymph nodes here with sinus histiocytosis. That's because often nodes that are draining tumors, so draining carcinomas will often show sinus histiocytosis. This isn't truly sinus histiocytosis. I'm just showing um, a patent sinus that's filled with histiocytes. You can also have small lymphocytes, sometimes even some polys in there. So this is an obligatory slide at MSK. This is bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy in a four-year-old girl. When you look at the node, you can see it's very enlarged. The capsule is thickened. When you look at the sinuses, they're very, they're widely patent and they're stuffed with these large histiocytes. Here they are. And these histiocytes have small lymphocytes and occasionally granulocytes that are just wandering through. And when you highlight them, they stay moved with CD68, which I don't have a picture of, and S100. So this is sinus histiocytosis with massive lymphadenopathy, otherwise known, otherwise known as Rosite Dorfman disease. Usually it's bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy in kids. You can see this in parapoiesis. I will note that I have rarely seen in parapoiesis and histiocytic sarcoma as well. So you can't use you, you can't just see in parapoiesis and rule out that it's not a histiocytic sarcoma. Usually these histiocytes are cyclin D1 and they express CD68 and S100. Another tricky thing is IgG4 positive plasma cells can maybe increase, which can get start to get people mixed up. Could this be an IgG4 related lymphadenopathy or is this RDD? Another thing is that focal RDD can coexist with lymphoma. So if I see it somewhere, I, I still, I, you're still obligated to look at the rest of the node because we do see it um, at the same time as lymphomas. And of course, the reason this is obligatory is it was um, described by Dr. Rosai, who was at MSK for a while um, in 1969. Um, so there's our obligatory RDD. <laughs> I should also note this, this can involve soft tissue, which everybody in search path knows. Um, although the imperapoesis in soft tissue is often very subtle, it's difficult to see. So we have a lymph node and it has the sinuses stuffed with something, but it's not, if they look funny, you have to take a step back because you can have some other neoplasms out of a predilection for the sinuses. The first one would be metastatic carcinoma and melanoma, which everybody knows. But anaplastic large cell lymphoma can have a very distinctive um, sinus distribution. It's brightly, which they usually show bright and uniform expression of CD30. Another tumor, and this is a, a man with um, isolated cervical lymphadenopathy, and these cells turn out to be CD20 negative and MUM1 positive, and it's an ALK positive large B cell lymphoma. This also, this is a, not something you see every day. But these are tumors that have a predilection for the sinuses. So here's a pitfall that um, if you stare at your slides for too long and he <laughs> you will see. So this is a 35 year old woman. She has a history of breast cancer. So I'm already very anxious. I wanna show it to search path and I'm gonna do a cytokeratin. And then she also has um, large pleural effusions and an enlarged mediastinal lymph node. So I'm looking at it and I think, oh, what are these big cells? And they're in the sinuses, what are they? So I do an AU183 and they're positive, which you know has me even more agitated because the patient has a history of breast cancer, but they're also positive for calretinin. 
And so these are mesothelial cells and lymph node sinuses, and it's associated with serosal fluid collections. And these large atypical cells are positive for both CK, cytokeratins, and calretinin. It needs to be stated that this was described at MSK by Dr. Argani, by Pete Argani and Juan Rosai in 1997, and the date is very important here. So this is an entity described at MSK in 1997, but somewhat inexplicably, the US Postal Service and American Medical Association have not accepted the fact that Dr. Argani has completed his search path fellowship and continue to send him mail at his apartment from his fellowship. Um, so apparently he does not have any unpaid cable bills or any real bills. So there's other items sometimes we find in sinuses that should not be there. Here's a 66 year old man from the Caribbean who has hypercalcemia and lymphadenopathy. And we got a big and large lymph node and there was, as, as the resident or the fellow came to me and said, it's a worm. So it's actually not a worm, it's a larva. Um, and when we look at the patient, this peripheral blood has these flower-like cells. This is from Salivision, from our colleagues in lab medicine. A small bowel biopsy also shows these larvae, and the patient ultimately expired. So we have a cardiac biopsy. We also found these in the heart. So the diagnosis here with the flower cell, and we did obviously more of a workup, is adult T-cell leukemia lymphoma. So this patient has a strongyloides hyperinfection. And ATLL is a risk factor, risk factor for developing strongyloides hyperinfection. If you see um, larva in the tissue, it's actually important to alert the clinician if there's any chemo that's being planned. That's because if you treat a patient with um, strongyloides with chemo, the, the larva will actually react to it and, and can um, uh, actually, it, that will kill the patient, not the tumor, the, the larva reaction to the chemo. So other things on my checklist include follicular hyperplasia. It's a very common reason we see a big lymph node and there's so many different reasons we can have it. You can have reactive follicles, follicles which can sometimes be serpiginous. Here's a patient with rheumatoid lymphadenopathy. It was big, wild looking um, germinal centers. But it can also be vaccine related, infectious, IgG4 disease, Camora disease is associated with it. You saw some reactive follicles in that node near the kid's ear. Also early dermatopathic lymphadenopathy. And if you've ever worked near the NIH, you get all sorts of fun immune, immune deficiencies. And those patients also often have follicular hyperplasia. And as I noted, dasatinib is a drug associated with follicular hyperplasia. So here's a patient we got recently. It's a two centimeter supraclavicular lymph node in a 24 year old man. As you remember, when I see here, when I hear a lymph node is supraclavicular, it makes me very anxious. It's more likely to be, um, uh, to be pathologic. And this is a big lymph node. Um, but when we look at it, it looks reactive. There's these big follicles. You can see tangible body macrophages and the follicles express 20. The, the T cells are, are really um, concentrated in the inner follicular area. The follicles appropriately express CD10. They're appropriately negative for BCL2. This just looks reactive. So then when we look in the history, we notice he's, it's one week after his second mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. So this is vaccine-related lymphadenopathy, which we've seen a lot of, and I presume the breast service has seen a fair amount of it too. So this occurs um, ipsilateral to the vaccine site, and it can be seen in axilla, but also in cervical and supraclavicular nodes. The COVID-19 uh, mRNA vaccines in particular are very highly immunogenic, and the lymphadenopathy can persist. Although COVID-19 is the one in the news right now, it's been reported with other vaccines. And also these lymph nodes can be so reactive that you can see small clonal B cell populations on flow cytometry. Um, so this is something I've been asking a lot or digging through the medical record a lot recently if I see a big reactive node, um, trying to figure out why it could be. So here's another case with follicular hyperplasia. Look at this big follicular hyperplasia, big node. 
And it has these interesting um, curved granulomas that curve right around a follicle. Here it is at higher power. You can see the multinucleated giant cells. Also in this node, there's bands of fibrosis and there's a thrombose vessel right next to it. So everybody in search path knows what stain to do. Um, so here we did an IgG and an IgG4, and you see here that there is an increase in IgG4 positive plasma cells. So this is likely an IgG4 related lymphadenopathy. However, I generally won't boom it out that way. Just say reactive lymphoid hyperplasia with increased IgG4 cells, because you can actually see increased IgG4 cells in some lymphomas and rosite dorfman. It, it's not a specific finding. You need the serum studies from your lab medicine colleagues to try to figure that out. But IgG4 related lymphadenopathy has sort of protean manifestations. You can have reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, you can have increased EOs, you can have thrombophlebitis, you can have fibrosis, they can capsule, but you can also have a lot of sheets of plasma cells. There's multi, you can look like Castleman disease. It just has many different presentations um, on the histology. Speaking of which, what if I get a lymph node that has lots of follicles with a tretic and sometimes multiple germinal centers? So here you can see the little follicles but they have this onion skinning of the mantle zones around it. And here, here it's usually we call it twinning because usually there's two germinal centers in this follicle. This one is having like higher order multiples. It has like 10 germinal centers in this atypical follicle. The interfollicular area shows uh, a prominent vasculature. Sometimes you'll get these nodules that look like they're going to be um, germinal centers, but they don't have a mantle zone and they express bright CD123. These are nodules of plasma cytoid dendritic cells. You can also see scattered TDT positive cells and an expanded follicular dendritic cell meshwork. So every, I, as soon as I said onion skinning, everybody knew where I was going with that, yeah? So this is Castleman disease, the Highland vascular variant. And so you can see a large mass. Um, sometimes lymph nodes are nodal groups. I, I once saw um, a Whipple done for, um, not here, <laughs> a Whipple done for, um, uh, Highland vascular Castleman, it can make a really big mass. Um, but you get these atretic germinal centers with onion skinning of concentric mantle zones and penetrating hyalinized vessels, which form these sort of lollipops in the atypical germinal centers. Vascular background, the flow cytometry is normal, there's nothing clonal, and these are HHV8 negative. So here's a pitfall. We see what looks like Castleman-like changes, but this doesn't mean you can stop because it can be associated with lymphomas. Here's a case which it kind of has an, this looks like it has an atretic germinal center, onion skinning of the mantle zone. But when I look in between, you see large atypical cells, which express CD30, MUM1, and EVV. So this is an interfollicular classical Hodgkin lymphoma, which is seen in, node, in a node that also has Castleman-like changes. It was actually, um, Search path had sent it over because they had said, you know, this looks like Castleman. And um, and the the HRS cells are actually very subtle. Ultimately, the patient had a node taken on their neck, which showed just flagrant CHL. But this can be very subtle. But whenever you see Castleman-like changes, take a step back and, and rule out lymphoma. Another pitfall are reactive follicles. Um, with reactive follicles are patients who present like this, 52-year-old man with lymphadenopathy. And I apologize, this side looks smushed. But you see an area here that's CD20 positive, and it expresses CD10, and it's BCL2 negative. So that looks like a reactive germinal center. But the KI67 is too low. And when we look at higher power, you can see most of the lymphocytes are very small. And the KI67 in this area is very low. This is actually a BCL2 negative follicular lymphoma. It's been um, described extensively by Dr. Jaffe. Um, about 10 to 15% of low grade folliculars are BCL2 negative. Um, and it may be that when the fusion is formed, it actually dis disrupts the epitope that we use from our BCL2 immunostain to identify it. So I like to do a KS67 in my cases. I feel like I feel like it keeps me honest um, because if you have done it, because um, this makes it clear that there's something abnormal in this lymph node. Another pitfall with reactive follicles is if I have reactive follicles with attenuated mantle zones, here's a, here's a big lymph node, but it's really hard to see the mantle zones and they kind of look crowded. But when we do the immunostains, they express 20 and there's three. 
But here's CD10. CD10 should be in the germinal center. It shouldn't be brighter outside of the germinal center. And look at the PD1. There should be just a few scattered cells in the germinal center, not this extensive um, uh, involvement outside of the follicle. And there's a few EBV positive cells. So what this is, is the pattern one of angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma, which was described in part by Dr. Dogen, who is our acting chair. So Here's the last of my germinal center cells, uh, our germinal center slides. So here's a mass and the whole thing looks like a germinal center um, immunophenotypically. I just get this tiny little core, it expresses CD20, CD10, it's BCL2 negative, the KS67 is high. But the patient sounds like she has lymphoma, abdominal distension, B symptoms, pancytopenia. And we do a MIC because this, this, this um, immunophenotype could also be Burkitt. We do a MIC and the MIC is kind of lousy, it's there, but it's not like a reactive germinal center, nor is it like uh, um, Burkitt lymphoma where we expect we have a MIC translocation and really intense expression of MIC. Then the outside sends us information from the bone marrow. The patient had presented with pancytopenia, so they actually did a fish probe profile looking for myelodysplastic syndrome. There's a fish probe for 11Q23 in that probe set and they say, well, she has an abnormality in 11Q23, which is neither 8 nor 14, which is what you're looking for in um, Burkitt. So here's a, a, a hint we can get from going under oil, really looking at a high power. Here's the tumor. And I see the um, apoptotic debris is very chunky looking. Compare it to a case of Burkitt or the debris in a normal germinal center. So it's very chunky. And then our fish comes back here and the micro arrangement is negative, which confirms it's not Burkitt but it kind of stains like Burkitt. So, I, so we know um, Dr. Ott, German Ott, um, has published a paper saying you get very chunky apoptotic debris associated when you're in, in lymphomas, in Burkitt-like lymphomas with a lab Q aberration. So we talked to our cytogenetics um, team here, which is amazing, and they do a SNP array and show us that here's chromosome 11. In fact, there is a proximal gain and a telomeric loss on chromosome 11. So this is diagnostic for Burkitt-like lymphoma with an 11Q aberration. All right, very quickly, I don't wanna go over time. Um, paracortical abnormalities. We see these in infection, um, you know, dermatopathic lymphadenopathy, drug-associated, we've already talked about that, and autoimmune conditions. But often we see histiocytic proliferations in the paracortex. I'm just gonna go over a few of those. But first, what if you have a paracortical expansion by immature T cells, but the patient is fine? So this is a patient who had enlarged um, lymphoid tissue in Waldeyer's ring. And we look at it, I kind of covered up germinals, but here's germinal centers in here, but the inner follicular area is sort of expanded. It expresses CD3 and TDT. TDT is an immature, you shouldn't have TDT, extensive TDT in um, Wild Dyer's ring. You can occasionally see positive TDT positive cells, but not like this. And when we do flow, we saw a huge population of double positive T cells, but we also saw a single positive. We saw a few double negative. We saw it almost like a whole range of T cell maturation. And what this is, is an indolent T lymphoblastic proliferation where you get partial or complete replacement of the paracortex by immature double positive T cells. It does not have an underlying cytokeratin um, meshwork. There is no marrow involvement. And when we, when we do molecular, these are polyclonal. These have been described in association with Castleman disease, angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma. I've seen it in metastatic carcinoma. Um, and it has a very disconcertingly high KI67 proliferation index. So it's something to consider. Um, you can't necessarily boom these out as T lymphoblastic lymphoma. There's this thing called this indolent T lymphoblastic proliferation. So very quickly, when we look at the um, paracortex, we see granulomatous inflammation. And in my head, I sort of separate into necrotizing and non-necrotizing. This one here is TB. Organism very difficult to see on scans. I don't have a picture for you. Here's histo. And here's a very nice picture with a GMS. Um, this is coxie. This is something seen in the Southwestern US. I had to get this picture from my friend at City of Hope um, in Los Angeles, because we don't really see it here. 
It has been described extensively in archaeologists. If you spend your time dusting off dusty bones in the American Southwest, you're at an increased risk. And sometimes we see these non-necrotizing um, granulomas, which is characteristic for sarcoid. They're well-formed and tightly packed, and they, aren't, they don't show central necrosis, but may show some focal degenerative changes. You get these foreign body type giant cells and asteroid bodies and Shaman bodies. However, this is not a diagnosis we generally put on the top line. We're descriptive and say in the appropriate clinical and radiographic context, these findings are compatible with sarcoid. We also see non-granulomatous histiocytic proliferations in the paracortex, like particle disease, where you have wear and tear from a prosthetic joints. Here's a little chunk of metal, this little black piece there. And this can polarize hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, which is associated with a constellation of clinical findings. Here's a spindled pseudotumor, atypical mycobacteria, which can mimic a soft tissue tumor. And uh, here's um, Whipple's disease. This is a patient with GI symptoms. and. Um, has PAS positive debris in the histi, or not debris, PAS positive organisms in the histiocytes. So sometimes I, I, I went down this tube. Here's a patient with an early sarcoid, and I thought I saw organisms, and they stained with GMS and they stained with Fontanamasan, but they also stained with an iron stain. And so everybody in pulmonary knows what these are. These are Hamazaki Wessenberg bodies, and they're extracellular golden brown bodies that can mimic yeast. In comparison, if we really have yeast, here's a, um, it, here's a um, fungal form that's actually in a histiocyte. And so these are not actually within histiocytes. They're just um, incidental findings. So I also look for prominent medullary cords and necrosis, but I'm not going to go over that. I, I'm, I'm nearing the end. And so my final thoughts here is this, of course, only begins to scratch the surface of lymph node pathology, both benign and malignant. And what I think it's important to note and what I hope I, I convinced you is that lymph node pathology is a team sport. We talk to our clinicians, our, our colleagues in laboratory medicine are incredible, helpfully, incredibly helpful. Accessioning the grossing room, histology, and administrative administrative stuff all help us. We need these growth stain appropriately. We need them cut thin. We need portion sent for flow. Our administrative staff help us track down complicated histories. Histology, we torment them with requests for recuts and immunostains. And also our um, molecular and cytogenetics colleagues help us extensively. And our surgical pathology, co pathology colleagues we're often in contact with, because as you can see here, you can have um, overlap. It, there can be confusion sometimes. Is this game or is this search path? Um, and finally, we had to thank our trainees, particularly in heme path, since we, we harangue them and torment them with constant requests for more information. Um, and they always put up with us with a, with a smile. Um, so thank you very much. Amy. Thank you. This is an outstanding, uh, outstanding talk uh, covering a whole breadth of reactive lymphadenopathies. Uh, and there are many, many, many uh, congratulations in the chat and uh, everyone uh, indicating appreciation of this, uh, uh, you know, covering this area with so comprehensively. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, I don't see any specific questions, uh, but uh, Maybe one thing to consider, you know, could you give your top five uh, differential diagnosis in the staging, uh, staging lymph nodes that may come uh, to for, for an opinion in the, uh, in in the hematopathology? You know, we, of course, at MSK we see a lot of uh, cancer. Uh, excisions with staging lymph nodes and 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 many of these will have a surgical pathology related question is this lymphoma versus you know what what are, what are the things for people to consider in the staging setting you know it is these are incidentally removed lymph nodes without lymphadenopathy uh, and what what should be the top five or top three whatever you can come up uh, uh, i know i'm putting you on the spot here <laughs> Uh, but, you know, to think about uh, when you are looking at the staging lymph node beyond the metastatic carcinoma, what, what are the hematological questions that may come? 
So usually, um, uh, as I noted, as I noted in the beginning, we often see really prominent um, his, um, sinus histiocytosis. This is a known phenomenon in nodes that are draining tumor. And nodes that are draining tumor also often show reactive changes. Um, you can see follicular hyperplasia, paracortical hyperplasia. Um, one, I, I saw a great case, I'm sure the, the um, GU attending who gave it to me will remember, where there was really pronounced vascular transformation of the sinuses. So what happens with that is the patient had a large renal cell carcinoma and it compresses the blood supply. And essentially blood backs up into the lymph nodes. This is thought to be how it works. And so the um, sinuses um, got really expanded and you get a lot of blood in there and they so sort of transform into these vessels. So I've seen vascular transformation of sinuses. It's not my top concern, but it's something kind of fun that you see when there's a tumor compressing the blood supply. But mostly we just look for reactive changes. Sometimes I've gotten some questions from SearchPath um, about, for instance, they, they do immunostains and they find a small focus of BCL2 bright and CD10 bright um, cells in a follicle. And so sometimes they catch foci of, of um, basically in situ follicular neoplasia, which is like little foci of um, follicular, uh, of cells that carry a follicular lymphoma-like transformation. Um, and so we sometimes get questions about that. That's sort of a lecture unto itself. But if you see, if you see unusual looking follicles that express bright 10 and bright BCL2, bring it to us and we'll be happy to work that up. There's one question about uh, biopsies of persistent post-COVID vaccination, ipsilateral lymphadenopathy. I think you have seen some of these. Uh... Yeah, it's in the chat. Yes. You, maybe you can stop sharing your screen so that, uh, sure. you know, we are oh, able yeah. to, the, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. Um, so right now, um, people seem very aware of it. In fact, it was, there was a whole article in the New York Times about it. Um, and I think we're still trying to figure out what happens. The presumption is that it's just like a normal vaccine related lymphadenopathy. Like it'll, you know, eventually it will go away. Um, but the problems, the, the times we've gotten consults in confusing cases are when the patient recently had the vaccine because you get these clonal populations in flow. So in flow cytometry, we'll pick up these clonal germinal center populations. We're probably just a clone that's reacting to the vaccine. Eventually it seems to fade away. I feel like I'm not seeing as many of these anymore. There was a little burst of them this spring, um, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's a work in yes. progress. Yes, I, I agree. I think the other thing that's happening, I guess, in the practice is that, of course, these people, you know, because we are all vaccinated and some of us will get lymphoma. So, you know, it is also important not to assign everything to a vaccine related lymphadenopathy because we are seeing, you know, patients with three months ago, they got a vaccine and uh, now they develop a, you know, standard lymphoma not related to vaccines. So, uh, you know, I think it, it, it is not, it's good to understand it, but not to be too dismissive that the, all of these will be benign preparations. That's a great point. Yeah. Okay, Amy, I think this was really outstanding. Uh, we are, I think, right on time. Uh, so we will now have a coffee break and uh, that will take us uh, to the uh, award presentation. Uh, we'll be back at, uh, I'm looking at it, 11.20 a.m. Uh, New York time uh, to start the award presentation followed by uh, Dr. Campos lecture. Thank you for attending this, uh, uh, the, the first part of the uh, symposium and see you in half an hour. I hope uh, all of you are able to join us. We are back uh, to the uh, session. Uh, we will now proceed with the uh, uh, Stuart Award uh, presentation. Fred Stewart Award of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center honors a pathologist each year who has made outstanding contribution advancing our knowledge of human cancer. The award emphasizes the clinical significance of those contributions, particularly in diagnosis and patient care, it reflects the traditions and values brought to the Department of Pathology by Dr. Stewart, uh, 
who was an associate of Dr. James Ewing, and then the chairman of the department for a period extending over 30 years. Each year, the awardee is selected by the faculty of Department of Pathology. This year, we have the pleasure of uh, giving the award to Dr. Elias Campo. This is actually the 2020 award because of uh, the COVID pandemic, we were unable to present the award last uh, year. So it has been postponed to this year. Dr. Campo received his MD and PhD degrees from medical school at the University of Barcelona. After completing his residency in pathology, he conducted uh, a postdoctoral post fellowship in molecular pathology at the NCI uh, in the United States, I believe with Dr. Jaffe. He joined the laboratory of pathology at the hospital clinic where he progressed through the ranks to become the professor of pathology as well as chief of the hematopathology unit. He is currently the director of August Pai Sanyar Medical Research Institute, director of research at the hospital clinic of uh, Barcelona and clinic foundation for biomedical research and a professor of pathological anatomy at the University of Barcelona. Dr. Campo uh, has a, a, a numerous, numerous, numerous achievements. He's a member of the steering committee for classification of hematopoietic neoplasms, and he has been the, one of the editors of the WHO classification. He's the director of Spanish Chronic Lymphocyte Leukemia Genome Project in the framework of the International Cancer Genome Consortium. He has won newer, numerous uh, uh, awards, uh, both uh, nationally and internationally, including Awards from uh, Catalan Academy of Medical Sciences, Catalan government, uh, as well as uh, he, he's been elected a member of National Academy of Medicine of the United States in 2018. His research has focused on the genetic and molecular mechanisms involved in the pathogenesis of hematological neoplasms and their cl clinical implications. Uh, he, he, with the aim of uh, understanding the mechanisms involved in development and progression of these tumors, defining more precise diagnostic criteria, establishing predictive models of evolution and response to the treatment, and identifying molecular targets for development of new therapeutic strategies. He has been part of numerous multinational uh, studies, integrating investigators from different profiles from basic science to clinical science, he has published uh, the latest count uh, that I know of over 600 scientific papers, uh, holds numerous patents. His research has been funded by the Spanish Commission of Science and Technology, uh, European Union and National Cancer Institute and Lymphoma Research Foundation. With his achievements in the field of pathology, uh, I cannot imagine a more deserving hematopathologist for the Stewart Award. Uh, and we are delighted that he was available to receive this award and give his time to give us the lecture. We were, of course, unable to bring him to, uh, to New York uh, for the live event, but we are hoping to arrange a visit for him in the spring or later this year or in the spring, uh, as long as the COVID protocols uh, allow, uh, and uh, so that we have the opportunity to have a FaceTime with him. Uh, so now I'll proceed with the uh, award presentation after the introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, this will be a virtual presentation, but I want to show you the, uh, the medal. It has two sides. It's quite a sort of, I think it's bronze. I'm not quite sure what metal it's made. It has two sides. This is, the, this is one side uh, with the portrait of uh, uh, Dr. Stewart. Uh, you can see that on the right, there's the microscope that representing pathology. On the left is the cancer journal. Dr. Stewart was actually the first editor of cancer. And, and of course reflects that this is an award of the Memorial Hospital. And at the back uh, is the, uh, the, really the, the medal itself, if you like. Uh, on the left is the, uh, is the, uh, the, the, the cancer. On the right, Memorial Sloan Kettering, in the middle, the patients. And I hope you are able to read his name engraved onto the medal. So Elias, I'm going to hand this over to you. I don't know how we are going to do this virtually. And I'm hoping that you are going to receive it. So, whoop, that's now with you. I'll, I, if you would like to say a few words, and then we'll continue with the lecture.
Elias, you are muted, I think. Thank you, Dr. Dogan. Thank you, Ahmed, for your kind words. Uh, I am deeply thankful for uh, this uh, award to all the faculty of the Department of Pathology. This is definitely a major hallmark in my career uh, for all what this name represents, what your institution represents in the history and the current universe of pathology. And therefore, uh, this is uh, really moving uh, to receive this award. Thank you very much for your recognition. It's our pleasure. I think we can't imagine a more deserving candidate for, for this award. So would you, uh, I think we will now proceed with the lecture. So this is the uh, 43rd annual Fred Stewart Award Lecture. Uh, Dr. Campos' title is Lymphoid Neoplasms from Microscope to Epigenomes and Back. So I'll leave the floor for you, Elias, uh, to give your lecture. Uh, after the lecture, we, we don't take uh, questions that, uh, from, uh, from this lecture, but if there are questions, please leave it in the, uh, uh, in the chat and uh, we will ask Dr. Campo answer those in a written format, maybe uh, at a later point this afternoon. Thank okay. you, the floor is yours. So I will share my uh, uh, screen. Yes, we are, we are, yes, we are seeing it clearly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ahmed. And uh, as I mentioned, this is a great honor, but it's also an overwhelming uh, appreciation when you see the names of the awardees over this history. And I would like to particularly uh, present or comment on the two previous hematopathologists that have received this award, Professor Leonard and Dr. Elaine Jaffe. And particularly, this is a uh, of uh, particular relevance for me because uh, uh, I think both of them are linked uh, to the development of my career. Both uh, are giants of uh, hematopathology and pathology because uh, their studies uh, changed our view of what uh, pathology was, and I would say from a morphological perspective to a functional perspective of the tumors that we are dealing with. Professor Lenner, by extracting proteins of lymph nodes with uh, lymphoma, and, uh, what, uh, and tumors at that time were considered probably no lymphoid, like the reticulosarcoma, he showed that these uh, tumors uh, had immunoglobulins, linking them definitely to B cell lymphocytes. On the other side, uh, uh, Elaine Jaffe at the NIH, uh, using uh, also at that time novel immunological techniques, uh, uh, show that the, at that time called nodular uh, lymphomas were in fact derived from normal germinal centers uh, that share uh, certain uh, uh, markers and receptors. And with this setting the basis to define uh, lymphomas as a specific entities related to cell of origin. This perspective uh, uh, has oriented our lives and our career uh, in all the perspective in all aspects. And in this sense, I also would like to mention Professor Isaacson, also instrumental in my career, because he invited me to participate in the uh, European Hematopathology Association and Executive Committee. And was this mentality that led to recognize through morphology a new entity that the land could be associated to a uh, etiology and then later on to recognize a specific gene and a specific genetic uh, alteration related to this entity. So I think that uh, developing and the change our, our perspective of uh, lymphomas and hematopathology. On a more personal way, uh, in my early days as a student, I was fascinated by immunology, but also pathology, but also internal medicine. So I was hesitating to which direction take and I must say that the development of uh, immunotechnic, immunochemical techniques at the time that led me to the, definitely to the path of pathology, fascinated by the possibility to see molecules under the microscope. My mentor that knew my interest encouraged me to buy and read this book when I was a first year resident, the book of Pro Professor Leonard. I was fascinated by the images, by the concepts, 
And definitely that was uh, a major stimulus to follow uh, hematopathology and interest for lymphoma. Later on, I was able to meet him personally. I invite him to the first joint uh, workshop between both hematopathology societies that I organized in Barcelona. And you can see here him and his wife, uh, also with Professor Isaacson, Ellen, uh, Jaffe, Nancy Harris, and many other colleagues that will mark my career in the future. But if I already was printed uh, in print in my career to hematopathology, it was here at the NIH Building 10 in which uh, all my configuration was really activated. I was lucky uh, to meet uh, Dr. Jaffe there and that uh, started a relationship that has lingered up today. At that moment, uh, Dr. Jaffe and Dr. Raffel were considering the 1114 translocation and BCL1 rearrangement as the genetic landmark that could unify the different lymphomas that had received uh, different names, like centrocytic uh, lymphoma in Europe or intermediate differentiated lymphocytic lymphoma in the US as being the same lymphoma derived from mantle cells. At that time, there was a mystery what could be the gene related to this uh, rearrangement and translocation, contrary to the MIG and BCL2 that were found early on, still uh, years later after the recognition of the, this translocation, the gene was elusive. But at that time, a gene uh, postulated uh, as the candidate for this translocation was, uh, had been recognized by a couple of groups. And there I started a project that then uh, they were uh, their generosity allowed me to take this project to Barcelona. And that was my first project I developed when I came back. And here you can see that gene was called at that time Prat uh, because it was identified in parathyroid adenomas and then recognized as a cycling. And we could demonstrate the uh, expression of this gene was constant in mantle cell lymphoma and also in high cell leukemia, and a case that at that time we recognized in CLL and we have later on reclassified also as mantle cell lymphoma. As you see, all these cases were reviewed with LN, and that was the starting point of, uh, as I said, uh, lingering uh, scientific and personal uh, collaborations. That collaborations allowed me to propose Dr. Jaffe as a, for the Dr. Honoris Causa at the University of Barcelona and was accepted. As you see, that's my personal relationship with this uh, Dr. Lenner and Dr. Jaffe. And I think uh, uh, also this first study uh, uh, was paradigmatic of uh, what I think pathology, uh, the relationship between morphology, genetics, and molecular is providing us as a pathologist. You saw the history come from morphology, connection with cytogenetics, and later on the recognition of a marker that was useful to use in the, in the clinical practice. And with this, we learn more about the molecular biology of this tumor. Going back to the clinical aspects and morphology, we recognize uh, sub molecular subtypes with a different molecular pathogenesis and clinical impact. A still mantle cell lymphoma is one of the worst uh, lymphomas uh, among all uh, B cell lymphomas, as you can see here. But fortunately, we are still uh, we are already seeing an improvement along the last decades, thanks to new therapies and more precise diagnosis. After our initial, uh, uh, one of the aspects uh, difficulties of mantle cell lymphoma is recognized the tremendous. Uh, morphological uh, heterogeneity that represent different biological um, situations that now we recognize in the practice with the fish and uh, cycling the one expression. After our initial studies, we uh, develop others that allow us to propose that the mantle cell lymphoma was generated by translocations of cycling D1, but other cyclings of the G1 phase. And uh, later on, the acquisition of uh, alterations in uh, ATM, check 2 uh, facilitated the increased genomic instability of these tumors. And then uh, other alterations uh, were um, uh, generating uh, alterations in the high um, um, uh, proliferation and also activation of survival pathways. However, uh, 
as soon as we uh, wrote this book, uh, this article review, we started to see patients that didn't fulfill well this model because there were clinical observations indicating that some of the patients didn't follow the aggressive behavior that was thought uh, a constant in all mantle cell lymphoma cases. And uh, uh, several clinical studies uh, observed that there were cases in which uh, the patients didn't need uh, therapy uh, at the moment of diagnosis. And these patients were really doing uh, well uh, compared to conventional mantle cell lymphomas. And being a pathologist, that observation uh, uh, led to ask us uh, ourselves if this was just uh, that the tumors were touched in a very early phase of the disease, or they were different biological subtypes of this tumor. And to answer these questions, together with my early collaborators, Dr. Pedro Harris and Silvia Vea, we were able to collect some cases that we could uh, say they were in the end of the spectrum. Some cases uh, that were uh, carried 11 14 translocation, but were with no treatment for more than two years, whereas other cases uh, need uh, treatment immediately. And with that, we did a gene expression profiling study and some genetic studies in which uh, we identified a small signature of genes that were downregulated or not expressed in the cases that had an involvement behavior and uh, were highly expressed in most, not all, cases with uh, required treatment. And among all these genes, we concentrated in uh, one unknown uh, genes in uh, uh, lymphoid hematological uh, cells, sub 11 was a transcription factor known in the neural field because uh, the simple reason we had an antibody, we found an antibody that allowed us to study more in the, in, 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 within our routine uh, uh, slides, histological slides. And with that, we expanded our study and confirmed that the sub negative cases had more indolent behavior. But uh, uh, that was only the start point. Uh, we and many others now have identified that these uh, cases that we call leukemic non-nodal at that time because of the clinical presentation uh, that these patients that might develop is phenomenally. They have a presentation good performance status, but also from a pathological point of view, they have peculiarities. They are enriched in the small cell variant. Frequently, uh, they are CD5 negative compared to with conventional. A small group of cases that are interesting and intriguing plasmacytic differentiation with expression of uh, immunoglobulin genes uh, restricted, and they are positive for 23 and 200, similar to uh, CLL, but contrary to conventional mantle cell lymphoma. From a genetic point of view, these cases carry a very low number of genetic alterations. And uh, we did at that time some studies suggesting that they could derive from memory-like uh, cells instead of the naive-like that uh, were the, uh, supposed to derive the conventional cases. And concordant with that, these cases have a high number of uh, immunoglobulin somatic herpes mutations compared to the unmutated immunoglobulins of the SOX positive tumors. The following question was, what is doing SOX in mantle cell lymphoma? And we uh, in, uh, started these studies uh, with uh, Dr. Virginia Amador that uh, led the functional studies on this in our program. She, at that time, silenced uh, SOX11 in different cell lines. She not transplanted in mice. And interestingly, the downregulation of SOX11 in these cell lines were associated with a very low tumor growth compared with the cell lines that carry SOX11, observing for the first time that uh, SOX11 could be an oncogenic driver in mantle cell lymphoma. Then, what is the transcriptional program uh, uh, driven by uh, SOX11. Another time, uh, we perform a, a, a chip uh, study in which uh, we saw that SOX11 was binding uh, to the promoter regions of uh, genes related to B cell differentiation, particularly in PAX5, in which we saw that uh, SOX11 was forcing the expression of PAX5, was then regulated when we silenced SOX11, and also. Um, uh, uh, and, and was the silencing was promoting uh, the advance in the B cell differentiation to a more terminal differentiation state with some other transcription factors. Also, block uh, BCL6, 
uh, that uh, probably this is a mechanism which these cells might not enter or grow in the germinal center. Also, sub 11 seems to be uh, regulating different uh, factors that uh, facilitate the interaction of uh, tumor cells with the microenvironment by promoting uh, angiogenesis, facilitating with CXCR4, in fact, kinase uh, invasion and dissemination. And more recently, Kua colleagues have uh, showed that SOX11 may be promoting the B cell receptor signaling in these tumors. More recently, we have shown that uh, SOX11 positive and negative may also have different microenvironments that uh, promote the tumor growth. SOX11 positive are frequently highly expressing CD70. They have a significant higher number of uh, T regulatory genes and lower levels of cytotoxic uh, uh, cells. But now, uh, what is the reason for SOX11 being expressed in mantle cell lymphoma and not in other uh, lymphoid cell, mature lymphoid cells, and virtually not in mature visceral lymphomas other than Burkitt in around 30% of the cases. We didn't find genetic aberrations, translocations or mutations. And uh, therefore we, we switched to the epigenetic uh, um, alterations and that uh, we could start these uh, projects in epigenetic uh, alterations of lymphomas when uh, Iñaki Martin Suvero uh, joined our uh, program uh, in, in our institution. And one of the first studies was to ask uh, was, was the reason for sub 11 expression. One of the first findings was that the, uh, we, and, uh, we identified a region very far away of the, where the, the SOX11 was. This uh, region had uh, eastern marks corresponding to an enhancer, an active enhancer with uh, eastern 3 k 27 acetylated in the SOX uh, positive cases, but not in the SOX11 negative cases. This region uh, was also hypomethylated in the SOX positive, but uh, methylated in the SOX uh, 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 negative cases. And by doing three-dimensional uh, studies of the configuration of the chromatin, as you can see here, we, in the SOX positive cases, we could uh, see uh, the linkage uh, of uh, this enhancer to the promoter region of the SOX11. With this, we postulated that uh, SOX11 could be uh, activated by the relation, three-dimensional uh, relationship with this enhancer that was uh, away from, from the promoter. And we mo have more recently confirmed this visually. We like, uh, we as pathologists, uh, we like to see things under the microscope. We designed the fish probes for this enhancer and promoter region. And we saw that these uh, signals were significantly distant uh, in the nucleus, uh, um, uh, separated in the SOX negative cases, but they were uh, always uh, joined in the SOX positive tumors, confirming this idea that we have been seeing by uh, doing uh, uh, sequencing analysis of the three dimensional configuration of the chromatin. On a clinical point of view, we were interested to, to see how we could distinguish these tumors in the clinical practice. SOX11 by immunohistochemistry certainly is helpful, but we were a little uh, concerned that in some cases, the levels of SOX11 were not uh, kind of intermediate. And uh, so we wanted to see if in addition to SOX11 were, uh, were other genes that were differentially expressed in these two tumors. And by doing that, uh, we purified uh, tumor cells from uh, leukemic uh, mantle cell lymphomas and did uh, a survey with a, a, a gene expression profiling and identified a number of genes that were differentially up and down regulated in these two tumors, selected a number of them, uh, developed an assay uh, that could uh, help us and validate it and distinguish these two tumors in a, in a, in the samples. As you can see here, SOX11 is clearly differentially expressed, but there are cases in which uh, by itself uh, might have overlapping features with some conventional, but when we take into consideration the whole signature, you see that uh, we can distinguish uh, these two tumors, these two subtypes of mantle cell lymphoma. And that had a clinical impact. Uh, since the cases in yellow that had this signature 
of non-nodal mantle cell lymphoma uh, require treatment uh, much later than the cases in blue that had a signature of conventional mantle cell lymphoma. And when we look at the uh, outcome, uh, the cases with a non-nodal signature had a significant superior uh, um, uh, survival than the cases with uh, a conventional signature. However, uh, these tumors are not pure SOX11 positive or this signature positive or negative. When we study more uh, globally uh, these tumors, we saw uh, that uh, some genomic complexity was also present in some cases with a non-novel uh, signature. And these cases here you see that have a, 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 an adverse prognosis similar to the conventional cases that also acquire uh, this genomic complexity. The same occurred with P53 mutations that were also present in conventional and non-nodal cases. As you can see here, uh, conventional and non-nodal uh, with P53 mutations had a similar adverse outcome. The major difference is that the number of cases with non-nodal signature that have P53 alterations is uh, much lower. But once they acquire these alterations, the, the outcome uh, uh, worsens. With these uh, results, uh, we propose a model of uh, development of mantle cell lymphoma that is uh, started by the first oncogenic events, uh, uh, the activating uh, cycling D1, D2, or D3 by translocations with the immunoglobulin genes. In some cases, still uh, with an unclear reason, uh, SOX11 is activated and expressed and this leads to the expression of a transcriptional program that will provide the tumor cells with uh, a phenotype uh, that uh, will be uh, more aggressive, uh, facilitating the uh, interactions with the microenvironment, but also uh, interfering with the normal dis differentiation of the B cells. On the contrary, other cases carrying the 11-14 translocation the cells will be uh, allow, if you want, to enter the germinal center, acquire somatic mutations, and then these cells will, uh, will remain in the bone marrow and circulating, uh, taking longer uh, to infiltrate the tissues. And when they do, they uh, particularly infiltrate the, the spleen. However, if these tumors acquire uh, subsequently, genomic alterations, particularly P53, and in the case of uh, conventional the deletions of P16, this might transform morphologically and biologically to more aggressive behavior. Uh, I think one decade ago, we, were, we lived uh, through a very exciting and um, uh, inspiring moment uh, that open uh, new windows for a landscape uh, of these tumors with an unprecedented, uh, uh, given us unprecedented information. And this was the era in which the next generation sequencing technologies were introduced. And uh, we were uh, lucky to obtain this uh, major grant from the Spanish government to participate in the International Cancer uh, Genome Project by proposing to study the genome of uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And with this, we ensemble a, a, a very uh, stimulating and, and, and uh, a passionate uh, consortium here in Spain of many uh, basic and clinicians and uh, pathologists to address uh, this project on the genome uh, of the CLL. The technologies and knowledge that we acquired in this project were uh, subsequently applied to other lymphomas, uh, particularly mantle cell lymphoma, and also opened uh, the doors to participate in this other major project of the human epigenome project. Uh, and particularly, uh, we participate uh, in the epigenome of uh, hematological uh, cell, normal hematological cells and hematological uh, tumors by proposing the study of uh, CLL and mantle cell from an epigenetic point of view. And one of the, uh, obviously the, the tumors in addition to the CLL that we'll address later, uh, we uh, were interested obviously in the study of the genome of uh, mantle cell lymphoma that we have done over these last years. 
And certainly we have identified uh, a large number of mutations that concentrate mainly in the conventional type of mantle cell lymphoma with very few mutated genes in the non-novel uh, uh, tumors. Interestingly, some of the mutations, particularly I would have like ATM, are exclusively seen in the conventional type of uh, mantle cell lymphoma. Also, the lesions of 9P uh, targeting uh, P16 are almost, uh, quasi, almost exclusively seen in the conventional cases. Other mutations are also represented in the conventional at lower frequency, but I would like to highlight the mutations in the cyclin D1 that are due to somatic hypermutations because they occur in the five prime region of the gene mainly. And also P53 and TERT alterations are impressive in both, but slightly enriched in the non-nodal mantle cell lymphoma uh, subtype. But now with this uh, information of the whole genomes, we were uh, interested in asking a question. Both types of mantle cell lymphoma carry the 1114 translocation, but is it acquired at the same moment? Is, it the, is this translocation acquired in both subtypes in the bone marrow or in the cases of non-novel type that are derived from memory-like uh, cells, the translocation is acquired in the germinal center? And uh, in the whole genome, uh, we could um, resolve and single nucleotide uh, resolution the breakpoints of these translocations. In the cycling D1, in all the cases, uh, as was known, the, the breakpoint was uh, upstream of the five prime region. And in the uh, immunoglobulin genes, uh, the, the breakpoints were uh, occurring uh, in regions indicating that they had to occur in the VDJ rearrangement. The, these sites uh, contain drug sites, and also there were N nucleotides that were included, indicating that uh, these uh, translocations were acquired in a precursor B cell in the bone marrow. And interestingly, as you can see here, uh, these signals of being acquired in a precursor B cell were uh, seen and detected both in the conventional in blue and in the non-nodal in yellow at different breakpoints, but all indicating that in both uh, types of tumors, uh, the translocation had been acquired at the same moment. But intriguingly, we found five cases in which uh, the translocation didn't have signals of RAC-mediated uh, uh, translocation. Interestingly, these five cases, uh, the breakpoint uh, in the immunoglobulin gene was occurring in the region of the class switch uh, region or in regions uh, of the gene with highly uh, mutated uh, due to the action of the uh, IAD. And these uh, class switch or hypermutated related uh, were both of non-novel or conventional uh, um, signatures. Uh, what is uh, to me uh, still intriguing and, uh, and uh, not very clear uh, how translocations that are acquired at different moments uh, could be uh, given uh, rise uh, to the same type of tumor. Although now we know that the class switch recombination in B cells occur physiologically before the cell enters into the germinal center and acquired an increasing number of somatic hypermutations. And therefore, probably this is what might happen in these cases. And then the perspective of uh, the epigenome that I already introduced before. We can study different layers of epigenetic alterations in the genome. We can study methylation. We can study, as I introduced, different stone modifications that are very interesting because they will give us some clues on the functional status of uh, the uh, particular genomic regions. Like uh, we can identify promoters, enhancer, transcribed regions. And if these promoters or enhancer, uh, if they have the Eastern 3 uh, 27 acetylated, will indicate that uh, they are active in these particular cells that we are studying. And also we can enter in the world 
on how the chromosomes, the chromatin, the genome is uh, three-dimensional uh, organized. And as you have seen here before with the example of SOX11, this is giving information on uh, uh, regulation uh, that I think uh, uh, will give us uh, important information to better understand the development of these tumors. Concentrating in the in the methylation in the methylation status of uh, of uh, the tumor cells, um, uh, we studied uh, some years ago uh, the the global methylation status of mantle cell uh, uh, lymphomas, comparing uh, to the methylation status of B cells in all stages of uh, differentiation from precursors and immature cells, naive. Uh, germinal center, memory, and plasma cells. And then uh, when we compare the methylation uh, 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 profile of mantle cell lymphoma, and you can see here in this agnostic analysis, we saw that the methylation status of the tumor cells uh, uh, separated uh, mantle cell into major subgroups. One in blue, uh, uh, with a methylation profile that was very close to the B cell, uh, normal B cell differentiation, but more specifically, the methylation profile of these cases was uh, including a signature of methylation that was similar detected in memory uh, B cells. On the contrary, this was this uh, large group of uh, cases in which uh, the methylation was more distant from the B cells normal differentiation, and on the contrary, the, the methylation profile included a signature that was detected in naive cells, indicating or suggesting that this tumor was derived from these naive-like cells. I wonder that these two uh, methylation uh, subtypes of mantle cell lymphoma corresponded with the non-novel and the conventional mantle cell lymphoma cases that we had previously identified by other uh, methods, as I explained before. And this methylation signature uh, had impact in the outcome of the, of the tumors. As you see then, uh, the methylation signature of the tumor is uh, keeping a memory of uh, the cells where these uh, tumors arrive. And that's what we are thinking now, uh, that the methylation changes in the genome of lymphoid cells uh, are keeping a kind of memory of uh, what the cell comes from. And it's the same that we found also with CLL, uh, that also we could distinguish this uh, different origin based on, on the methylation profile. But more recently, uh, we have expanded the methylation studies since in mantle cells, CLL, and other lymphoid neoplasias. And we have confirmed this idea that the methylation that we see in the tumors is, uh, uh, is um, uh, a representation of a memory of, the, is giving a, an idea on, uh, of the memory of the cell. And a memory, uh, this is a second uh, uh, change that is very important. Um, most of the changes that we see in methylation occur in regions that are not active in terms of uh, gene expression, they are uh, occurring in heterochromatin. And these, uh, these major changes uh, seems that are errors uh, in reproducing the methylation profile of the cells and are errors that are occurring in each uh, division of the cell as we can represent here. So when you, we measure uh, these uh, global changes, both hypo and hypermethylation in the tumor cells, these changes are giving us uh, an idea of the proliferation history of a sample, how many times the cells have undergone a division. And therefore, we can measure uh, is a kind of clock of uh, the accumulation of mitosis of this cell. It's not uh, an idea uh, of uh, the present methylation, the present proliferation of a tumor of a given cell. It's just a history of how these cells have um, proliferated. For instance, plasma cell uh, have a higher uh, uh, epigmit uh, score 
that gens just uh, uh, germinal center B cells. It's not because the plasma cells are proliferating, it's just the, the history of the cell is longer in terms of divisions. Well, what I think is relevant for the tumors is that uh, the score of this epigenetic mitotic clock is also able to predict uh, the, the outcome of these uh, tumors because both in conventional and non-nodal, uh, the high and low uh, epic mid score is associated or is giving an idea of the adverse outcome of the patients. And this uh, that is uh, relevant I am showing here for mantle cell, we have confirmed the same for uh, the different molecular subtypes of CLL and also for other lymphoid tumors, including acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So methylation gives us memory of the cell, both in terms of cell of origin, but also of the proliferation history that allow us uh, to have a view of how this tumor might evolve. And now we are entering in the more functional analysis of these epigenetic uh, studies. Uh, by studying uh, the uh, different histone marks, we are mapping now the, uh, uh, the regulatory regions and the functional uh, regions of the genome. And we have uh, uh, now studied some uh, conventional in orange, uh, uh, non-nodal cases uh, compared with different B cells, uh, normal B cells in different, in different uh, colors, uh, memory naive and general center, mainly in plasma cells. You can see here that uh, in red, uh, we are marking the promote, active promoters and enhancers, in, and you see that the profile of these uh, regulatory regions is different in conventional and uh, non-novel cases. And also we can distinguish uh, specific regions that differentiate from the activating status in normal B cells. And by assigning these regions, combined with uh, the expression profiling, we are starting to identify the genes that are specifically activated in conventional and not non-nodal and are different from uh, the, the, the normal B cells. And as a proof of concept, the top gene regulated in a conventional mantle cell lymphoma, as you can see here, corresponds to such web. Those are ongoing projects that we hope will give us uh, additional clues on the biology of these fascinating tumors. But as I mentioned, our first study that introduced us to these uh, technologies was the study of the genome of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And is, uh, uh, this year, 2021, is the 10th anniversary of uh, our first publications in the first whole genome sequence of four cases of CLL uh, in nature 10 years ago. In these years, we have read uh, many things. This is what we call the theater of the mutations uh, of genomic alterations in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Each uh, row represents uh, uh, a driver uh, mutation, each line represents a patient. And you see that all the genetic alterations seem to concentrate in some patients. And also uh, uh, what was to us uh, shocking was that uh, when we compare our results with the, the study that was simultaneously published by the Dana Farber colleagues, we saw uh, um, that, that study a similar number of cases. Intriguingly, uh, we found a, nimer, a similar number of uh, mutations, but we only had one third that were the same between the two studies. On the other hand, in our study, we identified around 50% of the patients in which in spite of having uh, sequenced the whole genome, we were unable to identify uh, an alteration that, that we call as a drive. So different, uh, many uh, new information, but also new questions opening from these uh, studies. Uh, one is the tremendous heterogeneity of mutations in CLL. Very few mutations uh, were, uh, were present in a high number of patients. And uh, one of the first idea is that the distribution of these mutations between, between uh, CLL with mutated and unmutated genes were differentially represented, a finding similar to the one that I explained for mantle cell lymphoma, indicating that, that these molecular subtypes have different profiles of mutations. 
In these years, we have learned that we have to look beyond the coding regions of the genome. And one of the mutations that we missed in, the, in the, our whole genome studies have been recently identified uh, by uh, other groups, uh, by Paulo Guia and others, in which there was a mutation in the uh, lambda chains of the uh, immunoglobulin, particularly in the lambda chains with the rearrangement of the 321. And a particular mutation in the arginine 110 configurates the immunoglobulin with the capacity to bind to themselves and start signaling uh, without the need of any other um, uh, triggering, uh, antigen triggering. And this constant uh, autonomous uh, signaling of the visceral receptor is associated with uh, poor prognosis. The clinical importance of that is that half of the cases with this mutation, carry mutations, correspond to the mutated immunoglobulins, and half of the cases correspond to unmutated immunoglobulins according to the standard criteria. However, both mutated and unmutated CLL carrying this mutation had an adverse outcome. Another mutation that is not in the coding region, well, this is in the coding region, but was not captured because we, uh, we, we uh, confirmed this finding by developing a new uh, bioinformatic pipeline with my postdoc, uh, Ferran Nadeu here, that allow us now to explore this region of the immunoglobulins in, in next generation sequence uh, data. Another mutation was in non coding region, and that the study was in collaboration with Lincoln Stein in Canada. Uh, they developed a, a pipeline uh, to analyze uh, the repetitive regions of the genome, a region that had not been uh, fully explored before. And with this pipeline, they discovered a new mutation in the U1 small nuclear RNA in our CLL cases. This small RNA is a, a scaffold uh, to um, other proteins that participate in the splashing machinery um, in, 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 in many different, in, in the genes. So it's, an, uh, it's a factor of the splashing machinery. When we studied uh, mantle cell lymphoma, uh, sorry, CLL with this mutation, we confirmed that this mutation in red uh, confer an adverse prognosis uh, to these cases similar to other, other mutations. And we have expanded now these studies, and we have found that these uh, U mutations in other B cell lymphomas, almost a quarter of Burkitt lymphoma, 50% in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, in rich in germinal center, and anecdotally in mantle cell lymphoma, indicating now and expanding the view of uh, the splicing machinery alterations in other lymphomas. And you see how discovering something in CLL can also translate to other lymphoid neoplasias. And now in, in this slide, uh, we were intrigued with why we had this uh, difference between the Dana Farber and our group. And when in the last couple of years, we jo joined forces, combine our uh, old cases, uh, the, uh, more than 1,000 uh, genomes and whole exomes, and have reanalyzed all these cases under the same pipelines, the same criteria. And I think that has uh, provided us and to see how by reanalyzing already the data that we have generated, we have been able to discover new perspectives. On one hand, we have been uh, confirmed these two recent mutations that I told you, the, three, uh, the R110 in the lambda V321 in 10% of the CLL cases, not trivial, and the UN mutation in 4% uh, of the cases. But also with new pipelines and analysis, we have been able to identify 37 mutated genes that we might consider by different criteria as novel drivers. The situation is that most of these novel drivers are present in a very few number of patients, one to 2% of the cases, and uh, might uh, help us to better understand the tremendous heterogeneity of these tumors. And I think uh, uh, we are entering now in a new uh, era, in a new perspective by using new technologies. And I like these pictures from the uh, French Impressionist. And this is dedicated to Dr. Gilles Salles. And uh, this is the single cell genomic analysis. Uh, now we can uh, separate and, anal and analyze, as you have seen in the nice presentation by Dr. Ross Hall, 
that we can analyze uh, thousands of genes, uh, uh, sorry, thousands of single uh, cells at different levels, transcriptome, uh, uh, chromatin accessibility, and uh, combine different techniques. And with this, we're able to identify the many different uh, subtypes of cells, different stages, different information. We are starting to apply these techniques in combination with the bulk analysis of the genomes. And we are seeing fascinating results that I want to share with you here. We have a study now, a number of cases with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and we have been able to uh, sequence different time points, as you can see here, of, through long periods of time uh, in, in the clinical history of the patients in which they have relapsed, received different treatments, and eventually they have developed here uh, a Richter syndrome transformation to diffuse larvae cell lymphoma. We have uh, sequenced the whole genome at all these time points and uh, identified different mutations, different alterations, but I want to concentrate now, but uh, using different statistical analysis, you see uh, uh, groups or cluster of mutations that travel together always. And by identifying statistically these different cluster of mutations, you could track different clones and you could identify these different clones and infer its presence at different time points of the evolution. What was really intriguing in this analysis is that the clone that was expanding in the Richter transformation by this statistical analysis was inferred to be already present, uh, could be present at diagnosis many, many years before. And the same occurred with different clones that were expanding at different times of the evolution of the disease after different treatments. And those are some mutations that uh, were identified in this cluster that identified the different subtypes. And one of them keep track is different mutations of P53. These results were intriguing enough that we wanted to confirm them by different techniques. And that's what we use single cell DNA uh, sequencing by uh, targeting the different mutations, including these uh, P53 mutations. You can see here in single cell, uh, this is the number of cells that we sequence, uh, was present uh, these P53, P53 mutations in virtually all cells at the Richter moment. But also these P53 mutations at this moment was also detected in a small proportions at different time points, including in around 0.1% of the cells at the moment of diagnosis. And now we have also confirmed these results by studying the transcriptome. In single cell, we can identify here the, the profile that identifies and characterizes the Richter cells with different uh, clusters uh, within the, 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 the group. And here is the CLL at the moment of, uh, of the Richter transformation. But if you follow the pink colors here, you see that these cells with the same transcriptome were identified at different time points before uh, of the transformation, but still we were diagnosing the case of CLL and here time point three. And here is another case in which we follow the same uh, uh, strategy. Uh, we identified the Richter, uh, the mutations identified by in the Richter, and we could track back uh, these subclones also uh, being able to identify them at, uh, at the moment of diagnosis. And again, by single cell sequencing DNA and also transcriptome, we can see here also here at the moment of diagnosis uh, of the Richter transformation, we identify the cluster of cells uh, with the transcriptome of CLL of the Richter. And if you track back, you could see these cells also in very early moments and even a very low percentage at the moment of diagnosis almost 19 years before the Richter transformation. So uh, uh, we are seeing uh, that uh, CLL might uh, diversify dramatically already at the moment of diagnosis with multiple clones that then are following these different evolutions, probably related with the tra treatments and those clones uh, are already there and are the future, uh, dictating the future evolution of, uh, of the tumor. And with this, I think uh, I am trying to show uh, one lesson that I learned from 
also a person important in my career, Dr. David Mason in Oxford, an hematologist that we always uh, were uh, discussing with him, I was saying you, you transform into a pathologist uh, by looking at the, the slides. He always saying uh, and was very interested in developing new technologies applied to these neoplasias, because uh, as he used to say, this technology is a new light that opens new windows uh, to the knowledge of these um, neoplasias. And with this, I would like to finish by thanking all my enthusiastic group in Barcelona and uh, that uh, with all of them, all this information would have been uh, not possible to obtain. Thank you very much for uh, your attention and interest. Elias, thank you this, for this outstanding, outstanding lecture. Uh, of course, so many, so many, so much interest in this and so many questions. Uh, but we will uh, postpone those for your visit when we have you here uh, face to face to be able to uh, address these questions. So we will not take any questions at the moment. Uh, thank you for giving your time and energy for this. And we really appreciate you joining us today and hope to see you in New York soon. Uh, okay, for the, so for the participants, this will be the end of the morning session. We are gonna meet at two o'clock for the case presentation. Um, thank you once again, Elias. Thank you, looking forward. Bye bye. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome um, to the uh, 43rd Annual Alumni Society Slide Seminar. Uh, this is a very special event for us. Uh, not only we all come together as a group to uh, hear each other on our wonderful cases, we also meet all our fellows and alumni um, and, and exchange, you know, uh, how they're doing. And uh, it was always a wonderful time to see everyone. And unfortunately, we're not able to do it yet. Uh, certainly next year, uh, we really hope it will be in person and also we'll have a wonderful dinner um, after the meeting next year. So um, before I start, I wanna say a few words about um, Dr. Fred Stewart, a little story about him. So as Dr. Dogan mentioned, Dr. Stewart uh, was a director of pathology from 1939 to 1959 at Memorial Hospital. And uh, uh, in 2008, Dr. Haidu wrote a nice commentary about Dr. Stewart in cancer. And the, the story goes that in the 1940s, um, it was taught that pathologists, if pathologists called a benign diagnosis, uh, the surgeon, if the surgeon thought that was not benign, uh, the surgeon has to communicate that with the pathologist. And if they did not agree, or if uh, this, this, this discrepancy was not solved, the surgeon actually went and went ahead and did whatever procedure based upon the clinical uh, findings. So, and that um, kind of uh, practice of medicine really changed in 1948 where it was the beginning of the end of treating patients without a biopsy proven malignant diagnosis. Um, that was doing Dr. Stewart's time. And uh, so at that time, they realized, uh, uh, the American Cancer Society uh, realized we really need a peer reviewed journal for cancer and established the journal Cancer. And uh, when uh, they were looking uh, for an editor and they, they, everybody felt that it's Dr. Stewart who should be the first editor of cancer, uh, uh, partly because Memorial was the sole hospital at that time with only cancer, treating only cancer patients. And uh, also he, Dr. Stewart was a superb communicator and, uh, and, and he, uh, he had great writing skills. So he really was the first editor of cancer and I just thought it'll be nice to, um, bring some past. Um, so with that, um, we will um, start our alumni case presentations. We have eight great uh, speakers and uh, um, great cases. Uh, I, let me first introduce uh, Dr. Frigia Preya. Uh, she is a graduate from, um, uh, did her residency at Columbia. 
uh, Presbyterian and came to us, did the breast fellowship and uh, search path fellowship, uh, and uh, then stayed on uh, with instructor followed by assistant attending right now. She's uh, a truly a physician scientist. She, her goal is to be uh, a scientist and a pathologist uh, uh, in the laboratory work. Uh, she's a recipient of the K1 Paul Calabrese Career Development Award from the NIH. And her interests uh, include um, a variety of breast cancers, triple negative breast cancer, uh, breast cancers with rare histology. Um, and also very interestingly, she's studying also mosaicism in cancer patients. Uh, with that, I will let Lucia take the stage. Go ahead, Lucia. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Let me share my screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to congratulate Dr. Elias Campo for the SWORT Award and thank the organizers of this meeting for the opportunity of presenting a case and sharing our work. Today, I will be telling the story, not about two cities, but about two rare breast tumor types. And I would like to start this talk by quoting Charles Dickens, who said, it was the breast of times, it was the worst of times. This case is about a 67 year old woman who presented with a self palpated breast mass. On mammogram, this was a 2.2 centimeter speculated mass, which was biopsied and of biopsy we observed an invasive neoplasm that was uh, morphologically heterogeneous. There were areas of this tumor that displayed a solid growth pattern and this hyalinized and focally mixoid stroma. Regionally, this tumor showed geographic architecture and we could also see areas that had this nested growth pattern. This tumor was composed of these um, basaloid cells with high grade nuclei very atypical cells. Importantly, not shown here, we observed the focal um, existence of DCIS, which was con uh, confirmed by immunohistochemistry. Notably, uh, amid the basaloid nests of uh, tumor cells that we observed, there was this interesting finding, this uh, pseudolumina that contained basement membrane-like material, which made us uh, which was reminiscent of the morphology presented by classic form of adenocystic carcinoma. We worked this case up, and this was a triple negative breast neoplasm. In contrast to what one would expect in the classic form of adenocystic carcinoma, this tumor lacked expression for my epithelial markers, such as P63, and was diffusely positive for cytokeratin 7 suggesting that this tumor was composed mainly of epithelial cells. Also, we observed diffuse and membranous expression for CKIT and diffuse and strong expression for MIB. Taken together based on the phenotype and immunoprofile of this tumor, we rendered the diagnosis of a solid and basal variant of breast adenocystic carcinoma. At the time of diagnosis, Work have revealed that this patient had multiple lung nodules. One of these nodules was biopsied and showed again this high grade tumor that had areas with solid growth and some regions with nested, nested growth pattern. And again, we could identify this pseudolumina with basement membrane like material, indicating that this patient presented with a de novo metastatic solid and basaloid adenocystic carcinoma of the breast. But what, what are these tumors? These are vanishingly rare triple negative breast cancers. They are morphologically characterized by these geographic or rounded islands of basaloid tumor cells. Oftentimes, these tumors display hyalinized or even mixoid stroma. And these are high grade tumors with composed of cells with marked nuclear atypia. Historically, these tumors have been considered a variant of the classic form of adenocystic carcinoma. However, these solid basaloid ADCC are not so similar to the classic forms of adenocystic carcinoma. So classic ADCCs are epithelial myepithelial neoplasms 
with a dual cell population. They are histologically indistinguishable from adenocystic carcinomas arising in any other anatomic locations. And in contrast to those tumors arising in other organs, breast classic adenocystic carcinomas have an indolent behavior. These tumors are characterized by a patognomonic genetic alteration, which is the MIP and FIP fusion gene. In a study that we conducted in the past led by Britta Weigelt, we observed that those classic adenocystic carcinomas that lack fusions, uh, MIP and FIP fusion genes were driven by genetic alterations affecting this paralog of MIP, which is MIBEL1, including MIBEL1 and FIP fusion genes or rearrangements of MIBEL1 with other genes. Also, we observed that a subset of cases harbored um, MIP gene amplification. Taken together, this shows that classic adenocystic carcinomas of the breast likely represent a convergent phenotype that are characterized by increased signaling via MIP through different mechanisms. But how about solid and base alloyed adenocystic carcinomas of the breast? Due to their rarity, these tumors have not been fully characterized and their um, genetic makeup is not yet known. Through collaborative efforts of the breast pathology team in the Rice Field Laboratory, in this study that was led by Christopher Schwartz and Hannah Wen, we conducted this study where we compared solid and basal adenocystic carcinomas and classic adenocystic carcinomas of the breast. We observed that even though most tumors in both groups were positive for MIP by immunohistochemistry, the frequency in rearrangements involving MIP or MIBEL1 was quite different. We observed that most classic adenocystic carcinomas harbored MIP and FIB fusion genes. There was one of these cases that had a rearrangement involving MIBEL1. In contrast, the majority of solid and base cellular adenocystic carcinomas of the breast lacked rearrangements in MIP or MIBEL1. There was only one case that, that where we could detect the MIP and FIB fusion, and there were two cases in which we observed a rearrangement suggesting a fusion involving MIP, MIP in a yet to be identified partner. Showing altogether that solid and base cellular adenocystic carcinomas of the breast have a significantly lower frequency of rearrangements affecting MIP or MIBEL1 than classic uh, form of the classic type adenocystic carcinomas. And supporting the notion that solid and base alloyed ADCCs of the breast are genetically different than the classic form of these tumors. Back to our case. Um, our case, despite um, expressing a strong and diffuse immunoreactivity for MIP, lacked rearrangements involving MIP or MIBEL1, as shown uh, by FISH, which is actually what we observed in most of the solid and basal adenocystic carcinomas of the series that we studied, as I just told you, suggesting that the increased expression of MIP in this case and in, all, in the cases included in our study might be dependent of different um, molecular mechanisms, not uh, through rearrangements involving these genes. We and others sought to determine the repertoire of genetic alterations defining solid and base cellular adenocystic carcinomas of the breast. In this study, now I'm going to share with you the results of this study led by this uh, French group, where they subjected classic and solid and base cellular adenocystic carcinomas of the breast to next, gener next generation sequencing. On the left, we have the classic tumors. On the right, we have the solid and base cellular adenocystic carcinomas. Cases are shown in columns and genes in rows and the mutations are color coded according to the legend at the bottom. And they observed, as did we, that solid and base cellular adenocystic carcinomas displayed a low frequency of, T of mutations in TP53. That as we know, is the gene that is most frequently mutated in the common forms of triple negative breast cancer. They also observed that compared to classic adenocystic carcinomas, solid and base cellular tumors displayed an enrichment in genetic alterations affecting notch genes and also chromatin remodelers, which we found quite fascinating because in our study, in an effort to uncover new fusion genes, 
we subjected those solid and basal adenocystic carcinomas that lacked MIP or MIP-1 rearrangement to RNA sequencing. And observed in one of these cases, a fusion involving KMT2C and we e 2 whereby the first five exons of KMT2C were fused to exons three to 12 of we e 2 resulting in this chimeric transcript that was predicted to result in a promoter swapping event between these two genes and disruption of KMT2C after uh, exon five. Altogether, these findings indicate that solid and base alloyed uh, adenocytic carcinomas of the breast are genetically different than common forms of triple negative breast cancer, and that um, chromatin, alter, genetic alterations in chromatin remodeling genes might play an important role in the pathogenesis of this entity. In another study conducted in this institution, in which several members of this department participated, the, the repertoire of genetic alterations of primary adenocystic carcinomas of any organ was compared to that of recurrent and metastatic tumors. And these authors observed that compared to primary adenocystic carcinomas of different anatomic locations, recurrent and metastatic tumors harbored an enriched frequency uh, a higher frequency of genetic alterations in notch genes and in chromatin remodeling genes. And they also reported that within the group of recurrent or metastatic adenocystic carcinoma, the presence of notch mutations or mutations in the chromatin remodeler KMD6A was associated to a shorter overall survival. These findings suggest that the, this family, these families of genes might play an important role in the progression of adenocystic carcinomas across different anatomic origins. Back to our case. So we have a solid and base alloyed breast adenocystic carcinoma that presented with the novo metastasis. This tumor lacked rearrangements in MIP or MIBEL1 and uh, harbored uh, pathogenic mutations in NOTCH1 and the chromatin remodeler KMT2C as identified by MSK impact in the clinical setting. Despite multiple lines of therapy, this patient kept progressing and 16 months following uh, the initial diagnosis presented with distant skin metastasis. And 24 months following diagnosis, the patient developed brain metastasis and regrettably the patient expired shortly after. Taken together, we have here a uh, case of a solid and base adenocystic of the breast that had a very poor outcome. In the study we conducted here with the MSKCC cohort, Hannah Wang and Christopher Schwartz showed that the overall survival and the disease-free survival of solid and base adenocystic carcinoma was significantly shorter than that of the classic ADCCs, indicating that the diagnosis of solid and base cellular ADCC portends a worse outcome than that of the classic forms of this disease. In summary, MIB and MIBEL1 rearrangements are less frequently in, solid, in, in breast solid and base cellular adenocystic carcinoma than in classic tumors. Solid and base cellular ADCCs of the breast are genetically heterogeneous and compared to the classic forms of ADCCs show an enrichment in genetic alterations in notch and in chromatin remodeling genes. And solid and base cellular ADCCs have a worse clinical outcome than classic ADCCs. In conclusion, we can say that these tumors are genetically heterogeneous and clinically aggressive, and they do not share the genetic features of classic adenocystic carcinomas. And that solid and base cellular adenocystic carcinomas may represent a single entity or a collection of different cancer types with similar basaloid uh, phenotype. This requires further study. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank everyone who participated in this study, Christopher Schwartz, Eddie Brogi, Tim D'Alfonso, Hannah Wen from the breast team, George Raifillo, Brita Weigel, and other members of the Raifillo Laboratory, or collaborators in different departments, and BCRF for the general support. Thank you for your attention. Delighted to take questions. Thank you, Felicia. That was a pretty fascinating case. Um, I have, I see one question in the chat um, from Syed. 
Um, okay, Frisia, be that as may, we, if you must draw a literary panel, it would be better to characterize adenoid cystic carcinoma as a tumor with Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde's features rather than Charles Dickens. Oh, you can read it. I can. I lost it now. Hold on. Okay. Actually, Dr. Riesfeld Ho entitled one of his papers on adenoid cystic carcinoma as a Jekyll and Mr. Hyde tumor. Any comments? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. I think this, these tumors are not two CTs, but I think these tumors, the solid basal adenoid cystic carcinoma, is probably Mr. Hyde. Yes, I absolutely agree. Thank you for the fascinating comment. I have a question. So, so they can be diagnostically obviously challenging. You showed seek it as a uh, marker, which uh, seems to be positive in these tumors. Yeah, CD117. Yes. Um, so did you find anything in the next generation sequencing of seek it amplification or any anything in seek it or? No, no, we did not. We did not. But uh, it has been reported that most of in most of these uh, adenocystic carcinomas, despite having membrane positivity for CKIT, they lack genetic alterations in this gene. And can this be used as a marker to differentiate between the other variant, like uh, um, type? Uh, I mean, CKIT would be. A membranous um, immunoreactivity for CKIT would be positive in both classic and solid base alloy variants. Mm -hmm. so, so it doesn't help you. So right. immunohistochemically, there isn't that much. We don't have any good marker for this. Or right. I think, uh, yes, for now, the difference is mainly done on morphology grounds. OK, something to keep in mind. Thank you. That was a great talk. OK, Thank you so much. Let's go to the next speaker, Dr. Ingvichen. Um, Ingby was, uh, came to us from Hopkins. She had done a GU fellowship at Hopkins uh, years ago. She's an associate attending pathologist now. And um, her primary interest is uh, uh, unclassifiable renal cell carcinoma. She's uh, contributed a lot to the literature of uh, these tumors uh, with um, molecular classification and uh, identified subsets with distinctive outcomes. Uh, she's also uh, worked on rare subtypes of renal cell carcinomas um, and also uh, now actually working on uh, aggressive renal cell carcinomas and the immune environment. Um, and I can go on and on, but I'll just uh, let her uh, start with her case. Right. Oops, sorry. Blocking my view. Okay. <laughs> Everything looks okay now? Yeah, it's not in uh, full screen mode. Um, Still not. Okay. Let's see if uh, maybe it's the, you're in the a different. It's space. a presenter view now. No. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's presenter. Okay, I guess when, once you start, it will go on. Let's see. Yeah. It's good. It's fine. Yeah. That's okay. Good. Yeah. Sorry for that little glitch. Mm -hmm. And thanks for uh, Mira for the nice introduction and the congrat congratulates to uh, Dr. Campbell and other speakers for the wonderful talks. Uh, so today I'm going to present uh, a, a kidney case. And so this is a 68 year old female with a newly identified renal mass doing a routine workup for urinary infection. And the CT showed at the time a 3.9 centimeter calcified mass, as you can see here, at the upper pole of the left kidney. And there's no other lesion identified in the bilateral uh, kidneys other than this. And her past medical history was only significant for osteoporosis. And the family history, uh, her father had multiple myeloma and passed away at the time because of disease. Her brother had thyroid cancer. And the physical examination showed no significant findings. So based on this clinical picture, and she underwent a left partial nephrectomy. 
So this is a low power view of the mass. You can see it's relatively well circumscribed, but there's no capsule. The adjacent compressed renal parenchyma can be seen. And also at this power, you can see there's some uh, intermediate uh, sized vessels at the peripheral of the tumor and also within the tumor. Consistent with the imaging, there's a scattered foci of uh, calcifications. And also you can see this more hypercellular and also intermixed with this more uh, hypocellular areas. At higher power, again, you see the border of this tumor with adjacent parenchyma is really, uh, there's no pseudocapsule. And then the, uh, the benign tubules can be seen entrapped within the tumor. And the cytologically, the tumor cells show very uh, show variable like solid nested or single cell distribution and uh, a bit, quite amazingly there's really striking vacuolization in the background of eosinophilic cytoplasm and the cytology further the nuclear features if using um, a nucleolar grade uh, they have very prominent nucleolar and uh, nucleoli and uh, uh, there's significant uh, variation of the nuclear size and the size of the cluster and size of the vacuum all varies a lot. In the hypercellular areas, you can see um, the, pretty much the cytology is the same, but now cells can become a single cells or like really miniature type of little cluster of cells distributed in this uh, hyalinized uh, occasion edema to stroma. So appears uh, this very unusual cytology. And uh, there's more, there's other areas show really dramatic calcifications as you can see here. And the calcification occurred both involving the epithelium, but also can be just in the stroma. Going back to the cytology, despite the high-grade nuclear features, there's really no mitosis or apoptosis can be identified. So uh, essentially, we have a differential of renal neoplasm with eosinophilic cytoplasm and a solid or nested growth pattern. So the most common type of renal uh, cell neoplasm that uh, with this type of features are renal oncocytoma. I mean, apparently this case has dramatic atypia that will be very unusual if it's oncocytoma. And chromophobe RCC can have a eosinophilic variant that can um, may uh, I mean, show uh, you know higher level of nuclear uh, atypia and the multinucleation. Um, actually, one tumor that we recognized within our classification can have very striking vacuolization. That is called acquired cystic disease associated RCC, as shown here on the right. Uh, which you can see in the tumor, you often see multiple uh, sieve-like and holes, holes of, uh, uh, of vacuoles within the uh, cytoplasm or sometimes between, uh, between cells. Um, uh, this type of uh, vacuolization or space, sometimes you can see oxalate uh, crystal within. Uh, but most important for this diagnosis, you need to see acquired cystic disease in the kidney. So the patient has a long chronic process of chronic uh, kidney damage. But this patient apparently doesn't belong to that category. Her adjacent parenchyma appear absolutely normal. Her renal function is normal. So this is an unlikely diagnosis. So of course, you, we can always have epithelial angiomyolipoma mimicking um, various type of carcinoma. Um, so we did a, a, a PAX-8 as start, and it's a positive in this tumor, supporting it being a truly a re renal cell uh, uh, derived tumor. And to consider you know, the first common uh, two at uh, differential, although morphologically they're not very consistent, we also did CK7 and CD117. As you can see, CD7 is uh, only uh, highlight very rare cells, definitely less than 5% for oncocytic neoplasm. Majority, I mean, this is sort of considered as a negative stain, meaning majority of the tumor cells are not staining. And the CD117 has a very weak 
concentration staining around the cell, uh, cytoplasmic membrane. Uh, I guess you can consider it as weakly positive, but it's not the typical staining pattern you will see in the chromophobe or oncocytoma. So although we accept certain level of uh, atypia in oncocytoma, and this tumor do mimic oncocytoma in that it has this more hyaluronized stroma and without any capsule around the tumor, um, but you know, one thing we emphasize always for oncocytoma is the cytoplasmic. Uh, so there's very uniform cytology. You need to have very uniform nuclear features, smooth nuclear membrane, and um, this uh, level of polymorphism and difference in our case seems inconsistent. The, actually, the most common atypia we see in oncocytoma is either this type of oncoblast-like uh, smaller cells or the more degenerative type of atypia with multinucleation and uh, area of um, polymorphism. Um, going to chromophobe, again, then here we rely heavily on the nuclear features. The characteristic feature is this uh, resonoid nuclear membrane and the paranuclear halo, um, and we don't see that in this case. So these two common types are out too. And so of course, and it's my favorite diagnosis now, so I can jump to that, I hope. Uh, but now we have many molecular, more molecular defined entities still in the middle. Um, I mean, many of these are already very familiar to you, so I'm not going to go into much details. And uh, the common theme shared here, they are mostly uh, defined by the genetic alterations that characterized in this group of, in this uh, various group of uh, tumors. On the other hand, they often uh, display uh, more variable morphological features um, uh, for which the mechanism will not fully understand at this point. For MIT family translocation RCC, um, for this particular morphology, I think we would have to definitely consider a TFEB translocation or amplified tumor, and that can be achieved by doing a HC, a FISH, or one out for a targeted RNA sequencing panel such as Archer. Um, and similarly, for a, a rare, a recently uh, sort of described ALK translocation associated RCC, uh, you can, uh, we can uh, try IHC or FISH or RNA sequencing to define more precisely the partner. So, so I'll probably just spend a few minutes uh, just go over some of the hereditary syndromes that are in the differential. Uh, these are including SDH deficient RCC that characterized by germline SDHB mutation mainly, and uh, the patient can uh, belong to the field chromocytoma paraganglioma syndrome um, category, um, but the penetrance or, you know, the incidence of RCC in that group of patient is not very, actually not very high. The FH deficient RCC, now we know including both the hereditary form and the somatic cases. Um, the uh, current, uh, the 2016 WHO still listed hereditary leomyomatosis and renal cell cancer as the name of the entity, but uh, uh, it, that probably would be expanded to the more generalized FH defi uh, deficient RCC uh, nomenclature. And so this two tumor, this two type of syndromic uh, unique in that they both have relatively lower penetrance, meaning uh, many of the patients present to you uh, without a, a parent family history, and the, there's maybe one solitary tumor in their kidneys. Um, in comparison, the borhal dubé syndrome and tuberous sclerosis complex uh, has been recognized to often have uh, multiple or bilateral tumors uh, in the kidney. So let's first move on to talk about the SDH. So SDH is particularly interesting in that these tumors are often characterized by a dramatic uh, vacuolization. 
But as you can see here in the typical SDH deficient RCC, those vacuoles typically are not so small and they are not entirely clear. They often have some eosinophilic material or actually have forming a eosinophilic globule within the cytoplasma. And the nuclear features uh, compared to oncocytoma are more variable and have sometimes have grooves, small nucleoli, um, but they are not as dramatic as our cases. Um, in other examples, you can see more uh, obvious like um, lacrylization, and in occasion cases, you could have a malignant malignant transformation within the tumor. So this picture show on the lower left a low grade, a classic SDH deficient, while the uh, up right side showing a much higher nuclei, uh, and um, so this is a more aggressive form of this disease. Unfortunately, we have obtained very reliable diagnostic markers for this entity, the SDHB loss expression in these uh, cases are very uh, helpful and specific. Uh, similarly, we have the FH deficient RCC, and in recent years, this more solid nested morphology has been recognized. And as shown here, two examples, this only represents a small subset of FH deficient RCC. Uh, in our experience, actually it's more likely associated with the germline syndrome, and the patient may have concurrent other type of HRCC associated tumors. Uh, they often harbor FH missense mutation and can show retained FH staining. So we have two markers we routinely use for diagnosing this. One is uh, FH, as you can uh, see from the name. So loss of protein expression in comparison to the internal control is a highly specific marker, uh, slightly lower sensitivity Sorry, uh, yes, a slightly lower sensitivity because uh, around 20% or uh, tumors may have retained defective FH expression. And so we have another marker is more functional, uh, reflecting the out, uh, dramatic elevated fumarate level in the cells that uh, lead to uh, a, a variant protein modification. So, um, so these are also very helpful. Uh, tools together with SDH immunohistochemistry. So um, going on a few words about Borja Dubé uh, syndrome, this is a multi-organ system uh, disease. And uh, again, going back to the presentation, uh, our case doesn't really fit well because this patient only have one single lesion. There's no any other system, uh, suspicion for other, system, uh, other organ involvement. For Borja Dubé, the most uh, uh, the most common type of tumor you may see is so-called so a hybrid tumor, where you have uh, slightly more variations and atypia than oncocytoma, and, uh, but usually the nuclear atypia is not uh, exactly like chromophobe, and you may not have enough paranuclear halo to make you confident to think that's a chromophobe. Another relative characteristic type of tumor in them is uh, intermixed pink and clear cells. Um, but the key actually usually diagnosing this, one is not uh, sort of care uh, carefully checking the clinical history regarding bilateral or multiple uh, tumor and also examine the adjacent renal parenchyma for any early oncocytic or smaller macroscopic level uh, uh, tumor, uh, tumor, uh, small tumor or early lesions. Um, similarly, in tuberous sclerosis complex patient where they either harbor germline TSC1 or TSC2 mutation, we see uh, most commonly uh, multiple and uh, bilateral tumors. And uh, the renal cell tumor, epithelial tumor's incidence is much lower than angiomyolipoma in these patients. And they really show a heterogeneous group of histology. As you can see here, you know, uh, from more clear cytoplasma, popular architecture to solid or uh, sheets-like cells or intermix of either patterns. Interestingly, you can see one of the examples I'm showing here does have dramatic vacuolization, more or less look areas of our tumor. So going back to our case, so we did, uh, aside from the markers I mentioned, we did the markers 
that we have to specifically identify the more molecular uh, molecular defined entities, um, but they are pretty much all negative, either retained or, or negative staining. And uh, CNI is also negative, also and morphology is not a clear cell. CK20 is negative. And the only thing positive pretty much is in this case is Casepsin K which is interesting because we sometimes use a surrogate marker for TFEB or uh, TFE3 um, translocation tumors, but we don't quite understand why this tumor is diffusely positive. So after all this work, we end up calling still my favorite diagnosis, and we had to go on to do uh, molecular analysis. Um, so interestingly, the only mutation we find in this case is mTOR mutation, and this is L2427R. This is an activating mutation that we know can lead to uh, forming a hyperactive mTOR complex one. And the germline testing, uh, because the similarity to a TSC patient, we suggested and they did confirm this patient is negative for any of the germline genes including in the, included in the MSK impact panel. Uh, using FASI analysis to look at the somatic, uh, to look at the uh, next gene sequencing results, we found that the, 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 the tumor has a uh, uh, loss of the whole chromosome one. Uh, which included in the, the locus that where mTOR gene is located. So essentially, this patient has a defect or a hyperactive uh, mTOR active, uh, sorry, mTOR mutation, while the West uh, wild type allele is, is probably lost. And to further confirm this, we conducted the phosphorylate S6 and phosphorylate 40 BP1, two downstream markers of the mTOR complex 1 pathway, and they are positive, highly positive, uh, very uh, in this tumor. So, sorry. so essentially, um, so I'm showing you a, a pretty good examples of this tumor now, where uh, potentially would name as eosinophilic vacuolate tumor, or EVT, uh, of a form of sporadic renal tumors that pre much uh, primarily primarily driven by TSU mTOR alterations. Uh, interestingly, you know, we start from unclassified, we did molecular, but now we come back to confirm a very unique morphology actually associated with this specific molecular alteration. Although uh, we don't yet have a, a very reliable uh, HC level markers, uh, because the mTOR downstream markers typically lacking specificity only for mTOR uh, pathway alterations. So, um, uh, but this actually, this very uh, characteristic uh, morphology would actually serve as a very powerful tool for us to consider this diagnosis. The good news, because for patient would be these tumors, as so far based on evidence, uh, based on the available evidence, has very uh, excellent outcome. Uh, there's more cases come out uh, in this in this year, and I think overall, uh, majority of these cases have as mTOR mutations, but also can be TSC, TSC one, or uh, rare other um, mTOR pathway mutations. Uh, across the board, uh, the striking features is vacuolization, small nests, and uh, very uh, relatively hypercellular stroma mimicking oncocytoma background. So, you know, that's not the end. <laughs> the part kind of confusing recently is we found a wearable, a, a range of tumors that are driven primarily by mTOR PSC mutations. This is another one actually was described slightly earlier than the vacuolated tumor. Um, they have also solid, a, a solid nested appearance uh, in comparison to um, EVT, which I just shown, they can have more uh, CK20 staining. On, on the other hand, then uh, their immunohistochemistry don't have very specific findings except CK20. And those tumors, those tumors are also characterized mostly by TSC2 or TSC1 mutations. Yet another group called low-grade oncocytic tumors that share more uh, similarity to um, the classical eosinophilic uh, 
homophobe or oncocytoma was also found to a characteristic by uh, M uh, or uh, mTOR complex one or TSC uh, mutations. Uh, here you have CD1 by seven negativity and CK7 positive staining. So, um, so that's just about the pink cell tumors. And then there's yet a, a more clear cytoplasma one that called RCC with fibromyomatous, sorry, fibromyomatous stroma that's also characterized by TSCM tor mutations. So it's really sort of the spirotic spectrum that mimicking the TSC patient uh, tumors that show in various histology. Uh, the review article, at least here, have a nice uh, table comparing them. So what is the reason for this when you're thinking about this? I think one uh, probably intuitive uh, thinking would be maybe is that they're arising from different cell populations. As we all know, the renal epithelium within the kidney have a different type of cells. The recent single cell sequencing study have really highlighted they are very uh, specific cell populations. Uh, that have a different transcriptome and potential epigenetic regulation as well. So hopefully in the future, we may uh, dissect more, understand more from this regard. Another other hypothesis, maybe there are dose effect or concurrent alterations that can cause this, uh, can lead to these different levels of or different type of morphology. A cautionary tale is, you know, uh, we do have see other cases that with uh, similar molecular alterations, but uh, behave much more aggressive. This is a, a different tumor, much larger one was incidentally found, and it turned out to have a similar solid and eosinophilic features. But here, uh, you don't have as much vacuolization, of course, and also obvious nuclear, really high grade, very some features, including necrosis, there's a lymphovascular invasion, and uh, the resection is PT3 AN1. And in the liver mat happened one and a half year later, you will see vacuous uh, of this, uh, like a little bit cytologically mimicking our case. Uh, interestingly, this case was also only characterized by one single somatic mutation, the same one as our tumor, and has a negative germline testing. But here now, this copy number shows more variation, including some focal, uh, uh, again, that rich amplification level. But however, however, there's no very clear mechanism we can find that can explain this much higher or much aggressive biological behavior. So that's, I think, is the question left to us to how to better define this disease and give the more accurate prognostic at the time of resection or biopsy. So the, this patient has been done uh, excellently. There's no evidence of disease four years post-surgery. With that, I would like to end and uh, hope this you will remember now this image to recognize this type of tumor. Thank you and welcome any questions. Thank you, Ingli. It was fascinating to see a variety of uh, presentations with the, with all having mTOR mutations. Um, so there was initially it was thought it, it could be high grade tumor, right? There was some publications of this being high grade. Yeah, the high grade. I think some of the because there's a nuclear feature. If you use our regular grading system, it's definitely grade three, a high grade. Uh, but but. As you say, only rarely they're high grade, as you showed one case. Yeah, so with this classic morphology, all the reported case has been pretty much indolent. So that's why they are now uh, you know, proposing remove the carcinoma word from the, from the terminology. It's also interesting that your high grade tumor did not show much genomic complexity. It right, no, yes. So yeah, so yes, I guess that's the one. That's more to be studied. Um, yeah, even this one, like become metastatic, there's very limited, um, you know, abnormality other than the mTOR and the some of the copy number changes. So Rohit uh, has, uh, Bhargava has a question, how proliferative is this tumor? What is the KI index? Uh, in that, in the typical EVT cases? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't see a uh, proliferation, yeah. You, you, you haven't tried the KI to see. We haven't tried KI. Um, 
Uh, we can try, but the, from assessing uh, regular uh, the, uh, I mean, the way we usually look at mitosis, there's no uh, clear sign of uh, proliferation. Thank you. That's a great case. Um, okay, let's move on to the next uh, speaker. Um, thank you, Ingrid. It's great, great to see all the cases. Um, so, um, uh, Dr. Gavin Sutter, Anne. Um, Anne is, uh, came from Rutgers to us. Uh, she'll be presenting case three. She did a search pad fellowship followed by breast fellowship. And then now she's an assistant attending pathologist. Um, her research interests are, are a, a lot, a lobular carcinoma. She's uh, interested in non-classic types and she's looking at all the gray areas in breast pathology, uh, like correlation of uh, uh, atypical ductal hyperplasia with biopsies and excisions, flat epithelial at atypia, um, and uh, other tumors such as neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. This is a case of an 85 year old man who was who palpated a right breast mass. He has no family history of cancer. On physical exam, there was a three centimeter irregular mass in the right retroareolar breast. And there were no other palpable masses and no palpable lymph nodes. And there were no other significant exam findings. He underwent a mammogram and ultrasound, which showed an irregular and marginated mass measuring 3.2 centimeters. And a core biopsy was performed at an outside hospital. The biopsy showed multiple cores involved by an invasive carcinoma and the higher magnification revealed areas of necrosis, high grade nuclei and abundant mitoses. The diagnosis of invasive ductal carcinoma poorly differentiated had been rendered and biomarker assessment showed the tumor was ER, PR and HER2 negative. Let's discuss male breast cancer. Male breast cancer is rare. It accounts for less than 1% of all breast cancers. And although its incidence increased by about 26% over the past 25 years, male breast cancer focused research is limited. The general understanding is that male breast cancer has a prognosis similar to that of female breast cancer with equivalent stage and patient age. Approximately 20% of patients with male breast cancer have a first degree family member with breast cancer. Men with a family history have a two to three times increased risk. One third of familial cases arise in BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers. BRCA2 is the strongest risk factor with incidence rates of up to 10% in BRCA2 male carriers and a relative risk of 80 times the general population. And there is some evidence supporting a link between PALB2 and CHECK2 mutations and male breast cancer. Additionally, any condition that decreases exposure to androgens or increases exposure to estrogen increases breast cancer risk like the use of anti-androgen therapy in prostate cancer. Klinefelter syndrome uh, in particular imposes a risk of breast cancer 20 to 50 times higher than the general population um, as a result of the increased circulating estrogen. Male breast cancer usually presents as a unilateral mass in the subareolar region. The initial diagnosis often occurs at a later stage than women, and men often exhibit more advanced disease with larger tumor size, lymph node involvement, and distant metastases at the time of diagnosis. Currently, the most common surgical management is modified radical mastectomy. Notably, men who have a first primary breast cancer have a 16% increased risk of developing a second primary cancer. The International Male Breast Cancer Program examined almost 1,500 male breast cancer patients and found that the most common type of invasive cancer is invasive ductal carcinoma of no special type. Unlike in females, the second most common type is papillary carcinoma. Other types are extremely rare and most tumors are grade two. Over 99% were ER positive. Most were also PR and AR positive. HER2 positivity was seen in 8.7%. Only 0.3% were triple negative, and these were all adenoid cystic carcinomas. A triple negative cancer should prompt a second pathology review and consideration of a metastasis. So wait, our case is reported as a triple negative male breast cancer, 
Let's return to the patient. The patient had a PET CT scan, which revealed the right lower inner quadrant at breast mass, as well as a right lower lobe lung mass measuring 3.1 centimeters and suspicious for malignancy. At this time, a core biopsy of the lung mass is recommended. The FNA and core biopsy shows spindled cells with scant cytoplasm, nuclear smearing, that's and that's cross effect. Yeah. Immunostains. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I'm just, I, show the cells are vocally positive for chromogranin, positive for TTF1, and they show loss of RB. And the cells are negative for P40, GATA3, and SOX10. Diagnosis with small cell carcinoma of the lung. Let's take another look at the breast biopsy. So morphologically, they both show ovoid to spindled cells, high nuclear grade, and had areas of necrosis. So further workup was done on the breast biopsy, and the stains show that the tumor cells are positive for TTF1, synaptophysin, and INSM1, and they're negative for GATA3, as well as for SOX10 and chromogranin, and RB was lost. Morphology and the immunophenotype are similar to the tumor in the lung, so this is most consistent with a metastatic small cell carcinoma. Now we'll discuss metastatic tumors found in the breast. Metastases to the breast are unusual. The majority originate from the contralateral breast or from hematologic malignancies. On imaging, metastases appear as relatively small, superficial, poorly defined, irregular nodules. A stellate configuration, which is common in primary breast cancers, is not a typical mammographic feature. A tumor that's well circumscribed and sharply demarcated from the adjacent tissue that lacks an in situ components and doesn't have calcifications can suggest a metastasis. This study from our department examined non-mammary metastatic lesions to the breast, axilla, or both. They also excluded hematologic malignancies. In 11% of cases, the finding of the breast or axillary lesion was the first presentation. The tumors are frequently unilateral and solitary. Carcinoma was the most common tumor type, and the most common primary site was the GYN tract with ovary as the single most frequent primary source, and lung was the next most common. In this series, men represented 15% of the cases, and in men, the most common metastatic tumor was melanoma, followed by lung, renal cell, Merkel cell, prostate, and papillary thyroid carcinoma. Knowing that most METs come from breast or GYN tumors, ER staining can be helpful to exclude other sites, but just remember that false negative ER staining of core biopsies can rarely be seen, can be caused by many factors, including inadequate fixation or uh, sampling a heterogeneous tumor that shows weak ER expression. There are two types of estrogen receptor. ER alpha is found in the breast, ovary, and endometrium, while ER beta has a wider distribution, including the lung. All antibodies against ER may not recognize both of these isoforms. Some may recognize ER alpha, but not beta, and others may recognize that in reverse. In this early study from Dabs et al., they stained primary lung adenocarcinomas with two different antibodies to ER. All 45 cases were negative for ER with one clone, and those same tumors showed 66% ER positivity with the other clone. So as pathologists, it's just important to be familiar with the antibodies being used so you understand the impact on the results. But ER, PR, and HER2 cannot be used for triple negative breast can carcinoma by definition. Uh, the first step, of course, is to determine if you have a carcinoma, and then among cytokeratin positive tumors, CK7 and 20 narrow down the primary site. So Shao and colleagues examined the cytokeratin expression in 575 breast cancer cases. As expected, 92.5% were CK7 positive. It's just important to note, however, that 7.5% were negative for CK7, and 1.7% were CK20 positive. GCDFP15 and mammoglobin are breast cancer specific markers reported up to 70% of breast carcinomas. They are not expressed in benign breast tissues and GCDFP15 is more specific but less sensitive than mammoglobin. GATA3 is a transcription factor. It's useful as a marker of breast or urothelial origin. It's more sensitive than mammoglobin or GCDFP15. GATA3 has shown high concordance of expression in paired primary and metastatic breast cancers. The specificity has been more variable though. 
In an analysis of 2,500 tumors, reactivity was seen in over 80% of breast and urothelial carcinomas, but was also seen in a large subset of basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas, skin and nexal tumors, among others as listed here. In the breast, GATA3 and ER are closely associated, which may explain the positive correlation between GATA3 expression and ER positive tumors. This study looked at GATA3 staining in ER positive and ER negative breast cancer subgroups. As expected, GATA3 was more sensitive for the ER positive HER2 negative tumors. In triple negative cancers, GATA3 positivity was seen in 66% of cases, and the sensitivities of mammoglobin and GCDFP15 were lower. In those triple negative cancers that didn't express either mammoglobin or GCDFP, 56 were positive for GATA3. So they show that GATA3 is particularly helpful with ER negative poorly differentiated tumors. And a panel including all three can detect up to 70% of triple negative cancers compared to 34% using only the other two. SOX10 is a transcription factor that mediates differentiation of neural crest cells, has also been seen in myopithelial cells of the breast. It's primarily used to identify melanoma and nerve sheath tumors, but it's useful in breast cancer also, specifically triple negative cancer. In the study outlined in the table, 66% of the triple negative subgroup were SOX10 positive. This study evaluated SOX10 and GATA3 expression in metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Overall, metastatic breast cancer was positive for GATA3 in 82% of cases and SOX10 in 58%. Nearly all cases were positive for at least one of these. And importantly, 70% of GATA3 negative metastatic cases were SOX10 positive. So SOX10 uh, can help capture a high percentage of these GATA3 negative metastases. One caveat, just remember in SOX10 positive tumors, you should perform at least one cytokeratin to exclude a melanoma. The morphologic features of triple negative breast cancer and solid type lung adenocarcinomas can be quite similar. This study compared staining of these tumors. They show that there's a subset of lung uh, carcinomas which can be negative for TTF1 and NAPSIN, while all of the triple negative breast cancers were negative for TTF1 and NAPSIN. On the other hand, SOX10 was positive in 62% of triple negative breast cancers and showed no expression in lung adenocarcinomas. What about neuroendocrine tumors, which can also show morphologic overlap with those in the lung? So pure neuro neuroendocrine neoplasms make up less than 1% of breast carcinomas. The expression of neuroendocrine markers is probably under-recognized in breast cancer because there's currently no clinical relevance of neuroendocrine differentiation. So routine staining uh, isn't done. Carcinoids of the breast were first described in 1963, and since that time, there's been various definitions and criteria used to categorize these lesions. So we'll review those now. Neuroendocrine carcinoma was first considered a distinct entity um, in the third edition of the WHO. Under the heading neuroendocrine tumors, they were defined as tumors with morphology similar to the GI tract and lung, which express neuroendocrine markers in more than 50% of the cells. And included in this category were any subtype meeting this uh, immunohistochemical positivity threshold. These were graded, subtyped, and treated the same as non-neuroendocrine tumors. The fourth edition used the heading carcinomas with neuroendocrine features. The arbitrary 50% threshold was discarded, and three categories were introduced, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, and invasive breast carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation, which included solid papillary and hypercellular mucinous carcinomas. In 2017, there was a consensus conference that tried to create a more uniform framework for neuroendocrine neoplasms across different anatomic sites. And this framework was adopted in the most current edition of the WHO under the term neuroendocrine neoplasms. They are now divided into two categories, neuroendocrine tumor and neuroendocrine carcinoma. And using this classification system, a malignancy demonstrating more than 90% neuroendocrine morphology is diagnosed as a neuroendocrine neoplasm, while those showing less than 10% are called invasive breast cancer, no special type. Those in between can be called mixed invasive and neuroendocrine neoplasm. Mitotic counts, KS67 labeling, necrosis, and expression of neuroendocrine markers, which are used for grading and other organ systems, are not applied in the breast for classification. 
Neuroendocrine tumors are grade one or two tumors with neuroendocrine features, including densely cellular solidness and trabeculae. They can be separated by delicate fibrovascular septa. The classic features of carcinoid tumors that you see in other organs like cores or rosettes are not often seen. Neuroendocrine tumors of the breast are malignant, that is, they are forms of invasive breast cancer. Most will be strongly ER positive and HER2 negative, and GATA3 is reported in more than 95% of cases. Neuroendocrine carcinomas are high-grade tumors with densely packed, fairly uniform, small, dark, hypochromatic cells with a high NC ratio. Large cell carcinomas have more abundant cytoplasm. A high mitotic rate and focal areas of necrosis are common to both. They are morphologically indistinguishable from their lung counterparts. And the diagnosis is supported by diffuse reactivity with neuroendocrine markers. Neuroendocrine carcinomas account for approximately 0.1% of all breast cancers and up to 10% of extrapulmonary small cell carcinomas. The data suggests that breast small cell carcinomas may not be as aggressive as those in the lung. This study found that patients with neuroendocrine carcinomas had a progression-free survival significantly shorter than invasive carcinomas, no special type. However, there was no difference in overall survival. The prognostic significant relevance of uh, neuroendocrine differentiation is still debated, and so these are treated as are other breast cancers. For pathologists, it's important to communicate to our clinical colleagues about the nomenclature, and most importantly, since there's considerable morphologic overlap between primary breast neuroendocrine neoplasms and those from other sites, metastases need to be excluded. Obtaining a pertinent clinical history is important. Finding a coexistent conventional breast carcinoma or an in situ carcinoma favors a breast primary. TTF1 positivity is rarely seen in breast cancers, but it's common in extrapulmonary small cell carcinomas, so this wouldn't be very helpful. And as we discussed before, ER can be seen in a variety of tumors. But GATA3 may be useful in this distinction. Mittenin and colleagues found that all neuroendocrine neoplasms from sites other than the breast, including low-grade tumors like carcinoids and high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas were negative for GATA3. And another study looked at 50 neuroendocrine carcinomas from the lung and GI tract, and again, all were negative for GATA3. In contrast, Levine found that all but one breast neuroendocrine neoplasm were positive for GATA3. So GATA3 positivity would favor a breast primary. In summary, a triple negative breast carcinoma in a man is rare and possible metastases uh, should be excluded. GATA3 and SOX10 are sensitive and specific markers for breast carcinoma and metastases from other sites should be excluded before a diagnosis of primary breast neuroendocrine neoplasm is made. I'd like to thank the breast pathology team here at MSK and thank all of you for listening. Questions. Thank you, and that was an excellent review of uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms and metastasis to breast. So, there is a question from Syed Hoda, being a devil's advocate here. How can you be sure this is a lung primary? Could this be a primary breast small cell carcinoma met metast metastatic to lung? I guess. After yeah. Well, in this case, yeah. <laughs> in this case, uh, if you remember, it was uh, the lung. The breast mass and the lung mass were both GATA3 negative. And as I discussed at the end, GATA3 positivity would more strongly favor a breast primary uh, versus the other. And this is also um, in a man. Um, and so the triple negative, oh yeah. So you mean just for the small cell? Yeah, I think it's just because it was GATA negative. The thoracic team reviewed the lung case and it seemed to fit more with a lung primary. Um, so, with all this, do you recommend doing immunos on every poly differentiated biopsy of breast uh, tumors? Is that how do we differentiate sometimes without doing immunos? So we mostly look for um, an in situ component. They're typically there. If they're not there, sometimes people will throw on like just like a GATA or something like that to confirm that it's breast, um, unless the clinical picture is strongly favors breast. Um, so no, we don't routinely work them up um, unless it something seems off about the case or maybe the patient has a history of something else or has you know other suspicious reasons elsewhere. So just important to get a full history for the patient. Yeah, yeah it, I think sometimes it's hard. We have seen some lung cancers 
metastatic to breast and look like breast cancers and only the molecular findings have taken us to the path that it is really lung cancer. So I think, I think they're pretty challenging sometimes. All right, thank you so much, Anna. And uh, so let's go to the next one. Uh, so next presenter is Dr. Natasha Lewis. Um, so we've heard uh, such fantastic talks in the morning um, uh, and in heme path and um, Natasha is uh, our hematopathologist. Natasha actually did um, search path uh, uh, fellowship with us first and then she did heme path fellowship and she's an assistant attending in hematopathology now. So uh, let's hear Natasha. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Hermine, for the introduction. Um, so this is a case of a 72-year-old male with a past medical history significant for coronary artery disease that required um, bypass grafting and stent placement. Um, he first presented to our institution in 2017 with fever, cough, shortness of breath, and skin rash. Um, workup eventually um, went on to show diffuse hypermetabolic lymphadenopathy by PET scan involving um, the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, as well as mild splenomegaly with increased FTG um, uptake, pulmonary infiltrates, as well as bilateral pleural effusions. Um, his labs were significant for an elevated LDH and enormous cytic anemia. So a needle core biopsy of the inguinal lymph node um, was performed. Um, the lymph node architecture was effaced by an atypical lymphoid infiltrate composed predominantly of these small to intermediate size um, um, neoplastic lymphoid cells with irregular nuclei and moderate to abundant pale cytoplasm, um, sort of scattered in, um, in small aggregates and scattered singly. The background showed um, histiocytes and some small lymphocytes as well as an increased number of small vessels. So immunohistochemistry showed that the majority of the lymphoid cells in the biopsy were um, CD3 positive T cells, um, including our atypical uh, lymphoid cells, while there were a few um, CD20 positive B cells in the background. The background is also notable for expanded follicular dendritic cell meshworks as seen with CD21. Um, the immunophenotype of these atypical lymphoid cells was determined using both flow cytometry and immunohistochemistry. Um, which showed that these um, atypical cells, while expressing CD3 by IHC, lacked surface CD3 expression by flow cytometry, consistent with predominantly cytoplasmic CD3 expression. Um, the neoplastic T cells also expressed CD2, CD5, CD4, um, and showed strong PD1 expression, also known as CD279, and they expressed CD10 and BCL6 and showed aberrant loss of CD7. Um, interestingly, EBER by in situ hybridization was negative in this case. So based on these over, um, on the overall morphologic and immunophenotypic features, um, our diagnosis was angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma. So a staging bone marrow biopsy was done at this time, and it showed um, low-level involvement by the angio angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma, or AITL, um, which was seen both by immunohistochemistry as well as flow cytometry. And notably, um, we, sh uh, we saw no morphologic evidence of involvement by a myeloid neoplasm. So we um, sorted the neoplastic T cells from the bone marrow um, using flow cytometry and performed next-generation sequencing. Um, and that demonstrated um, two mutations in TET2, a DNN, DNMT3A mutation, a ROA G17V mutation, and an IDH2R172K mutation, all of which are characteristic of AITL and all showed a high variant allele frequency. Um, at this time, a blood sample was also submitted um, for flow cytometry and for sequencing. And um, here we also picked up those same TET2 and DNMT3 mutations as were seen in the pure AITL cells. Um, with a variant allele frequency higher than would be expected if they were present only in the um, neoplastic T cells, which comprised only about 1% of the total white cells by flow cytometry. This result indicated that these mutations were also um, likely present in a uh, cellular compartment other than the abnormal T cells, most likely myeloid cells, um, and would suggest the presence of um, clonal hematopoiesis, which was colonially related to the AITL. So the patient went on to receive um, chemotherapy with cyclophosphamide, oxyribicin, vincristine, and prednisone, or CHOP, and after which he, he um, achieved a complete remission with improvement of his anemia. 
However, about two years later, he presented with worsening macrocytic anemia with a hemoglobin of 7.8 and an MCV of 110, new mild leukopenia, mild um, neutropenia with an absolute neutrophil count of 1.6 thousand, um, and new um, thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of 86,000. And at this point, a PET scan was done, which showed no definitive evidence of lymphoma. So because of his cytopenias, um, a bone marrow biopsy was performed. Here on low power, uh, you can see in, in the core biopsy that the cellularity was variable with areas showing um, hypocellular marrow and other areas showing more normal cellular marrow for his age. On higher power, um, we can see that there was trilineage hematopoiesis with an erythroid predominance and evidence of megakaryocytic dysplasia with these small hypolobated forms. Um, there was no evidence of marrow involvement by AITL, either by immunohistochemistry or flow cytometry, but we did um, detect an increased number of myeloid blasts as seen here with CD34 IHC, and these blasts showed an aberrant phenotype by flow cytometry as well. On the bone marrow aspirate smears, we also uh, detected an increased uh, percentage of blasts, which we counted at 10% uh, of the total cellularity. And the background showed trilineage um, dysplasia as evidenced by um, nuclear budding, nuclear regularity, binucleation, and abnormal maturation in um, the erythroid precursors, and um, cytoplasmic hypogranulation, and abnormal nuclear segmentation um, in, the in the myeloid lineage. Here again shows an increase in blasts, erythroid, and myeloid dysplasia, and also we um, identified megakaryocytic dysplasia as evidenced by these small hypolobated forms in forms with separated nuclear lobes. A karyotype showed a complex, um, complex genetic alterations, including a monosomy 7, which is an uh, alteration that's commonly seen in myeloid neoplasms, particularly therapy-related uh, myeloid neoplasms. So sequencing was done on this marrow. Um, and again, we picked up those same two um, TUT2 mutations and the TNMT3A mutation that was identified in the pure AITL cells and in the blood um, two years prior, although the allele, the allele frequencies in the blood at that time were much lower than what was seen in the bone marrow um, two years later. We also identified uh, multiple additional mutations, including CEBPA and RONX1 um, at a low, lower allele frequency, um, and these mutations are also common in uh, myeloid malignancies. So based on the bone marrow morphology and the karyotype um, in this patient who had previously received cytotoxic chemotherapy, um, this was diagnosed as a therapy-related myeloid neoplasm um, presenting as a myeloid dysplastic syndrome with excess blast morphologically. Um, given the presence of these shared mutations, um, it was likely that the myeloid neoplasm was clonally related to the AITL and that both likely arose from clonal hematopoiesis. So just to sort of summarize, we, um, based on this genomic data, we hypothesize that these TET2 and DNMT3A mutations um, in this patient likely arose in an early hematopoietic stem progenitor cell that gave rise to clonal hematopoiesis, meaning these mutations were present in a um, hematopoietic progenitor cell as well as um, its offspring um, at um, a low level in sort of more mature my, um, hematopoietic elements. Um, this clone eventually um, diverged along uh, myeloid and T-cell lineages, and we predict that that T-cell lineage clone subsequently acquired additional mutations, including TET2 and row a um, which possibly um, led to the sort of progression or transformation to T-cell lymphoma. Um, the myeloid lineage clone um, also remained and expanded, possibly due to um, pressure from the chemotherapy, as well as from acquisition of additional genomic um, alterations, ultimately leading this clone um, to MDS. So just to complete our case, um, this patient was only able to receive um, best supportive care and transfusions for his myeloid neoplasm, and he died shortly after that diagnosis of pneumonia and septicemia. Um, so AITLs um, are the most common subtype within this broader category of T-cell lymphomas with T-follicular helper or TFH phenotypes, um, which based on similar immunophenotypic characteristics as well as gene expression um, profiles are thought to represent the neoplastic counterpart of normal um, T-follicular helper cells. Um, TFH cells are uh, normal CD4 positive T helper cells, which um, normally reside in germinal centers. Um, the histology of AITL is characterized by a proliferation of typically small to intermediate size um, 
neoplastic T cells with moderate to abundant pale cytoplasm um, in a background of abundant reactive inflammatory cells, including small lymphocytes, um, some histiocytes, eosinophils, and plasma cells. Um, the background typically also shows increased numbers of small vessels, which can show this branching or arborization. And typically, um, you'll see expansion of follicular dendritic cell meshworks, which are usually best seen with um, immunostains like CD21 and CD23. The AITL phenotype resembles normal TFH cells as they express CD4, as well as other TFH markers, which include CD10, PD1, CXCL13, ICOS, um, and BCL6. And scattered EBR positive cells are also um, very common in this disease. So mutational studies um, have demonstrated a number of recurrent somatic mutations in AITL, the most common being um, those in epigenetic modifier genes, including TET2, DNMT3A, and IDH2 at the R172 locus, as well as in a specific uh, um, location on the row A gene, um, G17V, which is a small GTPase gene. Um, other mutations in uh, T cell signaling genes um, are less common. Um, TUT2 has been found to be the most commonly mutated gene in AITL, being seen in about 80% of cases. This is followed by Rho A, which is seen in somewhere around 40 to 70% of cases, and then IDH2 and um, DNMT3A mutations, which are seen anywhere from 20 to 40% of cases. Um, among T cell lymphomas, TUT2, DNMT3A, and Rho A mutations are seen in AITLs and um, other T cell lymphomas. That TFH origin, and in a small subset of PTCLNOS cases, while IDH2 mutations have been shown to be largely limited to AITL. Um, interestingly, virtually all cases with Rho A or IDH2 mutations will also have a TET2 and or DNMT3A mutation, and usually the allele frequencies of Rho A and IDH2 are lower than um, that of TET2 or DNMT3A, suggesting that the, the TET2 and DNMT3A mutations occur as earlier events. So clonal hematopoiesis, um, or CH, is defined as an expansion of, of a clonal population of blood cells with one or more somatic mutations. And it can be seen in um, otherwise healthy people with um, normal blood counts and without a known hematologic disorder. Um, these mutations are thought to occur in early um, hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, and they persist in the, um, in the subsequent progeny of those cells. And it gives that particular lineage um, a disproportionate survival advantage over the other um, lineages from other hematopoietic stem cells, and this allows it to grow and expand over time. Uh, CH is thought to be an age-related phenomenon, and it increases in prevalence with increasing age. So um, CH is found in less than 1% of people under the age of 40, but is seen in up to 10 to 20% of adults over 70. Um, growth of these pre-existing clones can also be promoted after the stress of um, chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Um, the genes that have been found to be most commonly mutated in CH include, again, DNMT3A and TET2, and these genes are also uh, commonly mutated in myeloid neoplasms like acute myeloid leukemia or MDS. It's known that CH can um, act as a precursor state for hematologic neoplasms and does confer um, a relatively small but increased risk of developing a hematologic malignancy, including both myeloid and lymphoid cancers, at a rate of about 0.5 to 1% per year. It interestingly also has been um, associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. So the relationship between AITL and CH is an area of ongoing study. Um, so early on before the genetics of AITL were characterized, there had been case reports um, of patients developing both AITL and myeloid neoplasms, although um, the etiology of that was not really understood at that time. And then as studies came out showing these um, certain recurrent mutations in AATL like TET2 and DNMT3A, which at that time were also known to be commonly mutated in myeloid neoplasms, um, a few studies evaluated the mutational profiles of different um, cell lineages in a few patients with AITL. And they found that the same TET2 and DNMT3 mutations were seen in both the neoplastic T cells and in other cell lineages in some of these patients. So for instance, um, in this study by Corona et al., they sorted these different cell populations from the blood um, of a patient with AITL and a known DNMT3A mutation. And they found that that DNMT3A mutation was not only seen in the CD3 positive um, neoplastic T cells, but also in the CD34 positive blasts and in CD19 positive B cells. 
suggesting that these um, particular mutations uh, may actually arise in early uh, hematopoietic progenitor cells that have the ability to differentiate along um, different cell lineages. Um, a seminal case report in 2018 um, reported a patient who had developed both an AITL and subsequently an AML, um, both of which harbored identical TET2 mutations. Um, they showed that the TET2 mutation seen in both of these neoplasms was also likely present um, as clonal hematopoiesis in the bone marrow at the time the AITL was originally diagnosed. Um, suggesting that both of these neoplasms um, were clonally related to each other and that they likely arose from pre-existing CH um, that had the potential to evolve um, along both T and myeloid lineages. So here at MSK, um, we performed a study to evaluate the prevalence of clonally related CH um, in a cohort of patients with AITL. Um, we evaluated the genetics of bulk and some select flow sorted um, cell populations from paired bone marrow and tissue samples in 22 patients with AITL. And we found that in 15 of those 22 patients, or nearly 70%, um, there were identical TET2 and or DNMT3 mutations in both the AITL and in their myeloid compartments, consistent with these mutations occurring in these early hematopoietic uh, progenitor cells. Interestingly, um, the ROE and IDH2 mutations um, were only found in the AITL uh, cells, suggesting that those mutations uh, more likely occur as later events. Um, within this cohort, there were also four patients who had developed both AITL and a myeloid neoplasm, including MDS and AML. And all four of these patients were found to harbor identical TET2 and our DNMT3 mutations in both their AITL and their myeloid neoplasm, suggesting that both neoplasms in all patients um, arose from a common CH-like clone with the potential to clonally evolve to both AITL and a myeloid neoplasm. Um, a similar study published uh, more recently showed similar results and that 70% of their cohort of 27 patients with AITL or PPCL NOS showed evidence of shared mutations in their myeloid compartment and T-cell lymphoma. The shared mutations were largely limited to TET2 and DM DNMT3A, while a number of mutations were limited to the T cell lymphomas, which included row A and IDH2. Um, you know, these studies are relatively small and have some bias, but the data suggests that AATL may actually commonly arise from um, CH and suggests potentially that AATL patients may be at higher risk of developing a myeloid neoplasm, but um, additional study would need to be done to really confirm any kind of disease association. So in summary, um, AITL is considered the neoplastic counterpart of T follicular helper cells, and it commonly harbors mutations in TET2, DNMT3A, IDH2, R172, and ROA G17B. Um, clonal hematopoiesis refers to the clonal expansion of somatically mutated blood cells. TET2 and DNMT3A mutations are, most, um, are the most common mutations seen in clonal hematopoiesis, and they're also frequently mutated in myeloid neoplasms. Um, related CH appears to be prevalent in patients with AITL, and that divergent evolution of a CH-like clone with the subsequent acquisition of additional genomic alterations um, may give rise to both AITL and myeloid neoplasms, and that this biology may place AITL patients at higher risk of a myeloid neoplasm, um, particularly after the stress of chemotherapy, which may have important um, management or therapeutic implications. And that is all I have, and I'm... Um, Happy to take any questions. Great talk. You're learning so much on clonal hematopoiesis and associated neoplasms uh, as we go along. There is a question from uh, uh, Mikhail. Um, great presentation, Natasha. Should these neoplasms be considered in a different category than TMN? Should there be a ATL patient screened for CH prior to chemo? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's a good, it's a good question. You know, we, we, at this point, we categorize most, almost all, I would say, you know, myeloid neoplasms that occur after chemotherapy or, you know, specific therapies as therapy related. And it's really just based on the clinical history, not necessarily on the biology, you know, of the disease right now. So, you know, possibly as we learn more about this, maybe it should be thought of in a, a different way, given that maybe whenever this happens in someone with AITL, it's likely to just being, to likely be coming from the same clone. Um, but I think we'll have to kind of see as more data comes out. Um, and whether these patients should be screened, yeah, it's, um, it may be a good idea. You know, a lot of these patients get a bone marrow um, for staging anyway. And so doing some sequencing to see 
whether they have CH in the background might be informative, especially if you're going to decide to do a, like heavy duty chemo, like an auto transplant or something. Um, so I think it's probably a good idea, um, but you know, we'll see if, if that's really something that would change management. I don't know. So uh, this patient today, TL, um, you know, clonal hematopoiesis is pretty much age related, as you said, and all therapy related. So do you see patients who are younger with ATL and if they do, they have clonal hematopoiesis? So. Not necessarily. I mean, generally AATL is also a disease of older people. So there are kind of two diseases that affect generally older people. So I think um, not in my experience have I seen necessarily a difference in age, um, but I think that's also a function of the biology of AITL that it's also an yeah. older person disease. And, and as, as he pointed out, it, it, that would be a way to follow the patients is clonal mm -hmm. hematopoiesis though, right? I mean, if, if they are having these mutations in the blood and they have AATL, then that could be one way to follow the patients uh, with the very early frequencies. Yeah, although, you know, it's, um, you know, if the mutations are present in background myeloid cells, you know, they may sort of persist while the AITL, after the AITL has gone away. So you'd have to really kind of know what you're, what you're following, what you're looking at, you know, because it, it, they might just hang out in the, in the blood at a certain level, and they're just present in these myeloid clones that um, may just sit there for a long time or could progress. You know, yeah. So, okay. Okay. great cases. Thank you, everybody. We are going to have the coffee break for about nearly maybe 12 minutes or so. So, 3 40, we'll be all back for the next four cases. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Natasha. Welcome back, uh, everyone. So we will start with the next four cases. Um, the presenter, first presenter is Judy Sarangbam. Dr. Dr. Sarangbam is um, assistant attending pathologist at the GU service. She was a fellow at Memorial a um, few years ago. I did search path fellowship and GU path fellowship. And then she left us and went to Albert Einstein Montefiore uh, stayed there for three years and she's come back to us. Uh, Judy works on um, bladder ca cancer and does uh, phenotype genotype correlations and heterogeneity. Uh, Judy? Yes, hi. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me just try to share the screen. Uh, can you see the, which screen can you see? Yeah. Is it? You okay. can see, you can see, yeah. Uh, okay, the right screen, <laughs> uh, not the presenter mode, right? Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Hamid. And uh, today I'll be talking not on bladder, but on testis. Uh, this is the title of my talk, uh, the good or the bad but not ugly, a testicular uh, dilemma. So uh, this is my disclosure. So the history is that of a 34 year old male with infertility and has a left testicular pain. On examination, he's found to have a left uh, testicular mass. Uh, the serum profile was performed and it was found to be within normal limits. Subsequently, a radical orchiectomy was performed. Grossly, the tumor is well circumscribed. Uh, some, some nodularity is there, but uh, otherwise it's very cystic and there are some solid areas. Uh, there is some uh, uh, renal parenchyma, uh, sorry, testicular parenchyma, which appears uh, relatively unremarkable. So the microscopic section essentially replicates what was seen uh, grossly, a very cystic tumor, and there are some solid areas uh, in uh, uh, scattered amongst. Yeah, we can also appreciate some compressed testicular parenchyma in the periphery. This is a high power view showing different areas of the tumor. Uh, most of the cysts are lined by um, 
uh, glandular epithelium, and uh, there are some focal squamous area, uh, and there, there is some smooth muscle uh, stroma in between the septae between the cyst. This is a so foreign body signs a reaction to keratin in one of the uh, area in the tumor. However, in the surrounding testes, we did not see any germ cell neoplasia in situ. So, so what does that mean? So wh where do we, uh, what are the differential diagnoses in this case? So the differential diagnostic possibility includes a teratoma post-pubertal type, or it could even be a teratoma pre-pubertal type occurring in a post-pubertal testis. So why is this distinction important? This distinction is very important because Prepubertal teratoma is benign, while postpubertal type teratoma is malignant. So, going back to uh, the story of a little bit, uh, up to 2004, WHA classification of the germ cell tumor of the testis, teratoma was just put under one uh, category uh, with uh, various subtypes, which include dermoid cysts, monodermal teratoma, and teratoma with somatic type malignancy. However, various studies have shown that pediatric testicular teratomas are similar to its ovarian counterpart in that there is no amplification of short arm of chromosome 12 and absence of isochromosome 12p. There is normal DNA content and karyotypic findings. There is normal findings by uh, comparative genomic hybridization. It is thought to be derived by a parthenogenetic-like mechanism, which means growth and development of embryos occurring without fertilization. These tumors have an organoid appearance, meaning they replicate uh, the normal tissue. There is no cytology atypia of the uh, tumor. This is a pictographic representation of the histogenetic model for development of teratomas. The pink uh, circles are uh, ovaries and the blue are uh, testi testes. So it is thought that ovarian tumor, uh, tumor and prepubertal teratoma, uh, um, ovarian tumor teratoma and prepubertal teratoma, they arise from the, uh, the normal germ cell, while uh, postpubertal uh, teratomas they are, they are uh, derived from intratubular germ cell neoplasia, and then subsequently uh, uh, differentiate. However, there are cases reported in literature of various pediatric type teratoma uh, uh, occurring in adults, uh, some of the which I have highlighted in this slide. In this, uh, in 2013, Dr. Albright and his group from Indiana published their findings to show evidence supporting the existence of benign teratomas of the postpubertal testis. In this, uh, they studied 25 teratomas, uh, apparently benign post-pubertal testicular teratomas, which include 10 dermoid cysts and 15 non-dermoid teratomas. Some of the exclusion criteria they have uh, used are, there should be no intratubular germ cell neoplasia, uh, th there should be no cytologic atypia of the teratomatous element, there should be no parenchymal scarring suggesting uh, regression of germ cell tumor, no microlithiasis in the surrounding testis, and there should be no more than few, uh, focal tubular atrophy and sclerosis immediately adjacent to the teratoma. The postpubertal status is defined by active spermatogenesis seen in the surrounding testis. In this group, uh, their median age was about 24 years, and FISH study for chromosome 12 was uh, available on 18 uh, cases, and none of them uh, showed an abnormal 12p chromosome. Uh, on follow-up, of which was available on 17 patients, all of them were alive, and um, uh, they showed uh, there was no recurrence or metastasis. Subsequent to that, uh, there were a few other publications. In this publica uh, study uh, publication, they studied two cases of benign type teratomas that occurred in uh, testes of postpubertal patients. Uh, the case in case one, it consists of uh, pure mature intestinal tissue with organoid appearance and no intratubular germ cell neoplasia. And in case two, uh, it consists of a partially disrupted mature epidermoid cyst and another with tubule type epithelium and no intratubular germ cell neoplasia. Fish analysis on both the cases showed no isochromosome 12p nor amplification of chromosome 12p. So in 2016, um, WHO, uh, uh, modified the classification of uh, germ cell tumor of the testis as 
and divided it into germ cell uh, new, uh, tumors derived from germ cell neoplasia in situ and germ cell tumor unrelated to germ cell neoplasia in situ. The teratoma, which was initially under one group, is now divided into teratoma post-pubertal type and teratoma uh, pre-pubertal type. So going into detail a little bit further, <clears throat> pre-pubertal teratomas are germ cell tumors usually seen in pre-pubertal testes, usually in children less than six years of age. This is a picture of a pre-pubertal testes where we can see the uh, seminiferous tubules uh, lined by this immature uh, Sertoli cells and some germ cells uh, that can be identified here. They can also occur in post-pubertal uh, patients and has been reported in uh, patients up to 70 years of age, and in which case uh, the surrounding testes uh, will be uh, more like a pure post-pubertal testes and will show active uh, spermatogenesis. It shows a benign uh, clinical course. Uh, the prepubertal teratoma also include dermoid cysts and epidermoid cysts. They typically show all spectrum of uh, tissue, um, including epithelial, mesenchymal, and neural tissue. And they show organic, uh, organoid appearance, in meaning they replicate normal tissue. Uh, for example, in this picture, uh, this uh, teratoma uh, shows an uh, intestinal epithelium with um, smooth muscle in the, uh, surround, uh, uh, in the layer and with adjacent uh, prepubertal uh, testes. Uh, there is no amplification of short arm of chromosome 12 and absence of isochromosome 12p. The findings that should not be seen are germ cell neoplasia in situ, cytologic atopia of the tumor, tubular atrophy. There should be no parenchymal scars suggestive of regression of germ cell tumor, no necrosis, and uh, the spermatogenesis is usually normal in the surrounding testes when it occurs in adult. Prepubertal teratoma also include uh, epidermoid cysts, which is just a cyst lined by stratified squamous epithelium without any adnexal structure. Um, and a dermoid cyst, uh, like its nor uh, normal counterpart in ovary, has uh, is more complex and show um, a stratified squamous epithelium with adnexal structure. On the other hand, uh, post-pubertal type teratoma are malignant germ cell tumor derived from germ cell neoplasia in situ. Um, they are also composed of various tissue type, um, which can be more than one or more than uh, one germinal layer. They are usually seen in uh, young men and pure test uh, testicular, post-pubertal testicular ter uh, teratomas are uh, rare. Usually te uh, testicular uh, germ cell tumors are more mixed. Uh, they can show secondary somatic type malignancy and serum markers may be elevated. This is a picture showing uh, a number of um, germ cell neoplasia in situ within the seminiferous uh, tubules. <clears throat> Here too, we can see different tissue type, uh, including epithelial, mesenchymal, and neural tissue, but they are less organized in appearance than in post-pubertal type. The features that can be seen are cytologic atopia of the tumor, immature uh, elements uh, in the tumor, often uh, neuroectodermal. There should be, uh, no, uh, there may, you may see necrosis. Germ cell neoplasia in situ may be identified uh, in the surrounding testes. Uh, the seminiferous tubules uh, show atrophy with impaired spermatogenesis. Uh, usually we can see my, uh, microlithiasis, parenchymal scar, uh, which uh, suggests partial regression of tumor may be seen. So this is a, a photomicrograph of a, um, a, a testicular teratoma with squamous epithelial lining and then the adjacent seminiferous tubules with uh, germ cell neoplasia inside to uh, highlighted by these arrows. Another picture of the testicular uh, post-pubertal type testicular ter uh, teratoma, which shows a disorganized haphazard arrangement of the uh, structures uh, uh, and no organoid appearance. And this is uh, another picture with uh, germ cell neoplasia in situ highlighted by these arrows. More recently, uh, Dr. Perny and his group from the uh, UK published their findings on prospective molecular and morphological assessment of testicular prepubertal type teratoma in uh, postpubertal men. In, in their study, they included 14 prepubertal type teratoma and 21 postpubertal type teratoma. <clears throat> uh, they did molecular analysis on all the 14 prepubertal type teratoma and none of them displayed 12p amplification. 
there is no associated germ cell neoplasia in situ or significant atrophy of the surrounding uh, testes. Uh, four cases did show for well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, and on follow up, uh, which was available on 10 cases, there were no recurrence or metastasis. On the 21 post pubertal type teratoma, uh, molecular testing was performed only on one case, which showed uh, 12p amplification. Three cases were presented with clinical meds. Uh, there were uh, immature areas in the tumor in eight cases. Um, Ten cases had uh, germ cell neoplasia in situ, and there is severe atrophy of the parenchyma uh, in 17 cases. So they concluded that both morphological and molecular features are of help in differentiating prepubertal type teratoma from postpubertal type teratoma. In nearly all postpubertal type teratomas, molecular testing was unnecessary. The morphological impression of the prepubertal type teratoma in adults is supported by uh, the molecular testing. So to summarize the difference between the prepubertal type and the postpubertal type teratoma, uh, I have divided the features into feature present in the tumor and feature present in surrounding testes. Uh, the organoid appearance is more common in prepubertal type teratoma, while they are uncommon in postpubertal type teratoma. Necrosis, cytologic atypia, and second, uh, secondary somatic type malignancy are absent in prepubertal type teratoma, while they may be present in postpubertal type teratoma. In the surrounding testes, germ cell neoplasia and situ, atrophy of the seminiferous tubules, uh, parenchymal scar, uh, which may indicate regression, uh, microlithiasis, uh, coarse calcification, these are all absent in prepubertal type teratoma while they are often present uh, in uh, post-ubertal type teratoma. Uh, as we have mentioned before, chromosome 12p abnormality, they are absent in prepubertal type, then often present in post-ubertal type. So going back to our case, um, uh, let's see what we see in, the, uh, in more in detail in the surrounding testes. So there were multiple foci uh, of uh, atrophic, lo atrophic looking uh, tubules, and uh, on higher magnification, these atrophic tubules are lined mo mostly by Sertoli cells only, and there is slight thickening of the basement membrane. And intermix amongst these are these relatively normal appearing seminiferous tubules. Uh, with uh, we can see the uh, maturation. So on looking further into the surrounding testes, there were a few uh, seminiferous tubules with intratubular granuloma, which indicate uh, that there is an immune response to something with happening within the uh, seminiferous tubules. And uh, there was an area where there is um, focal coarse calcification and adjacent uh, uh, fibrosis or scar. In some areas, there were few uh, tubules which have thickened basement membrane, and uh, this uh, seminiferous tubule is almost completely hyalinized. And within this uh, hyalinized tubules, there was only um, uh, Sertoli cells, and there, there were no germ cell neoplasia in situ, as was uh, mentioned before. So to put all this thing together, uh, on the base on the findings of teratoma component, not organoid, uh, intratubular granulomatous inflammation, parenchymal scar with calcification, hyalinization of seminiferous tubules, we rendered a diagnosis of uh, teratoma postpubertal type uh, uh, in spite of the absence of uh, uh, germ cell neoplasia in situ. We are, the story continues with, we are, uh, and we have follow-up on this patient. Uh, follow-up of the patient is done by uh, the um, uh, no, serum markers and uh, CD scan of the abdomen and pelvis, uh, which showed a uh, few enlarged retroperitoneal lymph nodes with central low density, which is highlighted in this uh, uh, by this uh, uh, arrow. So a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection was performed. A lymph node shows metastatic germ cell tumor of not only the teratomatous component, but there was also a component of embryonal carcinoma. A higher power view of this uh, teratoma, uh, teratoma uh, in the lymph node and an embryonal carcinoma surrounded by granulomatous inflammation in the lymph node, which is the embryonal carcinoma is supported by OCT and CD30 immunostains. Uh, to end the story, uh, impact test testing on the lymph node showed broad range of copy number gains suggestive of the presence of isochromosome 12P. 
And with this, I have come to the end of the talk. And I would like to thank, thank everyone uh, who helped me with this presentation. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Judy. Uh, happy to take any questions. I have to stop. Thank you. It was a good summary, nice summary of the pre and post pubertal teratomas. Um, I don't see questions in the chat, but I can. So, do you, um, who often do you send for I12P? Like, if you see a teratoma like how you had your morphology, would you send it right away to a, for a RACGH? So that's a very good question because um, first of all, we don't often see very pure teratomas and uh, pure tumor teratomas without germ cell neoplasia in situ often. The main issue was the germ cell neoplasia. But uh, for this, uh, we were, uh, the findings in the surrounding testes were uh, good enough for to be confident about the diagnosis. But doing the I2P, isochromosome 12P, so there is a certain percentage. If it comes back negative, what are you going to do with it? So um, uh, the surrounding the findings in the surrounding justice bear uh, enough for to make the diagnosis of this uh, entity. And for the children with uh, uh, pre-pubertal or children adults, yeah, uh -huh. especially for children, that so the treatment is still a keactomy. Like how how do they can treat be, uh, a, a, a seven year old with a testicular mass, which could be just a benign teratoma? Um, partial orchectomy, I'm not very confident about this, but partial orchectomies has been performed for enucleation of epidermoid cysts has been uh, performed uh, to save the test, uh, kind of a test uh, sparing, but it's a, uh, um, I would have to, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, move to the next case. Um, so the next presenter is, uh, um, Dr. Alexander Yoshifumi Chan. So uh, Alex was uh, uh, from NYU, his residency, and he uh, did a search path fellowship with us. Uh, then he followed that with, uh, I think, traveling the world for a year or something. And then he did uh, two years of heme path, and now he's an assistant attending um, in our hematopathology service. Um, Alex. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Hamid. Um, oops, hang on, let me just share. Everything looks okay? All right, so yes. good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Hamid. Um, thank you to the other speakers. These have all been great talks so far. So I'm gonna be talking about a little bit of bone marrow pathology. Um, our patient is a 68 year old male patient um, who developed severe fatigue in March of 2020. Um, and he presented to us about six months later in September of 2020. Over that six month period, he developed worsening of this fatigue, shortness of breath and rapid weight loss. Um, his CBC on presentation here uh, was most notable for a marked anemia. He had a hemoglobin of eight 8.3 grams per deciliter with a normal MCV. WBC was kind of borderline decrease, but there wasn't any significant neutropenia. He did have a mild basophilia at 2%, uh, but no circulating blasts, no monocytosis, no eosinophilia. His platelets were normal at 171. He did have an elevation in LDH at 584, but this was not like a sky high or a thousand sort of elevation. Imaging at the time was very notable for marked hepatosplenomegaly. You can see here, the spleen is basically the size of his liver. Um, and these are a few shots from his CT, um, but otherwise he didn't really have any lymphat lymphadenopathy that was lighting up anywhere. So based on this, the clinicians thought he may have some kind of myeloid neoplasm. Um, they decided to get a bone marrow biopsy in a couple of weeks. So he came back for his bone marrow biopsy, his peripheral blood CBC findings were relatively, uh, all basically the same. He still had a persistent basophilia. This time it had gone up to um, 7%. 7 um, and he still had the marked anemia. And now he was down to 7.6 grams per deciliter. Um, he did have a little bit of left shifted granulocytes, but again, no circulating blasts, no monocytosis, no eosinophilia. WBC count overall was normal. Platelets were overall normal. So they got a biopsy in mid October. And now we're like two weeks after he's presented. And the biopsy looks like this. Um, at low power, we can see a markedly hypercellular bone marrow for a 68-year-old, and it looks very pink. 
Um, it is also notable that the bony trabeculae might be a little bit thickened, and there is some degree of this kind of streaming look to it that um, makes us think of perhaps there's some myelofibrosis in here. At high power, we're seeing a lot of really marked eosinophilia. You can see all these eosinophils with their beautiful granules here. Um, there's also numerous eosinophil precursors. It's kind of interesting because we didn't really see any peripheral eosinophilia in the CBC. Um, his ME ratio was also kind of increased. And throughout the marrow, there were areas where there were increased immature appearing cells. We can see here we have kind of increased um, sort of atypical looking cells with irregular nuclear contour, more finely stippled chromatin, and distinct nucleoli. So this is one of more of the kind of uglier areas. Unfortunately, the aspirate smears were not very useful. Um, they were aspicular, hypocellular, hemodiluted. Um, there were occasional atypical um, appearing erythroid precursors. We hear, see here like a weird monolobated erythroid, I mean eosinophil, sorry. Um, but no significant dysplasia in the granulocytes, no significant erythroid dysplasia. We didn't really see a lot of megakaryocytes, but the ones we did see looked pretty normal. Um, and we were seeing some of these eosinophils in the peripheral blood as well. This is a reticulin stain, which probably explains why the aspirate smears were so bad. Um, so we have some moderate reticulin fibrosis here. As usual, we get our normal immunohistochemistry and we get a CD34 stain. And we do see a slight increase in blasts here. We can see um, small clusters of blasts. And overall, we called this 5 to 9% blasts by CD34. Um, the touch imprints that we got also did show around 10% blasts, which basically fits with this. So there's like a mild elevation in blast count. One other interesting thing we were noting on the H&E that, um, that we saw were these kind of clusters of more immature appearing erythroid cells, um, maybe a little bit more prominent than the usual erythroid island. This one is not as good because we've cut through most of it. So these are maybe a little more prominent than the usual erythroid island, um, and they look a little bit left shifted compared to normal erythroid areas. We did get a CD71, which showed a few of these clusters, but unfortunately we had cut through a lot of these chunks by now. We also ran flow cytometry on this marrow, as we always do, and we picked up an abnormal um, CD34 positive myeloid blast population. Um, we see here that is CD34 positive, but it's 117 negative or CD117 negative, so that's abnormal. This subset of blasts also has dim to negative CD13, also abnormal, and there's very bright HLA-DR on these blasts. We ran a lineage assessment tube as well, and we didn't find any evidence of B or T cell differentiation in the blasts, only really myeloid differentiation with MPO. Um, we also did tubes for B and T cell assessment, and these were negative for any abnormal uh, lymphoid components. Ah, so based on this, we had basic, we, we think there's a myeloid neoplasm at this point, but the um, differential, it's kind of difficult to narrow it down right now. Um, morphologically, it looks like there could have been like an MPN in there, but given the degree of eosinophilia, we're also thinking about the myeloid lymphoid neoplasms um, with eosinophilia and gene rearrangements. Um, as far as MPNs go, it doesn't really meet criteria for ET or PV or really even PMF, maybe like a overtly fibrotic PMF, but there's normal, normal megakaryocytes, so that's probably not too likely either. So at this point, we're like, all right, we, may, we probably can't narrow this down all the way just yet. Maybe we're going to actually have to wait for cytogenetics. So given that um, we're looking for these myeloid lymphoid neoplasms with gene arrangements, we run some fish panels. And they're basically all negative. So we get no evidence of a PDGFR alpha fip one l one rearrangement. However, these are often cryptic. So even if it was there, we probably wouldn't see it. Um, PDGFR beta, no evidence of a rearrangement there. FGFR1 was negative as well. There's no BCR able as well. We also did some MDS and AML related fish. Um, these are all negative as well. So we did manage to run fish analysis also for a JAK2 probe, which is a JAK2 break apart probe here. And we did detect a JAK2 rearrangement in 20, about a quarter of the cell. So we can see here we have the split signal in JAK2 and one abnormal, um, one abnormal finding, and then we have one normal uh, combined signal. And fortunately, we have access to the RNA-based Archer Fusion Plex heme assay, which detected the very rare PCM1-JAK2 fusion. Um, 
Later on, we also had impact testing, which detected an MLL uh, mutation as well as a CCND3 mutation. So this PCM1 JAK2 fusion is essentially disease defining. So we ended up with a diagnosis of a myeloid lymphoid neoplasm with PCM1 JAK2 fusion and 10% blast by touch imprint differential. This is a rare and new, newly provisional category in the most recent WHO revision. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the myeloid lymphoid neoplasms with eosinophilia, um, particularly what genetic changes to look for and how do we look for them. Um, it's going to be a relatively practical discussion here. So the myeloid, myeloid and lymphoid neoplasms with eosinophilia are a WHO-defined category of hem hematologic neoplasias that are defined by genetics. They include um, cases with rearrangements of PDGFR alpha, PDGFR beta, FGFR1. And then there's a provisional category that includes cases with PCM1 JAK2 fusions, as well as a couple other JAK2 rearrangement sort of um, cases. These are interesting because they can show both a myeloid or a lymphoid um, differentiation. More commonly, they tend to present with a chronic MPN-like picture. Um, however, they can also present as an acute leukemia, and they can either present as an acute myeloid leukemia or an acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and what they develop into or what they present as um, changes a little bit depending on what type of rearrangements you have. Um, for example, the PDGFR alpha cases tend to develop into AML or T lymphoblastic leukemia, but very rarely into B lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, these PCM1 JAK2 ones are frequently transformed into acute myeloid leukemias. These, um, in general, in the whole category, the T lymphoblastic transformation seems a little bit more common than B lymphoblastic trans transformation. Um, it's not really clear why that is, but it does suggest that there is some kind of stem cell origin in these genetics. Um, and in some of these cases, if they present initially as a blast phase or an acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, it may be challenging. They may look like a de novo acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and you may not discover the presence of an underlying chronic disease until the patient achieves remission from the acute leukemia. Another thing to point out is the category name of neoplasm eosinophilia is a bit of a misnomer. So they don't universally all have eosinophilia. Um, this case had tissue eosinophilia in the marrow, but it did not have um, peripheral eosinophilia in the blood. They can also have mastocytosis, um, and this seems to be a little bit more common in the PDGFR rearranged cases. Um, so more specifically onto our case, we have a PCM1 JAK2 fusion. This is characterized by a translocation between chromosomes 8 and 9, um, leading to a fusion of PCM1 and JAK2, which is thought to result in constitutive activation of JAK2. Um, they tend to occur in male patients, kind of a wide age range. Median age is sort of middle-aged patients. Um, they tend to present typically with MPN-like findings, but they can really have all sorts of CBC findings. Most often there's leukocytosis and eosinophilia, but that's not, that's not a universal thing. They do tend to have splenomegaly, which our patient had, so that was kind of useful. Um, there are a handful of other JAK2 rearrangements, such as the T912 ETB6 JAK2 and the T922 BCR JAK2, which are actually thought to be variants of this entity and behave sort of similarly. As far as the pathologic diagnosis goes, um, there are some morphologic clues that can clue you into this, um, this entity. So there is a classic morphologic triad where you see, first you see hypercellular marrow with eosinophilia. You can actually see this in any of these neoplasms. Um, we did have this finding in this case. Um, you can also see aggregates of immature erythroid precursors. So you can see, um, this is a CD71 from this study. And we kind of saw that, but they weren't really great aggregates. Um, here's another great example down here of a massive erythroid aggregate. Um, sometimes they can get so big, they basically just fill up, the, fill up the medullary spaces. And sometimes they can even raise a question of like, is there an erythroid leukemia? Um, and then the last thing you tend to see is myelofibrosis. Um, we did have myelofibrosis here, but overall, these are not terribly specific findings, although this erythroid precursor aggregates tend to be kind of unique. It is also notable that in the one, the variant cases that are BCR or ETV6 as the translocation partner, um, they may not show this triad at all. So this can be sort of difficult. And how do we identify these rearrangements um, that define these diseases? So we can use cytogenetics, but it's not always going to be helpful. Like I mentioned earlier, 
The most common FIP1 L1 PDGFR alpha fusion for this entity usually results in a cryptic deletion of a piece of the long arm of chromosome four. Um, you may see normal cytogenetics here. So you may have normal karyotype, normal fish. Um, they may not help you. Um, PDGFR beta, usually you can detect this with the break apart probe, but there are some cases where it is cryptic. So it's not 100% of the time going to be useful. FGFR1, usually the break apart probe can detect this. Um, for PCM1 Jack2, you may not have easy access to a fusion probe. They do exist, but most labs aren't going to have them. Um, there are Jack2 break apart probes, which we have here. Um, but they may not be as specific as you'd like to make a, a good diagnosis here. If you have access to um, Archer, which is a great assay that we love here, um, this may be the most useful diagnostic modality. So Archer Fusion Plex Heme assay is an RNA-based targeted next-gen sequencing panel. Um, it detects a broad array of gene fusions that are seen with hematologic neoplasms. And the nice thing to know is that it does not require you to know the, the fusion partner or the breakpoints in advance. This is sort of a oversimplification, but I mean, the way it sort of works is you get reverse transcription from your um, fusion product mRNA. Then it uses primers um, that flank the, the known gene in the rearrangement to sequence the full fusion gene. And from that full fusion gene, you can figure out what the translocation partner is. Another really nice thing about Archer is that oftentimes it can have a relatively quick turnaround time. Sometimes we can get these back in about five days. So fortunately for this case, we pretty much had a diagnosis by the end of the week. These PCM1 Jack2 um, fusion neoplasms are very rare. So there's generally pretty limited data on clinical behavior and the optimal therapy. However, it's generally thought to have pretty poor outcomes. Um, can present in a chronic phase or a blast phase, and there is some, and they can progress from a chronic phase to a blast phase. There is some evidence that um, IKZF1, which normally plays a role in hematopoietic de development, particularly lymphoid development, can be associated with progression to lymphoid blast phases. Um, but again, there's not a whole lot of data on this. There is a little bit of data from this small German study, which is only really nine patients in the American Journal of Hematology. Um, they had eight patients with PCM1 JAK2 and one patient with a BCR JAK2 fusion. And they treated eight of these patients with a JAK2 inhibitor ruxolitinib. Um, and they got a few patients to transplant, but in general, the results are relatively mixed. Um, in this study, they also tried to pool their data with um, other cases in the literature, which I find kind of interesting to see if ruxolitinib has any survival be benefit. And their findings suggest there's not, there wasn't really much survival benefit with ruxolitinib. However, this is such a small study that, I mean, it's essentially anecdotal at this point still. Um, and there are definitely reports of ruxolitinib providing enough, um, um, in conferring enough of a response to get a patient to an allogeneic transplant. Um, and it does seem like from most studies that allogeneic transplant is, does have real benefit and maybe the only opportunity to get a cure in these patients. However, it's not entirely clear what the op optimal therapy to get a patient to transplant is with these diseases. So right now, because of this, the NCCN essentially recommends that these patients be referred for clinical trials because we don't really know how to treat them yet. Um, going back to our patient, he was initially started on ruxolitinib in October after he was diagnosed, and he initially responded. He had a nice, um, nice initial response. His follow-up marrow in January of 2021 had him back down to a 2% blast count. Um, but then within a month after that, he had progressed to a blast phase, and as which was an acute myeloid leukemia. And ultimately, he succumbed to his trans transformed disease. So just one last diagnostic note. We typically tend to top line this as myeloid lymphoid neoplasm with PCM1 JAK2 fusion. If a case has reached a blast phase, we will say myeloid lymphoid neoplasm with PCM1 JAK2 fusion with greater than 20% blast consistent with an acute leukemia, which is a mouthful, but it is what it is, I guess. Um, this is a rare... But WHO recognized and provisional entity. It has a classic morphologic triad, which we discussed. Um, cytogenetic testing may help you, but if you are down to a single test and your sample is limited, um, it may be best to get something like Archer. And lastly, these, these diseases are generally aggressive and we don't really know the optimal therapy. So these patients generally get referred for trial. Um, I wanna thank my hematopathology colleagues for some references. If you guys have any questions, happy to take them.
All right. Thank you, Alex. We every day we learn something new, uh, another new disease. Um, so I don't see any questions in the chat. I can ask a very naive question. So there are many Jack two rearranged hematopoietic neoplasms, obviously, right? The MPN. So do they all have? Jack two is the driver in all of them. So, but their clinical behavior is quite varied, or do they all behave badly? Yeah, it seems like they vary quite a bit. Um, these ones seem like they are universally kind of bad, but I think other ones may not necessarily be as bad. There is some evidence there's like t a lot of T cell lymphomas have JAK2 rearrangements as well. Um, I mean, a lot of T cell lymphomas also perform badly and kind of unclear because we treat them also differently. So I'm not, I'm not really sure exactly how well we can. So they are treated based upon the the cell of origin or some origin more than the rearrangement or genetic uh, finding yeah that... so far that's what it seems like okay all right good to know okay um okay uh let's go to the next uh talk so next speaker is dr laura tang i don't need to introduce laura uh she seems to be somewhere out having a good time there, I can see. Laura is a senior attending pathologist of the GI team. Um, she's uh, very well known for her uh, work on gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so, so I, Laura, take it. Thank you, uh, Mira. Um, you can hear me and see me okay? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, I cannot see um, uh, all these people, uh, 90 plus people uh, <clears throat> on this conference uh, in person. Uh, I don't even see a picture of you. Um, this is frustrating because this is the <clears throat> most fun part of the <clears throat> alumni, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to have this case uh, presentations and to interact with you and see your responses. But anyhow, I'll just um, sit in my office and talking to myself. So a uh, straightforward uh, history, young uh, female patient with omanto nodules. <clears throat> and one of the nodules was biopsied, which shows a, uh, this appears to be a lymph node entirely replaced by a neoplasm. Uh, arranging in irregular nests and cores and perhaps um, trabecular uh, uh, features. Another view showing, um, let's go back to that for a second. Oh, maybe there's some uh, irregular fibrosis as well. And here uh, we see the tumor um, invading into the omentum. Um, there are features of um, microcysts uh, with some uh, kind of fluid or mucin within it. It's hard to tell at uh, this power. And also uh, noted there is some uh, pileosis. A little bit higher power, it really shows um, an epithelial or epithelioid neoplasm, uh, quite cohesive um, with um, again, some um, mucoid or matrix material within this um, lumen and also intracellular, uh, perhaps mucin as well. <clears throat> Higher power, uh, some of the cells have very um, pink um, granular cytoplasm. Others have uh, intracellular uh, mucin. Um, there are some um, baked, uh, perhaps glandular or pseudoglandular formation. In the focal area, I think this is due to some kind of degeneration. Uh, there's a peculiar focus with a signaling cell morphology, uh, loss of a cohesion. So this is an uh, outside the consult case and uh, <clears throat> immunostains came with the case positive for pancytocarotene, CK7, CK19, BER-EP4, and the mucin carmin, negative for CK20, PAX8, and SOX10. Here is a mucin carmin staining showing this um, 
uh, luminal or microcystic um, features with a positive for mucin, as well as intracellular mucin as well. So you have done three months fellowship and memorial, and you could be one of these people. And your diagnosis is consistent with carcinoma. Differential diagnosis includes a possible primary from head to toe, all covered. And clinical and radiographic correlations are recommended and you're extremely busy, you're ready to get on the next case because it is um, 6.45 p.m. You can hear the last uh, slide uh, drop off is coming your way, you'd better move on. So it's actually, you are probably correct. It uh, looks like a carcinoma, stains like carcinoma, <clears throat> although you're not um, ready to commit a specific uh, type of this carcinoma <clears throat> and you covered the entire body. So you cannot be wrong. And you ask for <clears throat> clinical and radiographic correlation. So perfect. And um, another person look at this and saying, look, wait a minute, there's so much, the focal area is so much um, granular cytoplasm, this uh, pseudo kind of glandular formation. Uh, could this be, um, you know, hepatocellular carcinoma? So a few stains and also, you know, um, very large nuclei and prominent nucleoli. So these are features of hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, long and behold, the, all the hepatocellular markers are positive, hyper-1, arginous, and albumin in situ hepatization. Not all the cells are diffusely positive. Um, <clears throat> here is a albumin in situ hybridization, but the pattern is pretty good. These are coarse granular uh, staining pattern is, is pretty consistent. And um, now you are uh, a memorial alumnus now um, and have practiced in for three months and you could be one of these individuals from last year. So you are taking a little bit more risk at this point. <clears throat> Instead of saying carcinoma, you see it's adenocarcinoma because um, uh, BE, uh, BERB EP4 positive, CK7 positive, and it's in a lymph node, and then you noted a uh, hepatoid differentiation of both both on morphology and by you know, stains. And you learn from your fellowship that um, hepatoid um, carcinoma can most commonly occur in the stomach and ovary. Uh, but you said among others, so you covered everything. But you now you're more focused on the stomach and ovary. And again, you ask for clinical and radiographic correlations. So here, <clears throat> here is the uh, clinical information uh, based on your recommendation of a potential gastric primary. They did upper endoscopy, nothing there in the stomach. And also there's no mass in the pelvis. So ovaries are fine. However, uh, it is noted that the only uh, sites with lesion are liver and omentum. So you say, oh, this seems to be a liver primary, which is getting a little bit easier perhaps, because if it is a carcinoma, you only have three, two or three types. It's either hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangial carcinoma, or mixed. So you study this again. <clears throat> so you can um, say that there the adenocarcinoma component is mucin production, lymph node metastasis, and uh, some uh, markers, uh, CK7 and uh, BRIP4. And hepatocellular part, you have the morphology as well as uh, immunostains. So <clears throat> brilliant diagnosis combined, hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangial carcinoma. Bravo. However, clinical correlation again, this patient is only 19 years old. 
which would be extremely un <coughs> uncommon for uh, this entity. And there's also no pre um, predisposition liver disease and um, viral tests for hepatitis um, B and C virals are both negative. In, in addition, there's no elevated AFP, which um, is common in hepatocellular component and CA19.9, uh, usually, po usually positive in um, uh, cholangiocarcinoma. So now, what should we do now? So you are, <clears throat> again, you are memorial alumnus with more than 10 years practice now. So you could be one of these individuals. So you <clears throat> back up to consistent with carcinoma and you want to send the case to memorial for consultation. So here um, we discussed case with a uh, disease management team conference. A young fellow, actually a resident, suggested molecular testing. Modern physicians, Z generation, very clever. And surely enough, <clears throat> we identified an in-frame oncogenic fusion, which is um, DNA JB1 and uh, cyclic, cyclic uh, AMP dependent protein kinase A fusion. And um, this uh, DNA JB1 encodes a protein which belongs to heat um, stroke protein family. And uh, indeed, <clears throat> this fusion is, pre is present in greater than 95% fibrolamanar type hepatocellular carcinoma. However, um, the recent studies from um, the GI group here, which uh, the first author is um, our GI fellow from two years ago, uh, Monica Bias, and she's very special. And in this study, it's documented that um, oncocytic um, uh, neoplasms in the pancreas and in the biliary system can also have this um, trans, uh, diffusion. However, in the context of clinical context of a young individual with no uh, pancreatic lesions, and this is very helpful. So speaking of um, variants of hepatocellular carcinoma, in general, there are two variants. Um, Although HCC can have uh, different morphological um, features or, or variants, but in general, the pathogenesis is the same. It occurs in older patients uh, in the US uh, in the seventh, around the seventh, sixth, seventh decade. In Asia, uh, the patients are younger, in Africa, even younger. And usually there's a predisposition uh, risk factor such as cirrhosis. Um, viral hepatitis B or C. Uh, C is common in the US and the B is common in uh, China and Asia. In contrast, uh, for, um, fibrolaminar variant hepatocellular carcinoma, they occur in very young patients, is extremely rare in patients older than 40. And there's no uh, predisposition factors. And interestingly, serum AFP, is elevated, always, almost always elevated in um, uh, conventional HCC, but normal in um, follicular, I mean, in uh, uh, fibrolaminar HCC. And the pattern of disease is that uh, for conventional HCC, um, usually it leads to uh, um, liver failure before it goes to anywhere else. However, in the uh, fibrolaminar type, uh, lymph node metastasis is very common, as well as peritoneal spread and also lung metastasis. Uh, because these are younger patients with this pattern, so later recurrence um, is common. In terms of molecular genetics, uh, it's complex for conventional HCC and it usually is aneuploid because of the um, disease progression from, from long uh, standing. Um, uh, um, hepatitis. 
Interestingly, for fibrolamanar HCC, uh, we mentioned uh, this uh, fusion is greater than 95% uh, in 90, greater than 95% cases, and also there's a heterozygous uh, chromosome 19 deletion. So these two are very common. So in cases without this particular fusion, um, there, are, there are rare cases with, with amplification of uh, protein kinase A um, um, alone. And another interesting finding is uh, there's a rare, a rare subset as loss of um, um, regulatory subunit of protein kinase A. And this group um, is, uh, as, uh, believed to be associated with uh, Carney's complex because um, all, all uh, Carney complex um, patients have this uh, loss of function. In terms of uh, cytocarotene profile, you already know the other uh, markers for hepatocellular differentiation, but cytocarotene profile is kind of interesting. For HCC, uh, CAM 5.2 is the best marker. Uh, other CK7, 20, 19 are usually negative. In contrast, um, uh, fibrolamanar HCC is usually positive for seven. In this case, it's also positive for CK19. So pathological features are quite uh, <clears throat> unique. Um, the, uh, if uh, the cases present with uh, common features, is very um, the diagnosis is very straightforward, particularly with the uh, patient information, young patients. However, in our case, there are many uncommon features. Um, I'll go through those with the uh, pictures. So the common features, <clears throat> uh, the most common feature is uh, this um, highland uh, collagenous bands. Um, it can arrange uh, with a central scar and radiating out with this uh, parallel fibrous band, which um, is, uh, are hypocellular in nature and uh, quite prominent. At the um, cytological, um, uh, uh, cytology level, um, the cells are very large and um, with um, a abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasma, which takes uh, the NC ratio to, to be very low. In contrast to um, conventional HCC, the cells are much, much smaller, but the NC ratio is much higher. And there's also um, this so-called um, uh, intracellular pale bodies, uh, which is believed to be fibrinogen inclusions. And um, other features are um, uh, bios. So you see cholestasis either <clears throat> within the canonicular space or within the hepatocytes, which uh, because of this reason, it gives rise to the green um, appearance on the gross um, examination. Again, you see the central scar and other scars as well. So uncommon features which are is present in all the features are present in our case with uh, <clears throat> um, very limited fibrous bands. They're kind of thin and delicate. And uh, pileosis we mentioned earlier And uh, <clears throat> there's very prominent um, pseudoglandular pseudoacinar formation uh, with uh, uh, mucin within the space, as well as intracellular mucin uh, globules. Another interesting is a, a giant cell reaction. I'm not sure what's, what this is reacting to. Uh, but I found a lot of uh, these uh, at the peripheral, <clears throat> periphery of uh, this lesion. So the take home message is that all the I's and cross uh, all the T's uh, before you make uh, your definitive uh, interpretation. So each aspect of the disease is, is important for the diagnosis. In this, this particular case, the patient's age, clinical features, we mentioned many of them, 
and one has to be aware of both common and uncommon morphological features, immunoprofile as long as uh, <clears throat> as well as molecular characteristics. If something doesn't fit perfectly, you have to go back to check all of your uh, dots and cross. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laura. It was a great case. Um, okay, so I don't see questions. Um, I can ask a couple of questions. So this particular tumor is such a fascinating tumor occurring only in young individuals, right? So yes. on the other, what Monica published on the pancreatic cases, were the age groups still limited to younger individuals? No, no. Um, I think the, the, this particular fusion has something to do with um, uh, the cytoplasma, granular cytoplasma, which is uh, mostly mitochondria. So I think similarly in the oncocytic lesions, those are also, at least some of them are, are mitochondria. So it's, it's not really, it's, it's a feature, but it's not really, um, I guess a driver, um, uh, it's not related to age in pancreas. And do you see fibrolamellar carcinomas in older individuals? Yeah, so I think uh, we have seen uh, the oldest one I have seen is 40 plus years old, which is uncommon. You try not to um, you try to not to go there, <laughs> just like uh, the other age-related um, tumors, such like uh, as a hepatoblastoma. Um, um, sometimes, you know, you see classic conventional hepatos I mean, hepatocellular carcinoma in a young in a young child. So you try to make it hepatoblastoma. However, no matter how uh, good the features are as a hepatoblastoma. Uh, in adult, you try to say it's it's you know it's conventional carcinoma. Yeah, it's also interesting about the PRKR1A mutation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So the carny complex, which is is germline inherited, and then they have other tumors, uh, which right. is including melanotic schwannomas, but still the driver will be this fusion, I suppose, because the fusion yeah. is present. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I learned a great deal just to prepare for this presentation. Yeah. All right, okay. Thank you, Lara, it's a wonderful case. Let's move on to the last presentation, last but not the least, of course, Dr. Travis. Again, I'm, I don't have to introduce Bill Travis. Bill Travis is a um, our, our team director of thoracic pathology. He, as you all of you know, he's enormously contributed to lung cancer pathology and WHO um, and other um, uh, books. Uh, he's a great mentor to his team um, and he always has fascinomas. So let's hear Bill's fascinating case. Thank you, Mira. I'd like to thank Dr. Dogan and Dr. Hamid for the invitation to present case eight in this anatomic pathology slide seminar. And I know this is a great challenge because I am the last speaker between you and dinner and a nice long weekend. So uh, here we go. I have nothing to disclose. The patient was a 36 year old female with von Hippel Lindau syndrome and had a germline VHL uh, mutation. She was diagnosed one year previously and had a history cell mental cell carcinoma. Status post partial nephrectomy found to have multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules on follow-up CT. These were concerning for metastasis. A CT guided biopsy was uh, performed and subsequently a wedge resection. This is the CT scan. The two images on the left are from the right lower lobe, showing a larger than a smaller nodule. And the two images on the right show the left lower lobe a nodule that was biopsy. This is the cell block from the eagle aspiration cytology of the left lower lobe nodule. And you can see that there are cyst-like spaces lined by cytologically bland epithelial cells. And it is 
reminiscent actually of alveolar lung tissue. Here you can see the summary of the immunostains positive for keratins, EMA, uh, DTF, uh, focally weakly positive for CA9, but negative for Pax8, Fortin, and NAPSA. And here you see the immunostains with the positive side of keratin, uh, DTF1, but interesting negative NAPSA. The CA9 is focally positive, and the Pax8 is completely negative. Confirming that this is not metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And Oscar Lin, who handled this case, made a totally brilliant diagnosis. Neoplastic cells present, epithelial neoplasm of nubocyte origin. Note, there is no morphologic or immunophenotypic evidence of metastatic renal cell carcinoma. The findings are compatible with the benign epithelial neoplasm of nubocytic origin. The differential diagnosis includes, but is not limited to alveolar adenoma. And as you see, when we uh, start to figure out what this is, uh, this is a perfectly descriptive diagnosis. And I think this is one of the arts of dealing with difficult cases, is saying exactly what's there and not too much and not too little. So kudos to Oscar in uh, making this diagnosis. Multiple wedge lung biopsies were performed on the right lower lobe two months after the left lower lobe needle biopsy and six months after a partial left nephrectomy for three renal cell carcinomas. And you can see that the histology indeed showed as expected metastatic renal cell carcinoma. These two images on the right are from uh, one of those tumors and they match identically the clear cell renal cell carcinoma seen here on this left image. In addition, there was a four millimeter nodule in the right lower lobe that had a peculiar appearance to it. It showed a microcystic pattern and a papillary pattern. And here you can see the tumor cells are cytologically very bland. They're lining this microcystic space with some uh, clear cytoplasm. There were other areas of this tumor that showed a papillary configuration with fibrovascular cores lined by cytologically bland tumor cells with some prominent clear cytoplasm. And here in one of the microcystic areas at very high power, you can see this watery eosinophilic material within the microcyst and lining by very bland uh, tumor cells with abundant clear cytoplasm. Over here on the right, you can see immunistic chemistry for CA9 and some marker that we often see in renal cell carcinoma. So I showed this to our world class GU team, who, of course, were looking at this from the perspective of renal cell carcinoma. And it was shown at the GU consensus. And so they had the impression that this was an unusual type of renal cell carcinoma. So the surgeon was in a hurry to get the diagnosis since the workup had taken so long. So I uh, went ahead and signed it out in all four specimens from the right lower lobe, uh, different wedges, metastatic clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and added this comment from the GU team. This tumor shows focal clear cell papillary renal cell carcinoma-like histology. This morphologic variant has been previously reported in patients with VHL syndrome and is molecularly distinct from sporadic clear cell papillary renal cell carcinoma. So here I have signed this case out. I know it's a funny case. Um, it's bothering me. I've got this sixth sense in the back of my head that there's a problem. And uh, the GU team says it's renal cell carcinoma. So who needs a Pax E or a TTF1? One of the great things about having fellows around is they're curious and ask questions. So OMID is the one who needed a Pax8 and a TTF1. And lo and behold, the Pax8 is completely negative and the TTF is positive. Yikes. What do we do now? So I found this out at the end of a long day and had trouble sleeping that night. And when I came in to work the next morning, I 
decided, is there anything in PubMed? Maybe I should do a search. So I put in a search for Hippolindau lung adenoma, and look what turned up. This article from Tom Colby uh, at Mayo Clinic, multifocal microcyst and papillary cyst adenoma of the lung in von Hippel-Lindau disease. So here is this article. They had a 43-year-old female uh, who had femur, femur chromocytoma, multiple meningiomas involving the retina, cerebellum, spinal cord, and a right renal cell carcinoma. And by CT, there was a two centimeter nodule in the left lower lobe hilum. And there was a one centimeter diameter cyst with a 0.3 centimeter papillary excrescence. He had multiple cystic proliferations uh, ranging up to 2.5 millimeters. And they found the LOH for the VHL gene in micro dissected cysts. And they described in this one centimeter cyst papillary, uh, very well differentiated looking lesion lined by very cytologically bland looking epithelial cells, some of which had clear cytoplasm. And over here on the right, you can see a double stain with DTF highlighting nice nuclear staining. And in the red, some nice uh, vascular staining with the CD31 and a vascular rich looking stroma. In the surrounding blood parenchyma, there were extensive millimeter and submillimeter proliferations of pneumocytic type epithelium with microcystic uh, morphology and some papillary morphology in clear cells, much like what we saw in our tumor. So, what about von Hippel-Lindau disease? As you know, it has an incidence of one in 36,000 individuals. It's autosomal dominant. The molecular basis is loss of function of the VHL protein with subsequent accumulation of hypoxia inducible factor HIF. And here you can see all the different organs that are affected uh, the CNS, retina, and the lymphatic sac in the ear, adrenal glands, pancreas, kidney, broad ligament in females, epididymis in males, but no lung involved. And here are examples uh, kindly provided by uh, Dr. Bastard of cyst adenomas involving the epididymis, kidney, and pancreas, very similar to the morphology of what we saw in the lungs. In the lung parenchyma surrounding these tumors, there were innumerable millimeter and submillimeter pneumocytic proliferations. As you can see on the far left, I've highlighted many of them with these red circles. I should point out that. I completely missed these on my initial review of the case, and only after Owen very carefully was reviewing the slides did he bring these to my attention. You can see they're distributed along the lymphatic routes around bronchi and uh, blood vessels, and they consist of these microcystic and somewhat papillary proliferations. So what is the best term to use for these peculiar lesions? The Mayo group papillary cyst adenoma for their tumor and microcyst for the extensive tiny nodules of proliferation of pneumocytes. We proposed pneumocytic cyst adenoma for the tumor and pneumocytic cyst adenomatosis for the numerous tiny nodules of proliferating pneumocytes. Why? Well, TTF1, I think, defines both of these lesions as pneumocytic in origin certainly helps to separate them from metastatic renal cell, which was our big concern initially. Also, our tumor lacked predominant papillary growth, so we prefer not to use papillary as the descriptive term. And also, these multicentric lewisite proliferations, I think, fit very well in parallel to the cystadenoma as lewisitic cystadenomatosis. The tumor cells in our lewisitic cystadenoma showed expression of GLUT1 and inhibin in the cytoplasm and nuclear staining for HIF1-alpha. We saw similar results in hemocytic cystadenomatosis lesions. Here on the left, you can see cytoplasmic staining for GLUT1, and on the right, nuclear staining for HIF1-alpha. And this parallels what can be seen in the lesions that occur in the kidney, the pancreas, 
Epididymis and the Epididymis. Impact next generation sequencing molecular results showed in the renal cell carcinoma, MAP1 and TSC1 mutations, as can be seen in Brunhippel Lindau associated renal cell carcinomas. In the left lower lobe, it was in his adenoma, we saw a KRAS Q61H mutation and STK11 splicing variant. However, in the right lower lobe of lucid cystadenoma, there were no mutations and no copy number alterations. These findings show that the lung tumors were genetically different from each other and from the renal cell carcinoma. The KRAS and SDK11 mutations in the left lower lobe tumor are pathogenic somatic alterations confirming the neoplastic nature of the tumor. In the combination of KRAS and SDK11 is frequently seen in lung adenocarcinoma. However, their significance in the cystadenoma is unknown. So we wondered if we could find similar lesions in lung tissue from other patients with VHL. We had a difficult time and were unable through our urologic surgeons and medical oncologists to identify additional cases with lung tissue. But from our CoPath search, we were able to find two patients, one of which had similar lesions. It's a metastatic colon cancer patient where you can see in the bottom left there are uh, lesions of metastatic colon cancer within lymphatics. And then throughout the lung tissue we were able to find these microcystic proliferations lined by cytologically bland epithelium with clear cell features very similar to what we saw in our index case. And these also were positive for TTF1 and GLUT1. So we think that these diagrams showing organ involvement by multiple Lindau disease should start adding the lungs with these pneumocytic cystadenomas and cystadenomatoses. It's interesting that the lung can be involved in other germline disorders with specific mutations, such as tuberous sclerosis, where you can have TSC1 mutations in Hamerton and TSC2 mutations in the tuberin genes. And the lesion we see here is micronodular lymphocyte hyperplasia, where you can see at low power there are these uh, biliary nodules. And as you look more closely, you can see that they have indistinct borders, as seen in the middle. And on the right, you see slight thickening of alveolar walls with prominent lymphocyte hyperplasia. In another germline situation, Burton Hogg Bay syndrome associated with mutations in the follicular gene. One can have basal lung blebs or cysts. And here, essentially, you get these very uh, prominent emphysematous type cysts here in the subpleural region of the lung. And there's some uh, mild fibrotic thickening of the walls of the cyst. And the lining consists of essentially reactive lymphocytes with some mild chronic inflammation in the septum. We just published the 2021 WHO classification of thoracic tumors. And under lung adenomas, here you can see all the various types. Based on uh, these cases, I'm wondering if we should propose to add pneumocytic cystadenoma in the next edition. So here you can see how just identifying an unusual case at sign out potentially could change a WHO classification. I'd like to give a big thank you to all of those of you who help to put this case together, especially to Omen. In summary, this case highlights the amazing expertise and colleagues that we have here at MSK to solve these difficult problems. Hemocytic cystadenoma and cystadenomatosis are newly recognized lung manifestations of BHL and potentially could be added to the WHO classification in the next edition. And these lesions are consistent with the cystic and or pneumocyte proliferations that can be seen in the lungs of other germline disorders, such as tuberous sclerosis and Burton Dubé. And pneumocytic cystadenomatosis is easily overlooked and should be searched for in lung tissue from VHL patients. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bill. That was uh, quite an interesting case. We all were kind of involved in it in many different ways. and. 
I guess the model of the story is you have to do immunohistochemistry <laughs> or for any type of funny looking lesion, right? Yeah, I was totally embarrassed to have not done a TTF in a back seat. You know, it was one of those crazy things where the surgeons give you a deadline. I need the report. I need the report. And so you sign it out without the workup that you ordinarily would do. And uh, anyway, it, it's perhaps uh, when you learn the hard way, you, you really uh, uh, pay attention the next time. Hopefully, I won't do so much of that anymore. <laughs> So, you know, VHL patients develop uh, pancreatic serous stenomas, right? Yes, um, I showed that the, from, from- Yeah, so in the cancer. lung, I guess it's rare, so rare to have something like this with VHL. The cyst adenoma, yes, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they're underestimated. Uh, every time people see a nodule, a lot of these patients have renal cell carcinomas. They just assume it's metastatic renal cell, so they don't even bother to take it out. And uh, as far as this uh, cyst adenomatosis, I suspect that just like myself, people haven't even seen it when there's lung tissue. And uh, so now hopefully this will draw awareness to it and people will look more carefully. Are there, are there autopsy studies, Bill, that would look into this? Uh, I'm sure at Mayo, they've got a big archive. <laughs> uh, that would be a good thing to do. Actually, I didn't search the autopsy files at, at Memorial, that's a good suggestion. Yeah, that's a great session. All the very interesting cases, uh, one after another. Um, so um, before, anyway, before that, I just want to first thank Simone Ramkison, Sarah Virgo, and the CME folks, and Katia Wood for making this happen um, this year, because we canceled our, our uh, alumni uh, last year. and. This is really one of our, our favorite meetings and uh, thank you so much uh, for making this uh, happen. And uh, it's a Q&A, a question. So let me read, fantastic case. Um, we'll remember it forever. Just wonder if you know there were also virtual mu germline mutation in this entity. Uh, well, this patient had a germline That's mutation. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, right. But do, do you get the same thing with the Acquired mutations? Does it does this happen? If it is a, I mean, it, is that is that anything like that? You would get the same morphology without the uh, VHL. I'm sorry, you were breaking up. I had trouble understanding you. Ah, uh, so uh, would it be would it be possible that this somatic mutations in the VHL would give rise to a similar morphology? I have no idea. Boy, I would love to get a lot more lung tissue from yeah. these types of patients. Uh, I was surprised that we had such trouble finding lung tissue. I thought at a place like Memorial, there would be an abundance of cases. Yes. We could only find three. Yeah, and interestingly, the, the, the impact was pretty negative, completely didn't show anything um, apart from VHL germline, I think, for this uh, on the right lung, right? Yeah, so I don't know what's going on with the uh, uh, lack of any mutations in the lesion that was resected and the mutations in the lesion that was not resected. That was just uh, done by cytology. And I'm a little worried that uh, over time that may grow, and I'm secretly hoping they will take it out at some point. They decided to leave it in. Yeah, and well, time will tell us, yeah. So Ahmed, you want to open the chat? Uh... Yes, I mean, uh, first of all, you know, thanking everybody again, especially Simone, uh, Sarah and Don uh, and uh, Keith to making this happen. They worked so hard for this. Secondly, all the presenters, really outstanding talks. What, uh, you know, the shows the, uh, the, the, you know, extent of uh, pathology know-how in the department and uh, hopefully it was helpful to the participants. We will open it, uh, you know, the only thing we can do apparently is uh, allow you if you raise your hand and say hello, uh, and uh, you know, that's what we could do and unmute you, you can say, you know, what's, what, what happened last two years and uh, we would like to hear your voices if possible. Uh, that's the only mechanism we have got at the moment because of the way that Zoom uh, webinar is set up. 
So anyone would like to say something, we'll, we'll take those. Uh, any comments, just to say hello, just join us. Yes, any, anybody wants to chat, just raise your hand and we'll uh, unmute, and you can mute yourself. Um, I, I see ch the chat getting filled up. Jennifer saying really great case. I presentation, all great cases. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's not the best way to possibly I communicate. Know. Yeah. We'll we'll do a better one hopefully next year yeah. live on site with a dinner afterwards. Yeah, hopefully next year we will definitely be in person. Everybody misses misses that that get together very much. But it's great to see some fellows that uh, I recognize the names here. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to see them and attending this and, and alumni. Thank I you. Guess, I guess we will close then. Thank you for everything again, all the participants uh, and the speakers and the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.